Commissioner Severson. Present. Commissioner Meyer. Here. Commissioner French. Here. Commissioner Forney. Here. Vice President Vita. Present. Commissioner Hassan. President Kogil. Here. You have uh, eight present, one absent. Uh, thank you, Secretary Ringgold. We do have a quorum. Um, I will uh, move on here to an approval of the agenda. Um, before I do so, I just want to uh, make a note of uh, going into this meeting. We do have a variety of folks uh, Te probably testifying here this evening. We have a couple of high profile items. I um, want to ask commissioners when they are speaking to an item if they could uh, turn on their audio and visual uh, so that we can see you. Um, if that is a functionality that you have, I believe every commissioner should have that functionality with their uh, park board laptop. Um, with that, I'll ask for an approval uh, of the agenda, adding, uh, uh, amending the agenda to bring a few items up from committee. Uh, Mr. President, can you hear me? Commissioner Hassan, yes, I can. Hello? Yeah, I, I, was, I was muted. I was saying, uh, I'm here all the time. Noted. Thank you, Commissioner. I would have put that in. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Um, so, as I was saying, I uh, asked for a motion to approve the agenda with the following items being brought up from committee. Uh, from Planning Committee, uh, item 2020-218, 2020-261, 2020-262, and from the Admin and Finance Committee, 2020-258. Do I have a motion? Could we have an opportunity either to read what the are to verify that we're okay with that first, or we read them to us, we know what it is that we're amending agenda to move to the full board? Certainly, Commissioner Musich, I will do so. Um, do I uh, have a? Uh, I, have, I have a motion. I will read the the items now. Um, the items coming up from uh, admin and finance. Uh, there's one item. It's resolution 2022-58, uh, um, approving an amended fundraising agreement with Voices of the Roses. And then the three items coming up from planning committee include 2022-18 which is a resolution uh, allowing alternative means for review and comment of the Southwest Service Area Master Plan Draft, uh, as well as uh, item 2020-261, which is a resolution approving an amendment to uh, access agreement to the Metropolitan Council for placement pisometers on Dean Parkway related to the Southwest LRT project. And item 2020-262, which is uh, a, a resolution approving a comment letter for the uh, transportation action plan. Thank you. I have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> President Cogill. Um, the only one I, I would have an objection to is the uh, comment letter on the transportation action plan. Um, it, it seems like if we're going to have discussion around that, we might want to have staff incorporate some, we might want to have staff have the opportunity to incorporate some of our changes, but all the other ones are fine. Uh, so I'd ask that we just divide that question and um, vote on the transportation action plan amendment separately. Uh, certainly we can divide that quite and I will just note Commissioner Bourne at the last meeting we did have a presentation on the transportation action plan and an opportunity for commissioners to comment but uh, noted and uh, I will split the question so um, I'll ask for seeing no other discussion I'll ask for the secretary to take the role on approving the agenda um, with the uh, Items being up, being brought up from the uh, committee, uh, 
except for resolution 2020-262. President, President Moore. President Moore. Yes, Commissioner French. I would like to amend the agenda. I would like to move the agenda, the agenda item uh, referring to the sanctuary and take it off the agenda for this, for this meeting today. Secretary, could you read that uh, the number of that resolution coming to? I'm trying to pull it up my can. Commissioner French, we have a resolution in a second. I, I hear you. Uh, at this point, we're going to be voting on the agenda at this time, there will certainly be an opportunity to table that item. Well, I'm, 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 I'm asking if we could uh, remove, remove it from this, to take it off this. So I hear that, Commissioner French, we do have a, a motion on, and a second on, on the floor. Um, if you're asking to split the question, we can do that. At point of order, President Kogel? Yeah. Thank you, President Kogel. I, I, I think the way you described it might be confusing to some commissioners. Um, what is before us right now is not a motion to approve the agenda with those changes. It's a motion to, um, to change the, the agenda presented to us. I, I think Commissioner French's um, amendment is in order if he's asking to have that removed. I don't think that's any different than the resolution that you just brought, that you just brought forward. Mr. President. Yes, uh, I, I, um, Mr. President, I, I think that uh, you can entertain Commissioner French's uh, motion, but not right now. I mean, Commissioner Bourne has, you've in, assess, in essence have moved to amend the agenda with these uh, four, uh, matters that are in the planning committee. Your uh, first amendment then has been amended by Commissioner Bourne's amendment to separate out uh, 2020 262. So I think what you should do is take a vote on Commissioner Bourne's amendment first, and then Commissioner French's motion would be in order after you vote on the pending motion by Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, Council Rice. We'll vote on the pending motion by Commissioner Bourne. I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Uh, for, for clarification, I had just asked that the questions be divided. So I think we're taking a vote on one group of, of proposed agenda amendments and then another agenda amendment. And then I think Commissioner French's agenda amendment is also in order if i'm understanding it correctly thank you commissioner Bourne. yes so the we are voting right now to add the planning committee items 202218 and 202261 as as well as the admin and finance 2022 and i'll ask the secretary to please take the role on that. President Cogill, um, Council Rice, do any of these amendments need a second? They would, it's the board meeting. I, I think that one was seconded already though, right? I don't think it was. I'll second. So, um, I'll second. President, President Cogill, um, Council Rice, what I have so far is a first, uh, the agenda itself with the amendments has been moved and seconded. The, there's been an amendment to the presented agenda. Yes, the agenda has been moved. And seconded. Yes. And then the request to pull or to divide the question for 2020-262 has been, from what I can tell, moved but not seconded. Well, a member can has a right to divide any question. So the amendment was offered by President Cogill, I believe it was seconded, to amend the agenda with those four items. And now Commissioner Bourne, it's as a matter of right, can divide out the resolution 2020-262. So, but the second applies to both sides of the division. So, so yes, we can, we can do both on both. Sides. 
Do we need to remove or vote on removing 2020-263 before voting on the full amendment? 262? 262? No, the Commissioner French is... He hasn't made that motion yet. Okay. We're trying to get through this first motion. Okay. Okay. My apology. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musage. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner, Aye. Oh, Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogel. Aye. You have nine ayes. Thank you. We'll now move on to considering amending the agenda to add item 2020-262. I'm seeing no other comment and I believe this has been moved and seconded and I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. No. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. No. Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. No. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have five ayes, four nays. Thank you, that carries. Is there any other, so we have these uh, items added to uh, the agenda. Are there any other um, motions? Commissioner French? Yeah, I'd like to uh, make the motion to, to, to take off the mid item pertaining to the sanctuary. I'm trying to fill up my number. I can fill it up right now, so I'm going to move the precise number. 263 is the number. Thank you, Commissioner Martin. So Commissioner French has, has moved to remove resolution 2020-263. Is there a second? Here. There is a motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion on removing this item from the agenda? Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll say that I am in support of uh, Discussing this uh, item, uh, I think it is uh, incredibly timely and pertinent. Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Kogel. I was just looking for my raised hand button. Um, I was uh, absent at a family function at our last meeting, um, I, and I learned of a resolution that that the resolution before us tonight is amending um it looks like that passed by overwhelming support of the board and when i look at when i look at this amendment i i'm just incredibly confused by it because it seems to take a 180 degree position from what the board just passed at its last meeting uh, i i do know from going back and watching uh, watching the meeting, I think that there were some concerns from some commissioners at that time that that original motion was not brought up through committee. Uh, so, so I'm, I, I would support Commissioner French's resolution to take this off the agenda tonight beyond just making a 180 degree policy change from the Minneapolis Park Board it should really also come up through committee for such for such a substantial change. So, uh, thank you, Commissioner French, for bringing forward the motion to 
take this from the agenda. President Gogo. Uh, Commissioner French. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, President Bourne. I'm President Kogo and Commissioner Bourne. Uh, what, what, uh, um, this, 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 this issue, the reason I don't think that we should be having this discussion, I mean, there are some real issues of, about sanctuary, and I think the way we fix those issues are having conversations with not only the neighbors and the homeowners who live on our own but some of the residents in the sanctuary and come up with some solutions to some of the issues that we're having. Uh, maybe, we, maybe we sit down in a couple of weeks, maybe some commissioners come down there and talk to some of the residents, and maybe do a shift, maybe do a volunteer shift and, and see uh, what it's like down there and see who, who we, who, who our residents in, in this place, who they are. And, uh, and then we come back and then we try to have a resolution that might work for more than just a, a select few people. Uh, this is not our ball game, uh, dealing with homelessness. This is not the ball game of the park board. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely, uh, extremely humbled by some of the work that some of our other commissioners and park board staff have, have done with this. But it's, it's. I think a real, true resolution would would be thought of, thought out and, and take consideration of the folks who actually don't have a place to go, right? And maybe they come up with some better ideas than we do, because I was, I was always told, you should say this all the time, like, the smartest guy in the room is the guy who knows you're not the smartest guy in the room. You can take uh, criticism of your team for every, from everybody. So I think uh, the resolution that was passed originally has some flaws and some homes that most definitely need to be looked at and, and talked about, discussed, and, and have some real conversation about. Uh, but I think, the people who are involved in those conversations weren't involved in the conversation originally. I think we can do that in the next, you know, couple of weeks or the next month or so. Uh, but we also need to know that we're putting some pressure on the county and the city and the state to actually do some things as well. So, uh, with that being said, thank you, President Carlo, and, and appreciate the chance to be this week. Thank you, Commissioner French, Commissioner Meyer. So. I don't support uh, Resolution 2020-263 as written, but I do think it is something uh, that we should discuss and work through. Um, so I, I would support this amendment if it's going to be discussed in a different committee tonight. Um, and it, so I, I just wanted to ask Commissioner Board if that was your intent that, that we would have it in, in um, on, on one of the committees tonight. And I'm not actually sure. I've, which committee that would be. Point of order, President Cogill, or maybe point of information. Um, I was not the motion maker. Yeah, Commissioner Meyer, the, the, the motion was made by Commissioner French and it was to remove the item from the agenda, not to refer it to committee tonight. So that is the question before us. Commissioner French, would you be open to referring it to a committee? I, I would, what I would like for it to happen is for us to go back and, and talk to some folks in the encampment and probably do some outreach with some of the neighbors and some of the community groups over there and see what some of the issues have been and see how we can address them as a board and then come back with a resolution that 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 may uh, that may work for for more people and, and and an effort to keep folks safe. I, I think what we did last last meeting was was a stopgap measure. We we were. We were dealing with a crisis. I think if we are a little bit more deliberate now, we could we could address some of the issues that are plaguing our community, our, our parks, and our neighborhoods. Uh, and and so bringing it to committee would just mean that the folks in this room are are discussing the issue. And I, I want to open that discussion up for for maybe our uh, some of our our, our uh, community partners, like some of the nonprofits and some of the folks who are living in the encampment and some of the neighborhood neighborhood groups. And not just the folks who are, you know, who are sitting here right now. So that was my rationale behind that. Okay. So I, I guess my view is uh, we, we should have some discussions about it as a, as a board tonight. We should also uh, be reaching out to residents of the encampment and surrounding community and other interested partners. Um, us talking about that tonight won't preclude that. Um, 
I, I do think it you know, needs work. Um, I, I, I think it would take too long to not have it discussed at all tonight and then bring it to committee on July 15th and then not actually pass a change uh, until um, the first meeting in August. So um, I, I think then if, if it's not going to be referred to a committee tonight, then I would vote against the amendment so that we can have an opportunity to discuss this uh, um, tonight. Um, but then I would support it tabling it. So um, Thank I'm going to vote against the amendment at the time. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Musich, followed by Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, I Superintendent Bangora, are you on? You are on the call, I believe. I saw you earlier. Um, I have a, a question regarding whether or not our partners will continue to support us if we do nothing to address the escalation of the homelessness situation within Minneapolis parks. Uh, Commissioner Musich, uh, I'm sorry, President Kogel, Commissioner Musich. Um, one second, I'm sorry, I have another. Question. One My apology. Um, it's a tough question. I mean, obviously our partners uh, with the city and the uh, county are working in conjunction with us. The concern, um, obviously, and I know this is maybe not the, the only time to discuss this, but the concern is the expansion of the number of sites throughout the city. Currently, we have 30 parks. We're going to get a report later on to kind of give an idea of how this is growing. Um, the several was about Potterhorn being dismantled or evicted. This was about setting some guidelines and some uh, parameters around what we as an organization need to face going forward. Um, it's growing and expanding. Boom Island currently has a sign up saying this might be the next location. Um, this is very difficult for this organization. Again, and Commissioner French has said, this is not uh, park and recreation. We don't manage and handle encampments. Um, but we are in the middle of this and trying to find humane and dignified the most that we can do to support the encampments that currently exist, especially over 400 tents at Potterhorn. So the organizers, the, the, the city and the county and the state are meeting and are discussing ways of resolving this. I think what's before us is a step to try to understand where the park board is and where the commissioners are on the level of what we're willing to do and what we're willing to accept as far as the expansion of all of the different sites throughout the city. And so I the the city and the the city and the county are really big partners right now and they are watching this to see what our next step will be if we're going to allow all parks to become refuge for all and through our entire system. And the level of support that the city, county, and state needs to provide or help in that level of expansion. Right now, we have a crisis and a difficult situation happening at Powderhorn. It's the largest encampment in state history. Um, and it's not going to be by any means, and the resolution that's before us is not about evicting or anyone out of Powderhorn. We're gonna have a lot of work to do there in the next several months. Um, so yes, the city and county and state are looking for us to, um, to, to give some direction and not just to say that all parks are open for any number of tents, any number of locations. We're looking for some guidance from this board and the state, city and county is looking for some guidance uh, from the board. Um, and we are working with them. They're continuing to work with us, but obviously this will make it a lot more challenging. If we continue to look at all of our different sites and keep um, expanding. Thank you for that additional information, Superintendent Bangora. Um, Council Rice, I have a question for you as well. Um, some of my constituents have told me they believe that the NPRB is violating city and state laws by endorsing encampments within parks. Um, is the NPRB violating the city's nuisance law or any other laws by allowing um, encampments to remain in parks? and having endorsed their existence via the resolution that we passed our last meeting and are discussing amending this evening? Uh, Mr. President. Yes, Council. Um, Commissioner Musich, um, no, I don't believe that you are based on the resolution that the 
board passed at its last meeting, Resolution 2020-253. There is an ordinance that prohibits uh, people from being in parks uh, after 11 p.m. and before 7 a.m. unless the board grants permission. And in essence, the resolution that passed two weeks ago granted that permission. In addition, we do have Governor Walz's executive orders. Um, the most recent that's applicable here is uh, Executive Order 2020-55 um, that at the time the adoption of the resolution uh, indicated that uh, governments couldn't remove uh, encampments except under certain conditions. Apparently there's been some additional guidance on that matter, but um, there would still probably be, I, I think under the more recent guidance, the board could, if it chose uh, to uh, modify the previous resolution, uh, and it can, but at this point, no, it's, it's my opinion that uh, uh, those uh, encampments are uh, permitted based on the authority of the board is granted in the prior resolution. Okay, thank you for that information. Superintendent Bangor, you had said that the executive order as written allows for encampments to be addressed when they are um, a concern for public safety and health. Uh, under current guidance around coronavirus, I would assume we're violating the health component of that, of that um, executive order with the acts of violence that have been perpetrated against residents uh, that are either living in the encampment or in the surrounding neighborhoods since the encampments have been established, are we also violating that component of the executive order guidance? Point of order, President Cogill. Yes, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. I, I rise to a point of order that the motion on the floor is whether or not a question this evening should or should not be on the agenda. And, I, and I'm hoping that the president can call the board to order and limit the discussion to whether or not the question should or should be should or should not be on the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. I uh, would encourage commissioners to keep any comments short. Uh, we are running up on open time. Uh, and this question is pretty pertinent to what comments might be made tonight at open time. I would like to be able to vote on the uh, resolution at hand. But if Commissioner Musich, if you have more to wrap up pertaining to adding this to the I would agenda, just like a response do. to the last item that I, the last question that I had asked. Well, I that, that having this information is important for us to understand whether or not we should be addressing this this item this evening. Commissioner Musich, we will wait now that it's 5:30 uh, to address that question, and we will move into open time. So the time being 5:30. Um, I will uh, call our open time to order here. Um, thank you all who have come out to speak. Um, this is our opportunity at the board to hear from residents, so we do not respond uh, to your comments. Uh, you can speak on any issue. Uh, just we ask that you don't speak on any pending personnel issues or use any harassing or discriminatory language. Um, you know, we want to be respectful, but speak your truth, please. Um, and uh, we're going to limit it to uh, a minute per person. Um, so please keep your, your comments brief. Um, and I'm going to ask, since we are in this pandemic still, I appreciate everybody here wearing masks tonight. Once you're done, I, I think there may be some folks still in the, in the hallway. So once you're done speaking, if you could move out into the hallway, there are monitors. You can watch the meeting. But if you could move on after you speak out this door, um, that would be greatly appreciated so that we can make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak and everybody feels safe being in here. Um, oh, good question. Uh, I will, before I, I move into this open time, I'm gonna ask Council Rice a question whether or not open time can happen without an agenda being completed. That you're going to ask that question. I, I, I would advise the president to adopt the agenda and then go forward with the open time. 
in so much as the uh, agenda does include open time itself so okay um, I will do so um, with commissioners being aware that we do have many folks here waiting to speak with the understanding that they were here to speak at 530 I am uh, happy to um, move back into our discussion of the agenda so that we can move forward in uh, the meeting uh, so uh, at this moment, uh, Commissioner Musich had a question for the superintendent. Um, I'll turn it back over to that question. Commissioner Musich, would you like to ask it one more time? You need me to ask it one more time, Superintendent Bangor. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, President Colby, Commissioner Musich, you can repeat the question. Thank you. The governor's executive order indicates that encampments should be addressed if they are in violation of health, if they're causing health issues or a threat to public safety. Um, with the violence that has occurred and what we know about coronavirus and the precautions required to keep people safe, are we in violation of that executive order at this point? President Kogo, President Kogo Commissioner Musich, the executive order 2055 gives um, authority for the organization to make a decision around public safety and public health. Um, one of the things that are mentioned in there, and I don't have exactly in front of me at this moment, but it's about the size of an encampment or the size of um, an encampment that is at a at any other at any location. What was clear about the executive order that at that particular time, 25 tents were um, at Powderhorn, and what is in the order is that. What we know about encampment sizes, anything that's even over 10 is considered, from only the health department of the CDC, um, concerned. And that um, they needs to be, uh, it needs to be then uh, addressed or looked at specifically by any organization or, or even the health department to look at that particular encampment and um, to then also then make a decision on whether the public health or safety of that encampment only for the people that are in, that are in on shelter um, and those that are the residents in the city is that we have to look at that. What's clear is that when we have a number that exceeds 10 and it gets to 25, that that is considered a public safety and public health issue. And so that order then gives the ability or the right for a governing or a city or anyone to uh, look at that particular encampment and to make a decision on the size of the encampment that it is a public safety and public health concern because of Thank what you know at the encampment. So that does give the authority for um, the particular agency or organization to make a decision that that is a concern and that, that can be then um, addressed or responded to. Thank you for the additional information. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Vice President Vita. I just had a quick question about the um, original re resolution. I thought that the original resolution was um, in tandem with the governor's stay-at-home order. So if that was, at that time, the date was supposed to be uh, July 13th, that the governor's stay-at-home order was going to be lifted, and then our resolution would you know, coincide with that. Was I wrong, Superintendent? The original, the resolution that was the executive order on the 13th, the executive order itself, again, the way that 2055 was written, was again that it gave the uh, agency or government, whatever it might be, whether it's city, county, state, or local government, the authority based on 2055 to make a decision specifically to an encampment size, the provision that's written in there. When we were on the call um, with uh, the, the state, they made it very clear that even at the time that the encampment was formed at Powderhorn, that the, that the park board did have the authority to go in at that time and to look at that provision and say that, yes, the size of the encampment is exceeding even what is normal in the sense of uh, 10 encampments or 10 tents or less or more to make the decision. So the executive order as far as the 13th was not necessarily in effect because it the, the peacetime order existed, but the authority under 2055 did 
did give the authority of the organization or the government organization to make a decision based on public safety and health on whether a camp size, an encampment size is too large. And it states clearly in there. So we could have at that time obviously made the decision as an organization based on public safety and health of the size of the encampment to make a decision as an organization what we would do next. Thank you, Superintendent. Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Cogill. I'll try to keep my comments as to whether or not the question should or should be on the agenda this evening. To the east side commissioner's concern that we're not having a discussion, if I'm reading the agenda correctly, we are having a discussion on this topic. Under unfinished business, there is a discussion item on refuge space to people currently experiencing homelessness. If there are commissioners that have concerns with resolution 2020-263 and their concern is that there is not going to be a discussion item on folks currently experiencing homelessness in parks, I would direct any of those commissioners to the discussion item directly above that, from which commissioners could very easily give staff some very palatable direction that is palatable to everyone to come forward with a palatable action item to the full board at our next meeting, which would bypass the committees that it sounds like maybe some commissioners are concerned about. So unless I'm mistaken, if the board strikes this resolution as Commissioner French is suggesting, when we do that, we will still have a discussion on homeless people experiencing homelessness in the parks under 9A2. And I guess, President Cogill, in my understanding, agenda item 9A2 as an update and discussion item on people currently experiencing homelessness in the parks. Thank you, President Boren. That is correct. Okay, so we do have a, we do have a, we are going to have the opportunity to discuss people experiencing homelessness in the parks. Even if we do remove this agenda, this agenda item does not seem palatable to what I'm counting here as maybe the majority of the board. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boren. Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, so I appreciate Commissioner Boren's comments on that. You know, as long as we do have that opportunity and as long as people are okay with something coming to the full board on July 15th, then I can vote to remove this today. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. All right, I am seeing no other discussion. So I will ask the secretary to take the role on removing item 2020-263 from the agenda of the full board. Commissioner Boren. Aye. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. No. President Cogill. No. You have five ayes, four nays. Uh, removing uh, item 2020-263 from the agenda carries. So thank you all. Um, at this time, I'll ask for a motion to approve uh, the agenda with the amendments um, stated. Commissioner Born. Aye. Commissioner Music. 
Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. All right, we have an approved agenda and we will jump forward to our open time. Um, uh, the time being now 5.42. We do have many speakers uh, signed up. Uh, again, to remind folks on uh, the rules here, uh, we're allocating a minute for everybody, to, uh, each person to speak. You can speak on any topic. We just ask that you don't, we, you refrain from any harassing or discriminatory language and also don't discuss any pending uh, litigation or personnel matters. Um, and uh, again, one minute uh, due to COVID, if you could exit the boardroom uh, after speaking, that would be very helpful. It seems like uh, we're on agreement on that. I, I very much appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out today. Um, our first speaker is Tyra Thomas. Tyra, if you come up, speak, uh, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and uh, you have a minute to address the board. Could you repeat that, please? Uh, yes, if you could just state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have a minute to address the board. Also, if you could step a little bit back, commissioners have had a little bit of trouble hearing um, because it's been too loud if you've been too Muffling. close. Muffling. Perfect. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and you said that my address is option? Yeah. Thank you. So I uh, will not be giving that, but my name is Tyra Thomas, and I am formerly homeless. I am the original member of the Street Voices of Change. I'm born and raised in that neighborhood, in that community, part of Long Park, all my life. Um, several generations in this state. I am a um, victim of oppression in this state. And the basic necessity that cripples and um, bombards all of the other aspects of uh, life here in, in Minnesota um, starts with the basic thing called housing. As I was sitting here listening, uh, I was thinking to myself, this is not a Little House on the Prairie anymore, or was it ever? I woke up from being a kid in that park, playing, suffering from depression, even when I didn't know what it was, and that was my healing space. So many things along the way have gotten me to a place where I can do things better, do things differently. And when I accomplished all those goals, I still woke up and found out that I was oppressed in my own hometown. We have the highest racial disparity in the country. That's not nice. We have 2.5 billion surpluses year after year after year. And housing is still an issue. It is the easiest town to get evicted in and the coldest. My, my friends out at Pottermore Park suffer from trauma of systems that are currently in place that are not doing a very well job, and you keep funneling the money. There was 20,000 complaints at the Department of Human Services just a couple of years ago of those same facilities. They were living facilities, nursing homes, shelters, group homes, orphanages, foster care, all kinds of different complaints. And those complaints got swept. And that is the result out there at Powderhorn Park. Housing. We need housing. And we need it now. Can someone tell me how Mall of America made a comment about homeless people, you just give them a happy meal and they go away? And then all of a sudden the Met Council turns around and circumvents the Section 8 list for my housing authority and got 89 Section 8 vouchers ASAP Why that list was closed and people were waiting to go take it to Metro Transit so they could get them folks off the bus because you want to sweep it under the rug again. 20,000 people homeless in this state. 
$2.5 billion, you could pay their rent for the rest of their mortal life and it wouldn't put a dent in your budget. You wouldn't even miss it. But, but we can go to the bar now. They're talking about going back to games now. Not too long ago, there was a Super Bowl here, and 20,000 volunteers showed up for one night for a game, and we have 20,000 homeless people. One-to-one, -one, love one another, problem would be solved. But because you're making trillion-dollar operation of people's disenfranchisement, why would you want to fix that problem? I'm having a problem with my hometown. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, if you could wrap up and also, again, a reminder to everybody to step back so commissioners can hear, can hear you. Thank you very much. Our, all right, our, our, next, our next speaker is Patrick uh, Berry. That's correct. Thank you, Patrick. If you come up, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have a minute to address the board. And, and again, if you could step about, about right, right there, I think it's Hello? probably is that good. Well? You could come a little it's closer, a, but commissioners are, I'm know. hearing are having trouble. You, you doing good yet? That sounds about good on my right end. There. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I'll begin. Um, my name is Patrick Berry. I'm a longtime resident of the Southside Minneapolis community, and I've watched the Southside transform in my life over the 35 years that I've lived there, mostly for the better, sometimes for the worse, but overwhelmingly for the better. I've tried to be the best I can, to be a good resident within that community, to not cause harm, to recycle, just like all the other people in the South Side. We live in unprecedented times at the risk of sounding like a coronavirus commercial, and um, I'm a product of socioeconomic despair, as well as my parents' death a year and a half ago. That put in motion a series of events that led me to end up living in a tent city. I heard talk earlier of uh, a normal amount of tent cities. Let's be clear, there is no normal amount of homeless encampments. Nevertheless, that's what we're facing as we head into a global recession. This problem isn't gonna go away, it's gonna get worse. And I understand that the park board doesn't normally deal with these sorts of issues. However, you have mass amounts of land available. And I feel that keeping everything together, um, and at least in, in more concentrated encampments, makes the most sense because well, I woke up this morning, I had access to resources. There was a shower, there was a place to use the bathroom, there was clean food, there was clean water. Um, things of that nature. And where the city, state, county, and you know, um, federal government has failed, the community of the South Side came together. And I'm asking that you let them continue to come together because they're doing a really good job. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Our, our next, uh, our next speaker is Gregory Riley. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Gregory Riley. I'm one of the residents of that Power One Sanctuary, and I also do security there. Uh, I'll speak about security, um, what we experience, what we're experiencing, the stuff that happened on the streets of Lake Street, Franklin, everywhere, all the violence, and nothing different, what we're experiencing there. But from what I've seen, we have improved. We're doing good out there on security. We're working hard. We put our lives on the line for these people. Um, got to get a solution real quick. Get them out of there. It's getting tough sometimes. You know, we got women and children and kids there. And I vow to protect them. You know what I'm saying? I'm give it all. You got to do the best you can. Get them out. Try to get the Sheridan back. You know, we weren't ready. You know what I'm saying? But we're ready now. You know, we're putting stuff in place and trying to help people. You know, we got to find a reason to get them out of there, but we're doing everything we can, and I don't think it's the violence, what they're talking about, it's not happening out there like that. We're doing good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Riley. Our, our next speaker is Michelle Turner. Michelle, if you'd uh, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have uh, a minute to address the board. Okay. My name is Michelle Turner. I live in the Phillips neighborhood. And this is my letter. Dear commissioners, would you consider using the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board resources and reach to organize a Movies in the Park series? This series would be composed of films like 13th, Just Mercy, and Selma, and used to foster community discussions on race and racial history. I, Minneapolis resident Michelle Turner, would be happy to orchestrate details, communication, and coordinate volunteers. Minneapolis is experiencing a unique moment right now where pain is palpable and there's real opportunity for education, conversation, and healing. 
I realize your normally scheduled music and movies in the park series was canceled this year due to COVID. The pandemic should not be overlooked and I believe suitable precautions can be taken. Already the Waconia city government has hosted a socially distanced movie in the park and since June 14th, the new Don Theater has organized outdoor screenings of A Breath for George Floyd. Director Ava DuVernay shared, we've got to understand where we've been to strategize where we're going. History helps us create the blueprint onward. I now turn the call to you. Using the power of film, community, and conversation, will you help this city strategize where we are going next? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner. Uh, our next speaker is Alexis Kramer. Alexis, if you come forward, state your name. Uh, if you're comfortable, your address, and you do have a minute to address the board. And again, if you just a little bit back from the mic so commissioners can hear you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Well, I can hear myself. Okay. <laughs> um, my name's Alexis Kramer. Um, I'm actually currently homeless. I'm at Millennium Hotel right now. Um, I've been helping the residents that are at Powderhorn Park when they were at Sheraton Hotel. Um, from time to time, I've been helping them with security at Powderhorn Park. But lately, I've been um, caught up with my own homework and other stuff that I need to do for myself. Um, and I just recently heard about what was going on last night, and it, it's, ju it's just not okay. You know, I'm sick of people telling people experiencing homelessness where to go, how to live, and you people have never been homeless before. You know, I'm tired of people telling me where I should go and how I should, and I can't even get permanent housing because a lot of people, what people don't understand is there's children that are outside at that park right now. There are families that need to get in housing, but there are people that are dealing with child protection and they can't even fight to get their children back because they're too busy being homeless on the streets. We need housing solutions now. There may be people that are criminal backgrounds, but they can't, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you have a criminal background. Everybody deserves a second chance. And for the people that are just using the past against you just to block people from housing, that's not okay. Enough, that, that's enough. Like, I'm tired of it all. I'm tired of, you know, it's just, it really hurts because I'm going through the same things that they're going through. I can't get permanent housing, and I'm scared for them. I'm scared that they're going to be out on the streets when winter happens, and it's like, where, and at that same time, where am I going to go? And all I can do is advocate for them, and I'm going to keep advocating for them because I'm still homeless, and that's what I do. But I'm also, if anybody is dealing with child protection, I'm also going to advocate for them too because that's the kind of person I am. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kramer. Our next, uh, our next speaker is Mariel Harris. Mariel, if you. Marcel. Marcel, my apologies, Marcel. Let Marcel, if you come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. Uh, Marcel Harris, uh, just wrote my speech now. So I live at Powderhorn Park as of, I live at Powderhorn Park. This. Planet, okay, starting the beginning of my speech, this planet depends on us. Race is fickle, animals do matter as well. Project Sweetie Pie, due to Michael Cheney, I met with Gene from uh, Family of Trees. Very proud to say that I vote climate. I believe in the urban farming culture because uh, while learning a new trait, I discovered I can do, I can also teach every wise-eyed age, color, and peaceful energy protesters with God's school of life. I see Esther from District 59B as an asset and former friend in my eyes. She's helped me out through homelessness as well, and she's pushing me to the next step. Uh, Powderhorn Park made me. Lina Porwit saved me. I am homeless and vegan through that change due to what we are forming and we need this to stick full force. Vote like humans. Lives depend on it. Change is our goal and I see no limitation on progress. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Our next speaker is Janelle Anderson. Come forward and uh, could speak. Uh, state your name. Uh, My name is Janelle Anderson, and um, I wish I mean, Janelle, you know, can you just back up from the mic oh. so commissioners can hear you. It's a little, it gets a little loud for them. Thank you. Just want to make sure that they can hear you. Well, my name is Janelle Anderson, and these things right here do not work with people that is stressed with mental problems. So I'm just telling you, these are crazy. 
So what I'm saying, saying this, I'm gonna say this right. I've been at the at the Sheraton. I've been at the at the, at the church, outside with them. I'm gonna continue staying outside with them until this stuff is stopped. They'll be on stolen land, and y'all keep on making these decisions. And what we see is white people making these decisions. We are tired. Hey, we are tired of all this stuff. We're black, brown, whatever. I'm tired of it. It's been stressful for me because every time we gotta turn around, we gotta fight to stay where we are to help these people out. And the media is treating us like we are bad and they're not bad. We on the north side. They said north side is bad. Now what you're trying to do, the south side is bad. That, I mean, this is outrageous. It's crazy. And then you limit it to 10 people to the park. That is crazy. Because you know what? We have more people that's out there than these. There's 72 parks and there are people underneath, underneath coming out. Y'all keep building these houses. Y'all ain't building nothing that's affordable to us. You're, boarding, you're building them affordable to you, not to me. And we need it to stop. We need all of this to stop. Stop and decease. Because these are good people out here. Some of them got jobs working out, working, coming out the tents, working. And they, they can't get, they, they there. They, I mean, they are working. They're not bad human beings. Not all these people do all these things that they say they do. They spend a day with them at this park. They get to know them before y'all try to judge them. Because East and West is still is good. Both of them are, we are, both are the same. I'm just saying. I just want this stuff to stop. I want to stop. Just keep coming up here. This is the second time I came up here. To, to, to tell y'all, to explain to y'all. I'm going to try to make me out a list so I can explain it to better to you. Because I'm just coming out of the top of my head and getting anxious. Uh, this is what I say. I've been there since day one. Freedom of the Street's been there since day one. When we was over there, nobody wanted to help because of this COVID-19 stuff coming on. Street West didn't even want to help. Street West was closed. Everything was closed. Y'all was rushing people. Y'all was rushing homeless people. People were sleeping on a bench. I call every day for people to get off the, out the jails all the time. I've been there. I wish you stop. Just make something affordable to us. Listen to us. Listen to the part. Listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Our, our next uh, speaker is Nadine Little. Nadine, if you're here, come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and uh, you have a minute to speak. Hello. Hi, my name is Nadine Little. I'm a resident at Potterhorn Park, Native American, and uh, as far as like you, know, you guys want us at the park, there's buildings, abandoned buildings, abandoned homes, are all over around the city. Why, if you want us out of there, fix them up and put us in there. And as far as like, and, and I'm a volunteer there. I've been there from since the Sheraton and another hotel. And I'm a resident now at Potterhorn Park. And that's all I want to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dennis Aaron. Dennis. St. Dennis, okay. Uh, our next speaker is Shaquille. Uh, forgive me if I'm getting this last name wrong, Lamonds. Shaquille, if you'd uh, come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have a minute to address the board. Uh, my name is Shaquille Lemus. Uh, I'm a resident by choice at the, uh, the park. Uh, I, I, I learned a lot out here from being in a homeless situation, even though I don't have to be. My mom a hardworking woman, so it's my auntie. Uh, but uh, being comforted and uh, taken away from our natural ability to live in, which is our naturality, I didn't know nothing about myself really too much, you know what I'm saying? So I, I don't met a lot of people out here that's, that stand for a lot of good. It is a good, it is good, it's a good community over there in the park. Uh, crime, that's always going to be around, you know what I'm saying? And if y'all take that away, it's going to just cause havoc. If people, if y'all kick, kick them out the park, it'll just cause more commotion and basically more crime in the city. 
this is actually, this is actually, mostly I haven't seen so much crime in a minute. So I'm just asking for y'all understanding. That's all it takes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lyon. <laughs> Our next speaker is Bianca. I'm going to speak for Bianca. Okay. okay. Come forward, state your name if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. All right. My name is Rico. It's the only name I go by. And I am a resident of Potter Home Park. <clears throat> Biggest thing now is stability. Everybody's in limbo. Nobody knows what's going to go on, what happened tomorrow. Are you guys going to tell us to leave or not? If you give us a place to say this is where you guys are at, then we can move forward. Then we can start building a security team and things out there that we need to have more organization. That's the problem right now. We don't know where we're going to go. So two weeks, I mean, that's a little bit, but that's not enough. Like We need a place that people are going to be at before we transition them and a place to be at where the people are going to do for the people. Nobody's going to do for each other like us. Secondly, like I said, th th is the park appropriate? I don't know. I haven't given it enough time yet. You know, tell us we're going to be there, and we I promise you we'll have organization. Next thing is, where can we go? Where can we go? Uh, Kmart, open land there. Why can't we go there? Why can't we build little houses? You know, things where people can go as they transition, okay? So that's my thing is, let us be somewhere where we can know what we're doing so we can have a step forward for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Sheila Delaney. Sheila, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sheila Delaney. I live in Loring Park. Um, my speech is on my phone, but I'm live streaming now. So what I need to say to you is um, thank you, first of all, to the Park Board for enacting refuge for people who are unsheltered. I want to call attention to how outrageous it is that the only jurisdiction that has no responsibility for housing is now called to provide shelter for people who've been unsheltered for years. Second, I need to call out the causal fallacy in all of our collective thinking about what the cause is. What is the cause of sexual assault, predation, exploitation, unsheltered homelessness? It's not, certainly not the people who are victimized by any of those things, it's us. And so there, the conditions that lead to sexual assault are in every part of our culture. I think that this F poorly uh, informed and hastily created resolution was a reaction to those two horrible assaults. Yes, those are horrible. And obviously, when we put people in tents and make them more vulnerable, more things like that will happen. This community has been trying to keep itself safe, and we have had no help except from your jurisdiction. So you're, I appreciate that you've tabled your resolution, but the, the framework where you're just going to disperse people and make it even harder for us to take care of one another and even harder for us to, to provide the basics hum that people need, food, shelter, safety, is just really ill-informed. And I appreciate that you're going to reflect, and I hope you're going to bring it back to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Our next speaker is Michelle Wenderlich. Yep. Michelle, if you uh, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. Can you hear from right here with a mask on? Yes, I think that Okay, works. great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michelle Wenderlich. Um, I'm a Whittier resident. I'm a volunteer since the Sheridan. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate looking at democratic control of public services. Uh, I also appreciate you tabling the resolution. Uh, I am in opposition to the resolution. Um, I wanted to echo Sheila that um, the park board is unfairly saddled with this responsibility. and. Um, and it feels like the state is using the park board as a bit of a tool at the moment. Um, it is clear that um, from the wording of the resolution to me that the concern for safety and health, uh, so-called concern is being used in a manipulative and non-authentic way to displace people. Um, these issues are going to happen whether people are in campaigns or not, and um, it's just more visible, and it can also be better addressed um, if, if uh, collectively and if 
um, it's visible, and we are working to do that, um, as has already been said. Um, uh, I also want to echo the comments of AK Hassan this morning, that as long as there's no plan for long-term low barrier housing in place, the people won't move and can't move. There's nowhere for them to go. Um, and they refuse to be displaced again, the conversations that I've had with residents, and that it, they're afraid that intermediate solutions will lose sight of the issue at hand. Um, uh, and that solutions really do have to come from the residents and the site coordinators themselves. And so we're asking for um, co-creation of a plan uh, with residents and coordinators by July 15th and no moving without consent. Um, I've also seen more money coming through in the last couple of days, but it's being thrown around in ways that residents haven't necessarily asked for and aren't, um, haven't, aren't involved in deciding. And um, as Tyra said at the beginning, um, people are, are justifiably suspicious of money going to service organizations and not filtering down to organizations. And um, so we're asking again for electeds to be directly in contact with site coordinators. Um, some people have been, but there's been a long, a lot of dogged resistance to that. Um, I know because I've been talking with electeds directly in the last few weeks. Um, there are identified and agreed upon site coordinators and the conversation should be through them. Um, and what I've seen from a lot of statements recently, including from Alondra Cano and other city folks, is that there's a focus on shelter um, and almost it's almost completely obscuring the focus on long-term low barrier housing that, uh, that I'm hearing from all residents. Um, things like rapidly expanding the Envision community model, which is a tiny house community model that's already approved for zoning through the city of Minneapolis. Um, uh, needing to rapidly expand that, needing to identify public buildings and land um, for various types of cooperative community land trust models. We also have money to do that. Um, hotels as um, year-round navigation centers, and also, obviously, this is not your purview, but uh, we need to extend the eviction ban until at least December 13th um, and have either cancel rent or deep rental assistance, because if not, it's going to magnify this problem completely out of control. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you for tabling your motion. Thank Thank you, Ms. Wenderlich. Our next speaker um, is Anastasia Snow. Uh, Anastasia, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and if you could uh, keep your comments to a minute. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, my name is Anastasia Snow. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I live in the Powderhorn neighborhood. Um, I was thinking about using uh, satire, like the essay, A Modest Proposal, to make my point why limiting the number of tents is extremely cruel. However, clearly, uh, there's a lack of object permanence, um, so satire may be out of your reach. These people will still exist, whether or not they are pushed out of the public site. Uh, the people in Powderhorn Encampment, only two blocks away from my house, are people. Um, and they are in need of support. They need a safe, place, safe and stable place to live. Pushing them apart will only hurt them and make them less visible and take away what power they have gained. Which is clearly the point of this thinly veiled attempt um, to help public safe, uh, health and safety. Let me per be perfectly clear, this issue uh, should not have ever been brought to the Minneapolis Parks and Rec Board. Uh, there's so many other parts of our society that have failed them and purposely oppressed them. Um, so come down out of your ivory tower and please make a compassionate decision about um, whether or not, or uh, to make a compassionate decision about the uh, people that you directly and indirectly benefit from oppressing. Black trans lives matter, black lives matter. Thank you, Ms. Snow. Our next speaker is uh, Ivan Cunningham. Even Ivan? Uh, nope, that's not. I, I'm not seeing Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham, nope. Okay. Um, our next speaker is uh, Brendan. Brendan here to speak. No, Brendan. Uh, Maxine. Seeing Maxine here. Sorry. Fantastic. Uh, Maxine, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have. Uh, one minute to address the board. My name is Maxine and I'm a resident of Minneapolis. Thank you for tabling the resolution, but tabling the resolution is the bare minimum of what y'all need to be doing. 
The people living in, at the sanctuary at Powderhorn Park have been moved so many times in the past few weeks, and to do this again with no long-term solution would be so incredibly traumatic if you want to talk about public health. I have seen so many members of our community stepping up and providing aid in so many ways, but the Parks Board is working against our collective values that housing is a human right through this resolution, and therefore I, a Minneapolis resident, do not see the Parks Board and its members as part of my community for them to even consider this resolution. You need to work towards a solution for our homeless community members and not against it. If this, if this is about park laws, why are the city's laws not promoting humans, human rights to a place to live? Why are people at brunch not wearing masks, but the public health concern is people trying to survive? The public health argument is a distraction from the problem that y'all are not priori prioritizing protecting people. If y'all truly believe in public safety and health, find a secure, long-term place for our homeless community members to live. That is a solution, not disbanding a community. I obviously, as others have said, understand that this is not the Parks Board's problem to deal with, but it's in your hands, and so you need to not take that lightly. Thank you. Thank you, Maxine. Our next speaker is Cassie Fitzgerald. Cassie, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address, and you have a minute to address the board. Thanks. Good evening. Uh, thank you, President Calgill and commissioners. My name is Cassie Fitzgerald. I live at 3100 10th Avenue South, across the street from Powderhorn Park. I wanted to say thank you for opening your hearts to consider the serious ramifications of any measure to severely limit camping in our city parks. If you had followed through on this decision, you would have displaced hundreds of people who have nowhere else to go. Countywide, there are approximately 74,000 families who have annual incomes falling below the federal poverty line, but only 1,400, I mean, pardon me, 14,000 publicly subsidized units that these households can afford. People who are experiencing homelessness cannot be simply swept under the rug so that more affluent households do not have to see them in our parks or be confronted with the lack of safety that the housing insecure face daily. In the midst of a national reckoning with racist institutions and the disparities that they create, we cannot prioritize the comfort of white homeowners just blocks away from where George Floyd was murdered. Black people make up 13% of the entire US population, but 40% of the homeless one. Continuing to displace the community by forcing people to move against their will without any more sustainable options in place will further disconnect people from the available services uh, make it harder for them to organize, to determine their own futures, and put more lives at risk. Parks are wonderful places that allow us to reconnect with nature and get fresh air and exercise when a global pandemic is forcing many to stay at home. But for those without a home, the consequences of this pandemic are far more serious. And one recent study predicts homeless populations to swell by 45% in the coming months due to COVID-19. Now is not the time to continue to kick the can down the road. Anything short of permanently stable and supportive housing options is unacceptable, especially if it continues to criminalize the mere existence of a predominantly black and brown community. Thanks again for your dedication to justice in this time of great need and for providing sanctuary to those who need it most. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gerald. Uh, our next speaker is Russ Adams. Russ, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. Hi, I'm Russ Adams. Uh, I live at 3317 14th Avenue South, so right on the east side of the, of the park. Um, I'm unemployed at the moment, but uh, for a long time, I've been a community organizer and affordable housing advocate. Um, I have mixed feelings about the encampment. Uh, as an organizer, I recognize it was a brilliant strategy. Um, folks are in place, they're not gonna be moved. Even if you had not tabled this resolution and passed it, there is no way you could have moved people tomorrow. You couldn't have started. Anybody who understands the problem and the reluctance now for authorities to use police to do violent action knows you're, you're stuck. You're, you're not gonna be able to move folks. Uh, and you shouldn't move them in that manner anyways. Uh, I've been organizing the renters and homeowners in the park uh, that live along the park uh, we had 50 people at a meeting that you, uh, uh, Commissioner Cowgill, uh, attended on June 25th. 
We had about 30 yesterday on the west side of the park. Um, folks are concerned about the spillover ancillary effects of the encampment. And when you have an honest conversation with some of the organizers and the heroic volunteers, which I try to do all the time, we all agree, maybe we say it privately, there are some challenges there. There is crime. We had speakers outside even talk about that. But when they talk about it, they talk about the need for support for security. You cannot rely on volunteers to do all the security in that park. And those security folks are doing their best to contain the situation in the park. They have no control over the cars and the street activity, nor do you as park board commissioners. You need help from the city if you're going to address the number one issue that the homeowners and renters, the locals, as the folks in the encampments call them, have been saying for weeks now that they have a problem with. There are some very moving letters that I know that you got. You should read them. They talk about this problem. People are not sleeping. The pathway of the, the folks experiencing homelessness is obviously harder than somebody who is housed. But we have to respect everybody's viewpoint and opinion. And I know I'm past my minute, but I know you gave a few folks a little bit longer. Um, you need real solutions. You need to partner with the cities that can deliver that. Um, when Rico said, use the Kmart to test drive the, lo the little homes, idea, that's a brilliant solution. The city of Minneapolis owns that property. You would never suggest putting tents on that property. It's all asphalt. That would be ridiculous. But you can put tiny homes and you can employ people to build those. And that's what Rico's idea is. I know this because we had the conversation outside, which is what I encourage everybody who lives in Powderhorn to do, to sit down and chat. So here's my pledge to you. I'm an organizer. I'm going to continue organizing. I'm going to continue talking to government folks to try to find real solutions so that folks can find dignified housing. You need deadlines to do that. You need rules around your sanctuary. You made a mistake in passing something without any sense of rules. I know you were trying to modify that today. It was probably the right decision to table it when you don't have unanimity on that. But you have to, he have to keep moving towards that. You pass the sanctuary resolution. You now own it. Even if you don't have the resources, even if it's not your mission, you have a responsibility to these folks who are caught in the middle to help find a solution. You don't have to do that alone. There are plenty of people that will help. I'm one of them. Thank you, Mr. Adams. Uh, on our, our next speaker is Alex Church. Alex, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. Good evening. My name is Alex Church. I'm a Minneapolis resident, and I am very lucky to have never experienced a lot of the issues that the people at this encampment have experienced in their life that brought them there. But I have been working in the food tent uh, there for the last couple of weeks, so I feel like I have some insights. And what I wanted to implore to you all is that this is an entirely community-driven effort. To the best of my knowledge, nearly every single donation is from a private citizen or a private business. And and homelessness is not a private issue. If this encampment dissolves, it is going to go exactly in the direction that it had in the past, pre-pandemic, but with the other two pandemics of systemic racism, as well as the coronavirus rampaging through the streets along with the pandemic of homelessness. And I understand that you're a park board. As has been previously said, this isn't necessarily your purview. However, you are all elected officials who have the capacity to connect with other elected officials. And I truly implore you to reach out for the other resources in the city available to you and see what there is to be done in terms of intergovernmental approach. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Our next speaker is Rick Garfield. Rick here. Not seeing him. Uh, our next speaker then is Wanda Richardson. Wanda, if you come forward, state your name. If you're comfortable, your address for the record and you have one minute to address the well, good evening. My name is Wanda Richardson. I live at 3737 13th Avenue South. I've been a resident of Powderhorn neighborhood for 35 plus years. And I love my neighbors. I love my neighborhood and I love my neighborhood park with no exceptions. And I have to say it has been heartbreaking for me and most of my fellow neighbors to see what is basically a refugee camp in our park, to see the level of suffering and hardship 
that the people there are going through and the complete lack of support from outside of our neighborhood in terms of elected officials to both relieve the immediate suffering and the humanitarian needs of these fellow human beings, but also to provide leadership in terms of permanent, affordable housing that everybody deserves. And I do understand the level of difficulty that all elected officials and citizens are laboring under right now, but I have to say that when our city was doing well, when we had a budget surplus, nobody addressed this problem. And so when elected officials respond to us by saying, we don't have money to help people, we don't have money for housing, well, it wasn't addressed when we did have money. So it's not a really a financial issue. It has to do with a lack of political will and the desire to truly help the people that most need help among us. So I'm asking you, instead of putting your energies into finding ways to try and make people who previously were invisible, who are now visible because of the other pandemics that have been referenced, to put your energies into finding real solutions that will work for all of us. I know the people in my neighborhood have been giving everything they've got right now to help, and that's all we're asking from you. In ordinary times, 10 you know, parks, you could have 10 campsites there. People would be rejoicing because who doesn't want to camp in a beautiful park? But this is not camping. 10 tents in 10 parks doesn't even begin to approach the level of help that's needed. These aren't ordinary times. They're extraordinary times, and they're demanding extraordinary efforts from all of us. I know in our neighborhood in Potterhorn, people are trying to give that, and we're asking you to do the same. So thank you again for listening, for taking our comments, and I'm just going to ask again to please step up to the best of your ability. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Our next speaker is Marie, Marie Nichols, Nicholas. Marie yes. Nicholas. Marie, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have uh, a minute to address the board. Hello, uh, my name is Marie Nicholas. Um, I'm here to just once again implore and reiterate because housing is a human right. And for, many, for years, Minneapolis has forcibly removed people and built fences instead of addressing their abhorrent neglect of a human right. Now the people have done what our government refused to do. We reallocated resources to protect the dignity and the well-being of all of our community members. To undo this progress and to discontinue, er, discontinue eviction protections at a time of pandemic, we commit our people to death and suffering. We don't need you, but we need you to help us help ourselves. We don't need <clears throat> to be removing people from their homes in a time like now or in any other time because it is an egregious violation of our rights. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Our next speaker is Cygnus uh, Sundaughter. Are you here? Same here. Uh, our next speaker is Jessica Web Webker. Jessica, if you come forward, um, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. My name is Jessica Webker. I'm a resident of the Lindale neighborhood. I'm here to echo the voices of the residents, volunteers, and activists directly involved with the sanctuary. Housing is a human right. You made a historic choice to declare parks as sanctuaries when the world was watching, and we will not let you quietly roll back those protections. You have a chance to set an example for the world of how a park system can and should stand in support of its community. Demand that the city and state support you with this. As leaders outside said, the park board is the largest steward of stolen land in Minneapolis. You have a chance here to break Minnesota's racist history of forcing people off of stolen land. Minneapolis parks are a vital part of our city, and the people of Minneapolis have made it clear that we want our neighbors housed, not displaced. Choosing to forcibly remove park residents is not only morally wrong, it will set back all the hard work and progress residents and community members have made. We will be here again in two weeks. Thank you, Jessica. Our next speaker is Chloe Goodman. Chloe, if you come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute. My name is Chloe Goodman. I'm a Whittier resident in South Minneapolis. Um, I'm here to demand that you do not once again displace our unsheltered Minneapolis residents. Everyone has a right to housing. It's inhumane and cruel to remove our neighbors from parks and the resources that we have set up with no government assistance. We need permanent housing solutions now and we cannot move people who have children in these parks who are experiencing homelessness during a global health pandemic as well. Um, 
Now that the vote has been delayed, um, I hope that all of you are going to be going down there and volunteering at Powderhorn as well as the other parks where the overflow is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Janelle Anderson. Janelle, are you here? Um, our next speaker is Guillermo. Guillermo here? Guillermo, if you come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Guillermo. Uh, I'm living in Powderhorn Park right now. And, you know, I think a lot of people have been thanking you for tabling the resolution. I don't think you deserve thanks. Um, this shouldn't have happened in the first place. What we need is for people like you, people in positions of power, not just the park board, but the whole government system, to stop posturing like you always do and start actually doing action to help. It's always saying all these good words. Going to Powderhorn Park prior, like the, the city council people did, and they went back on the word within 24 hours. And just like that, y'all are going back on your word for keeping these places sanctuaries. You're paying too much attention to people like Alondra Cano, who hasn't even been at the sanctuary. I've been there every day, helping every day, into the night, into 4 a.m. I've never seen her. And if she was there, it was for a photo op or something because she didn't stay for long. You can't be listening to people that aren't there. You have to listen to the voices on the ground. There's even people at the park still using it for its recreational purposes. They see no problem. They're not complaining. They're respecting the space. They're respecting the sanctuary because the sanctuary also respects them because we realize it's still a public park. So stop making up these invent invented fantasies of issues uh, like COVID-19. That's real, but you're using that as an excuse to kick people out, and it'll be even worse if, they, I mean, if they're not there. They're going to be on the street alone without a collective way of fighting COVID, of fighting different issues. Stop trying to kick people out. Just find a real solution. Stop talking. Start doing. Thank you, Guillermo. The next speaker is Sabrina. Sabrina, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Um, my name is Sabrina. I am a Minneapolis resident. If you could back um, up a little bit so sorry. the commissioners can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. As a Minneapolis resident, I was very happy when the initial resolution was passed and considered it to be a huge pragmatic victory because you, the park board, were doing what was in your power to really try and help solve a fundamental problem in our city, in our state, and in you know the whole country. Um, and so I commend you for doing what you could, but I was shocked when I heard that this amend when I heard that this amendment was was being voted on, because it's completely antithetical to the original original re resolution. And I and others would like to know who requested it and who authored it, so that we can hold them accountable. This resolution is premature now, and it will continue, and it will also be premature in two weeks. So instead of targeting the most vulnerable Minneapolis residents, and they are Minneapolis residents, they are not like outsiders coming in um, and taking up resources. Uh, then you, they, they just happen to not have like personal addresses. Instead of targeting them, you should be, as others have said, using your political leverage to demand resources from other Minnesota and Minneapolis agencies who have the ability to monitor the streets and have the ability to, um, to funnel in more res resources to the most vulnerable population, many of which are indigenous people who have had their land stolen historically, or African American people who did not choose to be on this land, and yet they are homeless and without any, and without any hard shelter. If you attempt to vote on this resolution again in two weeks, we will be back in much greater numbers. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Our next speaker is Michelle Turner. Michelle here. Uh, our next speaker is Frank Mahoney. Frank here. No. Uh, next speaker, Maggie Mills. Is Maggie here to speak? Not seeing Maggie. Janet Schmidt. Alonzo Morse, Alonzo here. Alonzo, if you come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have a minute to address the board. Hello, my name is Alonzo Morse. I am a representative with Sony Music, and I have been voluntarily helping out at the park for the past few weeks. I think the solution would be to try to get these people that's homeless an opportunity to be able to work a job so they can be able to be able to be self like employed and earn an income to be able to put themselves in a great situation where they can save money and be able to house their self. And at least that gives them enough time to be productive because I feel like if you're working a job, then it, it most definitely helps the mind and it helps the confidence and it, it kind of takes a lot of stress off the other volunteers and a lot of people that's in the community helping. 
And um, I think one one big issue that need to get addressed as far as like the single mothers that's there with kids in the parks. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Alonzo. Our next speaker is Tracy uh, Blassenheim. Tracy, if you come forward, state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have one minute to address the board. Hi, I'm Tracy Blassenheim. I'm a resident of Lowry Hill East, and I am the site coordinator for Powderhorn Park East. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota, and for the last two weeks, I have run the single most safe place for the most desperate people in the city. I'm also the older brother to a young man who for years has been housing insecure and homeless. He's my brother and I know firsthand how this sort of thing rips through your family like a knife. You see 300 people in that park, that is times that by 10 for the amount of people whose lives are ripped apart by homelessness and unhousedness. And the fact that I, I'm trying to write a dissertation on international law and I'm running a homeless camp for 300 people, that is a shame upon the state of Minnesota, the city of Minneapolis. That is an indictment down to our very core that this problem has gotten this bad. That families come to me in the middle of the night looking for tents and shelter. Are you kidding me? That is a shame. And it is a greater shame whoever I don't know who it was, whoever is behind the uh, blank screens right now who put this resolution to kick people out of this place, which is not a permanent solution by any means. But you know what? Give us something better. People will go. That's how you end this. Not by ripping people out of their tents one more time making them even more vulnerable and desperate, making them lose their possessions that they have scram scrimped and saved in order to uh, have on their persons, putting women and children at risk, way more risk than we have right now. And you dare to call this resolution something uh, safe for the people of this camp? That is disgusting. It is heartless. And I want to know, if we are to solve this, where, where is the city council? Where is my city councilwoman, Lisa Bender, president of the city council? Where is she? If you're watching Lisa Bender, you, you know where I am. Every day, 12 to 18 hours a day, 33rd Street, 10th, uh, sorry, 14th Avenue, East Camp. You come talk to me anytime. Come talk to these residents. See what they have been through. See what this would do to them. And if you, so many people on the city council got up and said just a few weeks ago in Powderhorn Park that they want to reshape the Minneapolis Police Department, defund. You cannot defund the police department without giving people homes. Full stop. So if you don't solve this problem, you have revealed to everyone that you did not mean a single thing that you said. And so it's time to get you out with the ballot box or get back on the streets. There is no other option. Act now. Thank you, um, Tracy. Uh, I don't believe our other speakers are here. Uh, Kyle Wilson, is Kyle here? Kyle, come on forward. You could state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record and you have uh, one minute to address the board. Hello, my name is Kyle Wilson. I am a resident at Powderhorn East Camp. I myself, I've been there for a little bit and I oversee the eastern half of the encampment as a resident. I have counted 173 tens. Multiply by two, that's 346. That doesn't account for some families being three to five, even as much as nine people in a family. And mentioning families means, see, went to 12, 12 families. And that does not mean boyfriend and girlfriend, but that means families with children. And to kick us out, that means putting these children and their families into the streets, not knowing where to go because they s seek this as a refuge or a sanctuary. This is a sanctuary state, so why are not the parks and recreation a sanctuary? So I would like to see that. 
we get a little bit of water, you know, turn your waters on. I, I am thankful they gave us a little power, electricity, because we were trying to run this out, out of a generator, and that's not enough electricity. So they're pointing at this, saying that it's not safe, that we're not doing our, I've been there pretty much since the beginning of it at Powderhorn, and I oversee the, the eastern half. I've been there 10 days, and out of those 10 days, like overseeing, overseeing the place and trying to make it safe and suitable for living, three of those days, no cops, no authorities called for a whole day. So that is an improvement. You know, we're working on it. We're trying to get better organized. So if I can have you guys allow us a little more time and show you that we will make this place safe. We'll all get this done. We'll all get, with your help, people into houses. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, I think our next speaker is Madeline Karas. Madeline, if you'd come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the public record. And you have uh, one minute to address the board. Um, can you hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Maddie and I reside at 2315 Colfax Avenue South, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a volunteer community support coordinator at Powderhorn Park East and I've spent every day for the last few weeks building relationships with the family and children at this camp. Um, not only do I care about these families and the residents, but I also care about their happiness and about their safety. Um, at the park, we're able to support these families and help find them the housing that they need because of the resources we're able to provide for them. If we split these sanctuaries up, where will they go? Where will these families go? How will they get the support they're entitled to have? I hope you remember that these are people and they have feelings at the end of the day. They're struggling and they're asking us to listen and to respond with direct action. Please take the time to hear, see, and recognize these residents on the most basic human level. I've made lifelong relationships with these families and want to see what's best for them. You have a responsibility to help these families. The community has been here to help, and so now we need you to step up. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, seeing one more speaker, Mr. Tate. Are you here to speak? Okay. Um, is anybody else here to speak? Seeing none. Um, we can close uh, open time. Uh, moving on with the agenda, we are at item three. So um, I'm at, I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes um, uh, of both Wednesday, May 20th and Wednesday, June 17th. Uh, I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion on approval of the minutes? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. President Kogan. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Uh, that uh, carries. Uh, moving into reports of officers, I'll ask the uh, superintendent uh, if you'd like to provide a short report. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Kogio and commissioners. I'll try to move this as quickly as possible um, and uh, appreciate the time. Uh, real quickly, um, athletics, aquatics, ice arenas, um, fun on the run. The past two weeks, uh, the program has had 233 youth participate in activities, including agility course, uh, fly ball, cornhole, lawn, lawn bowling, jump ropes, 
potato stack races, disc, uh, disc, disc, golf, and soccer and football drills at 12 park sites across the city. This program will run until October, August 27th. So I'm very, very happy about those activities. So thank you for staff for doing that. Adult sports, Sand Volleyball League begin July 6th at Worth Park. Ice arenas, figure skating and hockey instruction rentals have been going well at parade with social distancing. Uh, beginning July 13th, youth and adult hockey games will begin at parade. Aquatics, lifeguard services begin June 20th at three beaches uh, with increase uh, to five beaches beginning daily on July 2nd. Um, we have received a grant from the USA Swimming in the amount of $22,000 for our swimming fleet lessons swimming lesson scholarship program. We are excited to use this funding to teach uh, youth and adult swimming lessons once it is safe to do so. Uh, golf, uh, Minneapolis uh, golf course continue to provide social distancing appropriate recreational opportunities for golfers around the city. So far the uh, in 2020 MPRB is over 8,000 rounds ahead of 2019 pace. Uh, youth development. The next group of Team Teamworks youth are being hired and placed at waiting pools and golf courses. Uh, the youth will begin work on July 6th and will work through August 14th. Extremely proud of them. Full service community school. Beth, uh, Bethune has launched a virtual family uh, resource room. Families will have uh, virtual access to school info and updates, community events and resources, and additional enrichment and ac academic opportunities. Forestry, the Forestry Department partnered with the Southeast Homo Neighborhood Association on a grant received from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, which uh, converted a traffic diverter into a rain garden after removing the existing uh, uh, shrub or scrub trees and before the area was excavated, the forestry team planted a uh, bicolor oak to finalize the project. As the management, maintenance, Maintenance staff continue to prepare the park system for visitors uh, while continuing to navigate social distancing guidelines. Uh, this spring, the asset management crew worked on memorial paver installation at Lake Harriet Banshell. MPRB receives donations of bricks from the people for parks and are installed by a team uh, twice a year in the spring and fall. In addition to asset management team completed a building uh, of memorial uh, and tribute benches which are built uh, by the carpentry and our concrete shops. This work is a is coordinated effort through the Memorial and Tribute Edge program. The team also completed a replacement of a drinking fountain project at Boom Island uh, that has been out of service for several years. The fountain includes an underground vault and an aid to annual maintenance activities required for outdoor uh, fountains. Environmental management team, environmental volunteer update. 66 park stewardship teams have committed uh, to the 2020 season. All of them com uh, complying with COVID or compl complying with COVID-19 volunteer safety guidelines. Currently, volunteer events are limited to 25 volunteers, which includes staff leads. Groups uh, over over nine are split into smaller teams to assess with tasks that allow for six feet social distancing. Social distance signage reminds volunteers and the public to stay six feet away from each other and tool sharing is not allowed and tools are sanitized uh, events. Uh, liability waivers and signups are online and paperless, no pen sharing. So weekly and monthly staff lead events, lead events are being held at the following locations. Loring Park Garden, Longfellow Garden, Lindale Park Peace and Rose Gardens, and the Overlook Garden at Park Siding Park. Uh, planning Division, uh, Minnehaha Parkway Regional Trail Master Plan. Uh, the public comment period opens for 45 days as of June 19, uh, 2020. Check out the draft master plan uh, for Minnehaha Creek and the surrounding parkland and trails in Minneapolis and tell us what you think by August 3rd. The master plan document is available on the NPRB website um, and underneath the Minnehaha Parkway Regional Trail Master Plan project page. Comments will be accepted primarily online due to the ongoing COVID-19 um, pandemic and the current closure uh, of the MPRB Recreation Centers. Community members can share their thoughts through an online survey or by emailing or calling 
the project manager work reference on the pro project page under Minneapolis Parkway Regional Trail Master Plan. Fallwheel Park Improvement Update. The tennis court improvements at Fallwheel Park are nearly complete. Construction on the series of improvements at the park is in its final phase. After installation of new playground, equipment last fall, and other work that resumed in March. These current improvements include tennis courts um, are nearly complete after the final installation of asphalt and following 30 days of curing time, uh, application uh, of the final coating. Uh, field lights and improvements on path and path lighting are nearly complete. Um, help the grass grow. So during the final phase, please stay off uh, out of the fenced areas so the grass can grow. Uh, end of July is the expected completion of the entire project. Are in delays due to construction weather or unanticipated situations. Public access, one complete facility will be based on the MPRB's COVID-19 guidelines at that time. And Phelps Park Project Update, the first phase of the construction begins in July uh, with completion of the new playground and other phase one improvements expected in the fall of 2020, barring delays due to weather, construction or COVID-19. The phase one improvements include removal of existing waiting pool, play equipment, and surfacing in the playground, installation of a new playground equipment and play area surfacing, installation of a new path lighting, ADA accessibility improvements to path and parking areas, and improvements of landscaping near the playground. Um, and uh, really excited about that, so long time coming. Um, improvements at the Cleveland Fairview and Lovell Square Park Construction begins this summer. Playground improvement project at Cleveland, Fairview, and Lovell Square neighborhood parks in North Minneapolis are moving into their construction phase after the approval of construction contracts by the Board of Commissioners. Each project includes new playground areas with seating and landscaping. Existing playgrounds will be removed to create new flexible use of park space. Uh, at Lovell Square, the new south side play area includes a nature themed childhood play area and a loose parts nature play area. Improvements at these parks are guided by long-term plan for each park included in the North Service Area Master Plan and are funded by the 20-year Neighborhood Park Plan, NTP 20. Construction at each park is planned to begin in the coming week with completion, with completion later in the year, barring delays, of course, due to weather, construction, or COVID-19. Uh, with that, President Cogill, Commissioners, uh, thank you for your time. I wanted to make sure I got these all in to talk about the work that we continue to do during these difficult times and the park board is moving through all some wonderful programs and uh, keeping our parks uh, moving and uh, construction moving and growing. So thank you very much and thank you to the staff for all their work. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Uh, we have a com question from Commissioner Meyer. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, what, what did you say about a drinking fountain at Boom Island? Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, the team uh, completed a replacement of a drinking fountain project at Boom Island. And it's been there for several years. So they completed the drinking fountain. Uh, I think there was a picture back that can show that. But that fountain um, includes an underground vault uh, to aid in annual maintenance activities required for outdoor fountains. And, and can people use that right now? Our phones are not yet running uh, based on our COVID-19 uh, requirements. And if I'm not correct about that, Assistant Superintendent uh, Barrett, please let me know. But I'm not at this time um, that yeah. I'm aware that we have opened up our water fountains uh, based on the guidelines that are in front of us. For right, I mean, this is why I was asking, because I, you know, I asked about this at the previous yeah. meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to give my input that you know, I've gotten a lot of feedback from constituents who would really like the, the drinking fountains to be open. And I, I do understand the concerns we have with COVID, but right now I really feel that's outweighed um, by, you know, sort of like dehydration and, and people's health when it's, it's very hot out and, um, and people are, are, are trying to get exercise. Um, so I, I would encourage some uh, drinking fountains to uh, be you know, uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Meyer, thank you for that. And uh, I will continue to look into that. I know that we follow the health guidelines that are uh, told us by uh, the health department and uh, CDC guidelines. And so unless it's loosened up, but we will continue to uh, ask questions and I will follow up with that immediately um, 
starting tomorrow to see what the guidelines are still currently out there. But at this time, I think um, I think it's the same as been told before. But I will follow up with Commissioner Meyer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Superintendent. I see no other hands. Uh, we move on uh, the uh, agenda. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. My apologies, Commissioners. Hope you can hear me now. Um, we'll move on to the consent agenda here. We uh, have uh, three items. I'll ask for a motion for resolutions 2020 254 through resolution 2020 256. Do I have a motion? A motion, do I have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Uh, is there any discussion the consent agenda? Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Bourne. Thank you. Thank you, President Cogill. I'd like to ask if the uh, third resolution of the contract with BIF, that one that's up right now, 256, be pulled for discussion? Um, the request uh, that resolution 2020 256 be pulled for discussion has been noted. Uh, is there any uh, discussion on resolutions 2020 254 or 2020 255? Seeing none, we will vote on those two resolutions before moving on to a discussion on resolution 2020 256. Uh, would this uh, secretary please take the roll? Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. Vice President Kogel. Oh. Uh, or sorry, President uh, Kogel. Can you hear me? Oh. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. President Kogel. Aye. You have nine ayes. Uh, resolutions 2020-254 and 255 carry. Moving on to resolution 2020-256 has been pulled for discussion. Um, I believe it has been moved and seconded. Uh, so I will stand for any discussion on resolution 2020-256. Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Kogel. I, I'm just reading the background material on this resolution and it's pretty light. Uh, can we just get a uh, brief overview on the $500,000 increase to the contract? Uh, certainly, I'll call on uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrick um, and or uh, Ms. Groening. Yes, uh, President Kogel, Commissioner Bourne. Um, yeah, we have uh, Roberta Groening, um, the admin, divisional admin, um, who puts these contracts together. She can probably provide a more in-depth detail than I, but um, this is essentially adding money to our existing contract as we've um, gotten into the year here with our expenditures on this. And so, um, Roberta, if you're there, and want to chime in. I know you have, there's some background here, I believe, with the city procurements as well. Correct. Uh, this is a uh, contract through the city of Minneapolis. Um, we had uh, asked for, at the beginning of March, 275000 
which is what we had budgeted for our expenditures for the general park board um, usage. But with the um, COVID-19 expansion of this usage, uh, in addition to the encampment, we will outspend uh, that amount of money that is in the, the general amount for the contract. So we are adding the additional amount so that we can pay invoices. Uh, any uh, other dis thank you. Oh. Continue, thank Commissioner you. Bourne. Thank you, President Colgill and Ms. Groning and Assistant Superintendent. So this is this is to pave future anticipated expenses. It's not for we're not already holding a bill for delivered goods, correct? That is correct. We are getting to the end of the two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars that we had anticipated spending not knowing how much more we will spend uh, due to the encampment and the continuing uh, COVID operations. We are guesstimating with the help of the city of how much more we will spend until the end of the contract, which is uh, next year. So do we have even just kind of an educated guess based on some of the encampments that we're already serving like what is the amount that, like maybe a better question is, what is the amount that we've spent on encampment so far that we wouldn't that we wouldn't have spent this time last year? I'm just wondering, if that, I, I think we should be asking the Minneapolis Health Department and Hennepin County for some assistance on this if there's, if it's going towards encampments. Um, so I'm just trying to get an idea of what that would look like. Uh President Colgo. Oh, sorry, Roberta. Um, um, go ahead, Jeremy. Okay. Uh, so, President Colgo, Commissioner Bourne. Um, yes, we are getting help. We um, have been in contact with the state. There are funds available um, for sanitation. Uh, we will be pursuing those funds. Um, they, uh, they do retro pay back to April 1. So, right now, we're fronting the cost. The way these costs come into us, so you asked about the encampment, we will have a finance update on the July 15th. That'll give you a better sense because right now we're billed monthly. Um, and so this is week two with 25 units at, at uh, Powderhorn in particular, one at Lindale, additional one at Franklin Steel. I believe those are the changes. You'll see that in a later presentation. Um, but those, those, so we can, we know what we're spending weekly by, you know, in our heads and what we're tracking now, uh, but we don't see the bill for another 30 days. So we're building those finance tracking mechanisms. Um, we have identified some potential reimbursement funding for hygiene. We're going to be pursuing that. Um, in this, in this case here, um, as Roberta said, it's a, it's a estimate projection assisted by the city um, not having a crystal ball to understand exactly what we're going to need we, this is kind of the situation we're in where we have to make a projection then we have to track and monitor and obviously we would be back if there's a change or um, the, the estimate was off so the I, i'm I don't know if I'm comfortable moving this forward on on the possibility of of repayment. I, I I'm looking for maybe some staff direction to go along with this. So so the the reimbursement piece that they are talking about, Assistant Superintendent Barrick, that's from a state pool of funds. President Kogan, Commissioner Boyd, I. There may be some federal money into it too. The finance group was looking at the original source. The state is the body that provided us uh, or distributes the funds. I don't know if all of the funds are state funds or if there's a mix of federal funds and they're distributing on behalf of the feds. But there's nothing that we're looking at from like the Hennepin County Office to end homelessness or the Minneapolis Health Department at this time. President Colgo, Commissioner Bourne, 
uh, in, a, in a form of funding or assistance? In the form of funding for these BIFs that we're putting in these accounts. Um, President Koga, Commissioner Watts, I don't believe the city and the county have funding. Um, I, I do believe the city is receiving the same state funding. Uh, it's my understanding that like with the hygiene station that the city is paying for, they're using the city, uh, they're using the same state funding we're now going to be applying for. And do we have the city's support in that application? President Kogo, Commissioner Board, yes. Even if it's at the expense of something else that they might be applying for? President Kogo, Commissioner Board, yes. They recognize that if we are self-sufficient receiving our own funding, they have encampments on their own property, um, that their hygiene stations need to be funded there too. Okay. And do we, do we have that support for this application over the city, from the city, and writing from, from the city? President Cole, Commissioner. Support from the city for this, for this application. Uh, President Cole, Commissioner Board, no, we don't have anything. We don't have a written agreement or a written letter of support. Um, I, would, I would say too, though, that the resolution before you is, um, while it's related to this pursuit of state funding, it's separate. So um, this is allowing us to increase our funding or increase our spending on the city contract we're a part of for BIS. We will be pursuing uh, reimbursement and future funding uh, through the state uh, state application, state funding source that is the same that the city receives their funding from. Do you know a likelihood of success in pursuing that reimbursement? President Cole, Commissioner Board, I can't speak to the likelihood of success okay. at this point. How much do we have left on the contract right now? Like, can we operate until the next board meeting? If we, can we operate under the contract until the next board meeting? President Kogo, Commissioner Bourne, uh, uh, Roberta, is there any chance you have that number readily available of what's currently left in our funding for the BIS contract? Um, I do not. I'd have to check in with our accounting department, but. I think the amount that we have left is in the neighborhood of between 150 and 180 based on the bills that we paid for 2020. Uh, the concern is if we um, if we wait and we receive the invoices that we will be coming due, we won't have enough money in the contract to pay those invoices. Until, until July 15th. We're going to have one hundred and eighty thousand dollars of invoices between now and July fifteenth. I I do not know that, Commissioner. I'm just saying that about one hundred and eighty thousand is what my recall is what remains in the con in the current con. Okay, and I would I would also mention that it's seventeen hundred dollars a week for one unit with daily service. Okay. Um, well, I, I guess what I, I'd like to do, President Cogill, I, I, I'd like to get an answer to see if we can get to July 15th at our next board meeting um, without having insufficient funds to pay this. Um, I, there's so many other folks with resources at the table, and I, and I think as we just heard from speaker after speaker after speaker, that we're kind of the only ones putting up funding right now, something that isn't our responsibility to do. Uh, and I understand if there's no funding available, we will be on the hook for this, but I, but I, I think we have the, the minimal obligation to ask Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis to help with the portion of the expenses of this contract so, that are so increasing because of the Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Your time is up.
So I would like to move to table resolution 2022-56. Okay, there's a motion to table resolution 2022-56. I second it. There is a motion to table uh, 2022-56. It has been seconded. Um, and I'm, is there any discussion at this point? Yes, uh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner French. Uh, no, no, no discussion. Thank you. Uh, then I will uh, lower Commissioner French's hand. Um, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on tabling resolution 2020-256. Commissioner Barn. Aye. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. No. President Kogil. No. You have three ayes, six nays. Uh, the motion to table fails. Uh, back to uh, the resolution. Uh, are there any? Is there any other discussion? Um, okay, Commissioner Bourne for one minute for the second time. Uh, thank you, President, President Kogel. I'd like to offer an amendment to the resolution, um, adding a period to the end of through the end of March 21st and adding the words, be it further resolved, that the Board of Commissioners direct staff to seek reimbursement for the satellite restroom facilities being used in homeless encampments from the City of Minneapolis Health Department and Hennepin County Hennepin County's office to end homelessness, period. Uh, the amendment has been made. Is there a second? Is there a second to the amendment? Is there a second? Second. I'll second. The amendment second. has a second. Is there any discussion to the amendment, Commissioner French? Well, I guess the, my, my uh, issue, I guess, with, with I think what Commissioner Bourne was trying to get to is that the certain interviews that just haven't paid your fair share, and we would love to try to get an account, uh, trying to get an account of what the fair share of the of the county and the city would be if, we, if we're paying extra money for pets and paying extra money. Uh, for sanitation stations, then we would love to try to get some of our partners to, to contribute to this. And I think that's what a lot of the folks who were uh, speaking tonight said that we need to spread out the cost of the board to more than just the park board, but to other agencies like the county and the city. So it'd be nice to, to kind of get a, a reading of, of, of what, what the city and, and the county could, could be possibly reimbursing the, the park board. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Commissioner French, Thank Commissioner you. Meyer, followed by Vice President Vita. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly think that we should seek reimbursement, but I'm questioning the target. Isn't, it, isn't the state the most relevant one? Is, is then, aren't, aren't ESG funds um, used to reimburse this? Uh, that's a question to. Assistant Superintendent Barrick, like, I mean, this qualifies for ESG money, right? Uh, President Colville, Commissioner Bourne, uh, it is the state. I, the title of the funding, that sounds familiar, um, but I don't have the exact name. And I'm trying to look it up as I'm speaking here, but it, I don't have the exact name of, um, the funding source. If someone else does, I'd welcome. I think it stands for emergency service grants or something, but uh, if the motion maker would take a friendly amendment to add the state to it. In addition to 
Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis. Yeah, but I would receive that as a friendly amendment. Okay, thank you. And but noting, I, I think the state really is the big one that uh, should pull responsibility for it. But thank it you. can be all three. Years. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer, uh, Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Cogill. I have a couple questions. So, if we have uh, more encampments going up, are we going to provide additional bits at any parks that these encampments, um, as they grow, are we continuing to um, supply more bits? I don't know who that question is for, but. Um, that would be a question for the superintendent. President Cogill, uh, Vice President Vita, uh, uh, yes. I mean, at this point, what happens is as we are expanding and more encampments are growing throughout our park system, the immediate required email that I received is we need a, we need a BIF and a hand washing station at every encampment that grows. Uh, Lindell Farmstead, for example, uh, um, the 10 tents, we then were required at that point to bring a BIF out and a hand washing station that I believe was provided by the city. The immediate requirement at each location that grows is a bit and a hand washing station at the very minimum. Also asking for electrical, water, and other things that we need to provide because they're there on our park grounds. So yes. Okay, and, and I recall that we had a previous resolution where we um, I don't, I didn't vote for it, but a resolution passed to have this on a non-park board property. Uh, is that still, is that a part of this money that is being spent? Is that a part of this contract? There was like a $90,000 resolution passed for this on a non-park board property. Uh, President Kogel, uh, Vice President Vita. Uh, yes, the ninety-four thousand dollars we are—we have earmarked is ninety-four thousand, I believe, eight hundred uh, from the easement. Uh, at the time, there was an encampment at twenty-eighth and fourteenth tonight, and I believe that encampment was part of uh, was moved to the Sheridan during, and it was prior to the the, the uprising. Now. Uh, that they don't believe that 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 encampment's still there. They, there there are two other large encampments in the city: one on Seaped land near P, uh, PCC, and then of course along the Greenway, the county. So the city is dealing with um, the Seaped site, and the county has the, the Greenway. Um, so I hope that helps. So if that, so since that resolution passed for a specific area, do we need to now reverse that resolution and be able to use that money for someone somewhere else because that site no longer exists? Point of information, President Cogill. Yes, uh, President or Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Uh, the, the resolution that the at-large commissioner is referring to. Uh, as I recall, and the secretary can maybe double check, uh, was not location specific. It was to provide services to people experiencing homelessness in the parks across the city. There, there was an encampment on 28th Thanks. and Stephen that was next to the 28th Street top lot, but as the assistant superintendent stated, that's no longer there, but the, I believe the 90 some thousand dollars was allocated Towards the rest, uh, across the entire city in that resolution. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Uh, moving on, Commissioner Bourne, followed by Commissioner Musich. What point of information? Yes, is, Commissioner Musich. Is this resolution not just a duplication of the language that was in Resolution 2020-253 that was passed our last meeting? where we state that we want to seek um, partnership to identify housing solutions and to help us to address the, the issue of encampments within the system. Well, that would be a question for the, uh, the motion maker. 
you're referring to the amendment, I'm assuming. Yes, I'm, I'm referring to the 2020-253 language where we specifically say that we want to seek um, assistance from it, it, the resolution says resolved that the park board calls on city, county, state, and federal governments and organizations that are raising funds on behalf of individuals at the encampment to substantially increase funding to address the homelessness crisis. Uh, so are we duplicating that by amending this? Um, my interpretation would be yes. I do believe that staff is doing what it's, it can to uh, adequately recoup funds uh, that are being dispersed for a variety of issues pertaining to the encampments across the city. And we are moving forward, I think, in partnership in a strong way right now. I had a good conversation with the lieutenant governor today about some release of state funds. Um, and while we don't have anything uh, at this time to point to in writing, uh, I would say that, yes, we are covered by that resolution and by uh, the work that staff and others are already doing. Okay, since, um, this is, since this is just the same thing, um, does staff feel that they really need a, additional direction to get funding, or, or did we already give that to you last week? President uh, Cogill, Commissioner of Usage, you gave us direction. I'm working tirelessly to get funding for this organization, and we are getting uh, commitments um, and as President Cogill said, that the conversations are being had. I'm working with state, city, county every day, okay. um, doing my job to make sure that we get the funding that we are seeking to provide services across um, our park system. So yes, I'm working in partnership with all of our partners. I meet literally daily with the interagency groups. We're talking about funding, we're working through that. I'm going to the meetings, so yes. Okay, thank you. So the motion maker might want to consider withdrawing this amendment since it is just a duplication of what we've already passed as a board. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Bourne, followed by French. Thank you, uh, President Cogill. If, um, if at best this is duplicative language, I would encourage my colleagues to support this unanimously since they have seemingly supported this in earlier resolution. Um, if it's not duplicative, and what we have heard from the staff report this evening, that there is an effort to seek reimbursement from the state, I did not hear of an intentional effort on these BIFs at Powderhorn and these BIFs at Lindale Farmstead and these BIFs at other encampments to seek reimbursement from the city of Minneapolis or Hennepin County we both have substantially similar, uh, more sizable budgets than we do, and a mission that is more directly geared towards alleviating homelessness. If this is not redundant, and if I'm hearing staff report accurately that there is not a request on the table to the city and the county to help pay for these bids at encampments, then I would encourage our my colleagues even more to support this unanimously. So if it's redundant, I don't see the harm in voting for it. If it's not redundant, I don't see where a single commissioner would not want financial support from other bodies of government to pay for something that is outside of our mission. To do. So I would encourage my colleagues to support this amendment unanimously. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne, Commissioner Meyer. Thank you. Uh, I do not view this as duplicative. Uh, I think it is more specific uh, than 2020 which just referred to the general homelessness crisis, whereas this makes a specific request uh, for reimbursement <coughs> for the for the BIF. And uh, I think it's also useful um, for the benefit of the, pu of the public to know what asks uh, need to be made. I mean, staff may well be aware of uh, what reimbursements we need to be seeking from other government, but a lot of people are asking how can they help Park Board right now in lobbying uh, the other government bodies um, that need to be uh, doing more, and this is one specific thing uh, that I think we need to encourage uh, supporters to say uh, to the state, you know, please uh, support ESG funds for this reimbursement. I will support 
Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Seeing no other uh, discussion, I will ask the secretary to take the roll on uh, the amendment to resolution 2022-56. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. Uh, the amendment carries uh, now to the main resolution. Um, seeing no other discussion on the resolution with the amendment, uh, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on resolution 2020-256 with the amendment. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. You have nine ayes. That resolution carries. Uh, moving on to um, our standing committees, I'll turn it over to Chair Forney. I'd like to move, I see my second right thing. Okay, um, I'd like to move on behalf of the Admin and Finance Committee, uh, resolution 2020 256, a resolution amending professional services agreement number 2C 00251. With this, Oh, no, this is the <laughs> and secretary to put up the, um, I don't have the right amendments for a resolution for me. Thank you. <laughs> Resolution 2020-248, Resolution approving change order number three with GPMI construction contract number COM0000909 for the work on Chalet Water Improvement Remediation Project at Theater Work Regional Park in its total amount of $17,122 for total new the resolution has been moved has been moved is there a second 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 the resolution has been moved and seconded is there any discussion seeing no discussion i'll ask the secretary to take the roll on resolution 2020-248 commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. You have nine ayes. Aye. Resolution carries, uh, Chair Forney. The next resolution, oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to move resolution 2020-249, resolution approving change order number three, Rashidi Construction Company, contract number C, OM1922 for the 26th Avenue North Overlook and Shoreline Enhancement in the amount of $133,259.72 for a new contract amount of $1,000,000. 
$752.50. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I will ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-249. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have nine ayes. Resolution carries. Uh, Chair Forney. I'd like to move resolution 2020-250, resolution awarding a contract, construction contract with Custom Builders, Inc. in the amount of $631,706 for Elliott Park Phase 2 State Plaza for bid event number 961, pending approval by City of Minneapolis Procurement Commission and Civil Rights Department and authorizing the administrative use of a 10% construction contingency up to $63,170 for necessary construction change orders that may arise through the concept and amending the 2020 capital improvement plan to include $237,500 in the from the Elliott Park neighborhood portion of Parkland Dedication Fund. The resolution has been moved is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'll say thank you uh, to everybody who worked on this. Uh, looking forward to uh, this moving forward uh, at Elliott Park. Uh, with that, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. You have nine ayes. The resolution carries. Uh, to the, the final resolution uh, for uh, admin and finance, uh, Chair Forney. Like to move resolution 2022-51 resolution approving a donation agreement between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and support the courts related to the construction and donation of the Morgan Avenue Tennis Court located in Minnehaha Parkway Regional Trail, a part of the Minneapolis Park System. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Discussion. Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020 251. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. You have nine ayes. The resolution carries. We'll move on now to unfinished business. Um, we have uh, two different discussion items. Uh, I know that there's a lot to talk about here. I am hopeful, though, that uh, we can uh, keep the presentations uh, from staff to no more than 10 minutes. Um, and again, uh, that uh, ask that commissioners keep their their comments uh, brief, uh, three minutes and one minute responses on on each of the discussion items. Um, that I'll turn it over to Superintendent Bangora, Assistant Superintendent Cox, and Assistant Superintendent Barrick to uh, begin with a update on 
uh, our response to COVID-19 and discussion. Great. Uh, thank you, President Cogill and Commissioners. I'll try to go as quickly as I can, and uh, I will urge my uh, team to move through as quickly as possible. Uh, uh, I don't think it's up yet. Pres President Cogill and um, Superintendent Van Gore, it doesn't look like it's in the folder. I don't know if oh. um, Director Summers would be able to put it into the T-Drive. My apologies, Commissioners, uh, one of those technical things that happened, so I think we're working on it, so thank you for being patient. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'll get started. Uh, so, uh, commissioners, again, thank you um, for the opportunity to provide another COVID-19 update to the board. Um, I have a few remarks uh, that I'm going to turn this over to Assistant Superintendent Cox and Assistant Superintendent uh, Barrett for the additional uh, recreation and environmental stewardship, uh, stewardship update. So, uh, next slide, please. So, we're talking about turning up the dial in parkway updates. So, with the Executive Order 2074, um, June really marked the beginning of phase three of the state uh, Minnesota plan. Uh, this allowed for gradual turning up the dial to reopen uh, businesses and activities and allow the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to slowly turn up the dial, too, um, as our resources allowed. Uh, this trend of the dial does not change the fact that social distancing uh, needs to continue uh, in order to reduce the spread of COVID-19, but it does allow us to open uh, more amenities and offer more programs, particularly uh, much needed summer programs for our youth. Um, I'm tremendously really, really proud of the work that staff are doing, uh, doing during this pandemic, especially given really the financial uh, and staffing challenges uh, we have been facing. Uh, we've got many employees working diligently uh, behind the scenes to keep the system going. Uh, and we've got the frontline staff who are working to keep and keeping the parks um, operating and providing an increased level of youth focused recreation and environmental programs in a fun and safe and modified manner. So as you know, uh, last month, uh, segments of Main Street and thank you, thank you uh, segments of Main Street and Easter Road Lake Nokomis and Lake of the Isles were reopened to vehicles. Um, of the eight parkways uh, closed this spring, uh, these four parkways were lesser used by pedestrians. Um, reopening these parkways allows uh, the park board to keep um, the four busiest parkways at Bidet Makaska, Cedar Lake, Lake Harriet, and the West River Parkway um, open for pedestrians through July. Um, so there's a quick quick update on that one. Uh, at this time, I'm going to please I'm pleased to turn this over to Assistant Superintendent of Recreation Tyrese Cox uh, to provide an update on recreation programs and services. So, 
uh, Assistant Superintendent Cox, go ahead and take it over. Thank you, Superintendent. Good evening, Commissioners. I just have a couple of slides, uh, things that I thought you would be interested in. Next slide, please. So just a quick uh, at a glance, we've had over a thousand instances of in-person um, programs across age bands, topics, and activities. And so 309 of them were youth program dates. And what I mean by program dates is um, some of those activities were either um, a single engagement or multi-day programs. And so there's, as I mentioned, we've, got, we've covered quite a few topics across age bands, topics, and activities. We are programming, unfortunately, um, just kind of a month or so ahead. And the reason we are doing that is because we want to be responsive to you know, any new opportunities as things get turned on related to COVID. So we are working on August now. Next slide, please. I mentioned this is a slide from a couple of months ago, a couple of meetings ago, and we talked about the anticipating that um, people's circumstances might change during COVID, and you know, wanted, knew that it would be fluctuate. And so I just wanted to note that Fuller has been collapsed, and those families who were interested have enrolled in other neighboring rec center sites. Next slide. This is the one that may get a few of you super excited. Um, on June 19th, the governor turned on a few more activities, particularly in the area of adult and youth sports. And so now, um, as of June 24th or later, we could do outdoor sport, sports and July 1st indoors. And what that means is that there can be both games and scrimmages um, in, in the, the sports arena. So we are, although we are not hosting games ourselves, we are taking, uh, we are scheduling baseball, softball, lacrosse, and soccer uh, facility use for people who want to permit. If you are uh, submitting a permit, you must also submit a COVID-19 preparedness plan, which will include how you will take temperatures, how you'll keep people safe, and all of the things that are included in that according to uh, MDH guidelines. Um, additional precautions that we encourage people to have dedicated personal equipment so where there will not be sharing of bats or balls or mitts or any of those things that someone submitting a, a permit must have enough equipment for everyone to have their own so that they're not worried about cleaning in between. And then lastly, I think this is kind of neat, a way of showing sportsmanship, maybe tipping your hat, doing a distance high five versus shaking. Next slide. And lastly, this just kind of talks about some of the things that we are doing um, to, you know, continue to stretch the creati our creativity. So we are uh, planning for upcoming uh, virtual mentoring programs, preschool camps, and environmental camps um, that will all be virtual. Unfortunately, we are sad to say that like many other municipalities or organizations, we've had to cancel our uh, red, white, and boom and all of the other, and some of the other activities that go along with the 4th of July Day Bill and Independence Day July Come. We stay optimistic. We are continuing to uh, seek ways to uh, bring music to the park, as I mentioned during my last presentation, and bring um, more movies in the park. So some of those things have been delayed, but we continue to seek ways to do that. Next slide. Thank you, and I will turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Barrett. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Cox. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, quick two slides um, from Environmental Stewardship. Thank you. Uh, starting with Hygiene Stations, just a quick update. You can see that we've added the powder horn um, as one of our standalone bathroom facilities that are open 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., cleaned two to three times a day. We'll give you a little bit more of an update on those uh, in the next discussion item. And then um, we added a portable restroom at Lindell Farmstead yesterday morning and then updated the number of this uh, at Powderhorn um, to be there's 14 now on the east side and 13 on the west side. Next slide, please. There's an update on our waiting pools. Um, we plan to open 20 waiting pools. We've opened, uh, we're ready to open 18 right uh, right now for this weekend. 
Uh, staff began filling the pools on the 24th. Uh, during that time, we did an assessment. So it was kind of a, a surprise each spring to see how they fared through the winter, the infrastructure. Unfortunately, we did have a couple of challenges at two of those uh, 20 pools. But these pools will be open seven days a week, noon to 6.30. Um, they'll have a limited capacity to ensure social distancing, and we'll have staff on site to help monitor that capacity. Public restrooms will be open. The building bathrooms will be open at these waiting pools during these hours. Um, drinking fountains will not be available currently. Um, so please, we're encouraging the public to bring your own water. We are working, um, I know it came up earlier this evening, and serendipitously, I was cutting up on emails and I had reached out to the health department about 30 minutes before it came up asking for, we had asked them last week and they had, uh, Minneapolis Health had said that there's really only guidance on indoor uh, drinking fountains, but they were looking for more specifics on outdoor. Uh, the indoor advice is to clean often and they can be open and that's something we would not be able to do with all of our outdoor uh, fountains. So current plan is to not open the drinking fountains. We are continuing to look into that and we'll continue to work with the health department there and if uh, advised we will open them as soon as we're able. Uh, because of the limited number of children and adults who can be in the waiting pool at the time, we're asking folks to limit their, be mindful of others and limit their time to, to two hours. We don't plan to enforce that. This is just the encouragement of courtesy. Let's go to the next slide, please. I lied, there were three slides, not two. And this is the list of the pools. Um, so the two pools in red are changes from what you last saw, uh, where we had to make some changes because of a couple different uh, reasons. So Jordan Park instead of Farview Park for mechanical reasons. Uh, Jordan Park will be open this weekend. Stewart Park instead of uh, PV for a couple of reasons. Uh, primarily staffing, uh, with this, the, the staff that would cover that pool already has another pool. Uh, so if we go to Stewart Park, which is about a 15 minute walk, uh, we have staff there that have the capacity to open and operate that pool. Um, and then lastly, you'll notice numbers 19 and 20, Franklin Steel. Uh, we did encounter some mechanical problems there that were pretty significant. Again, you may recall this one's come up almost annually. Uh, it's a spray shower that has some interesting plumbing that uh, creates some issues for us. And then North Commons, that pool we also encountered some mechanical, not, not as severe as Franklin Steel and anticipated to be open within a week after the fourth, but still mechanical problems that need to be repaired. Um, and that should be everything. Thank you, uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrick, uh, Assistant Superintendent Cox, and Superintendent Van Gora. Um, questions, uh, comments from commissioners. I'll start with uh, Commissioner Severson for the first time. Thank you, President Colville. Uh, I have a question for um, Assistant Lieutenant Cox. Uh, I'm receiving a lot of phone calls about um, football registration and where the football, when can they start football, and um, last but not least, uh, if we are going to start football, uh, will we have staff in place to help do the registrations? Uh, Commissioner Stevenson, that is an excellent question, and I know that staff uh, are examining what our leagues might look like. We have needed to deploy all of our staff that typically work on youth and adult sports to other activities around the organization as we're understaffed, and so I think we will start to think about that in the coming weeks. I don't have a definitive answer for you tonight. Okay, just as soon as we get that so I can relay that message to uh, the constituents of the North Side. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Meyer, for the first time. Just bringing up the drinking fountains again, uh, it seems like that is, it conflicts with, with things that were said before because before it was um, like, it, it wasn't the, the hand part, the, the surface contact part, it was like the breathing, like next to the fountain part um, and if, if they're allowing the indoor one with, with the condition of cleaning that implies that they're worried about the, the surface part um, but permissive of the proximity to the fountain part so I, I guess I would just encourage again um, reopening that 
uh, as much as possible and maybe you know, advising people to use their forearm to push the button instead of their hand, but I, I, I really think that they should, uh, the drinking fountain should be open. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Seeing any other comments or questions from commissioners? Commissioner Bourne for the first time. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, on the uh, one comment and one question, on the, in terms of the water fountains, to the first district commissioners, uh, concern and desire I'm, I'm hearing from like the last several staff reports that we might require a more direction to, towards reopening water fountains so that may be something that the first district commissioner may, may want to consider uh, there was support for tonight I think mention of the, the rules and requires to it's that staff direction, but it is hot outside. I would certainly be willing to entertain that. Um, the, and then I, I had a question. Um, I know it didn't, it came up in the superintendent's report, but our, uh, more people are returning to golf as a alternate or as a uh, returning to that traditional sport because they have a little bit more time now. Uh, and I think superintendent, you said something like there were like 6,000 or 8,000 rounds above last year. Um, President Coquill and Tish Report, I apologize, my my uh, screen froze there for a second. Are you asking specifically around uh, the number of rounds of golf that has that are uh, um, increased more than last year? Yeah, I think you said it was like six or eight thousand. So, I, so I'm looking for that number again. And I'm also wondering if we have a breakdown as to what courses have done, uh, what courses are doing better than others. Um, I will uh, ask, yes, and it was 8,000 is the number, and I will turn this over to Assistant Superintendent Cox to if she has any more specifics around the golf course, but maybe she has a little more information. I don't know if Larry, Director Umphrey is on board here, but uh, I will turn this over to Assistant Superintendent Cox. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, Commissioner Bourne, I'm sorry, I do not have with me tonight uh, the performance of each golf course, but I absolutely do have them by week, by day, and by time of day, I can show you uh, how courses are performing. Is it safe to say that they're all doing better? Every one of them is doing better than last year? That is safe to say. Okay. Um, so I, uh, one area of concern that I'm gonna have coming up later on this evening is that I think we have an easement coming up with Columbia Golf Course to give up some of that, give up some of that space, so I would, I would a little bit concerned about the revenue generation uh, impacts that that could have. Um, I have some long-standing concerns about um, revenue generation impacts around Hiawatha, and it looks like right now, uh, and Mr. Steverson has said this multiple times, like golf might be our bandage right now. And it, I think we might need to revisit some of those conversations later. Uh, but if we can get the breakdown by course, I don't need it right now, but it would be it would be great to see. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bourne, Commissioner French. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I wanted to know, uh, how does the team teamwork uh, program look? I know we had the 75 initial team teamworks um, uh, folks working at Direct Plus programming. And I heard you mention a little bit earlier about that we had an additional uh, few folks working the waiting pools. How, what what are the numbers like about uh, how many in total team teamwork workers we have working in the system right now? Uh President Cogill, Commissioner French, uh, I want to try to separate out what your question. And so we have been using Team Teamwork a bit more generically. So if you're asking me about the kids who are paid for through our deed grant, that is a, I believe that is 75 kids. 
that are paid for through the deed grant. And so we've placed almost all of them in and around the system, Rec Plus, uh, some of them are at golf courses. Uh, this next round of kids that will be uh, at waiting pools will be, some of them will be paid for out of YMAP dollars. And so I, I think I need to fully understand if you're asking about I want to know total numbers. Mm -hmm. I just want to know the total numbers of youth we have working in our system right now. Right now, right now, we have more than seventy-five kids working in the in the system, in and around. The and, and, and and what what what's the the final number we're going to try to ramp up to for the end of this summer? I don't know that I have a gold number. We obviously will not meet the number, our projected number of 1,078 uh, for a variety of reasons. We just don't have places for kids to work given that our, our facilities are closed. I don't have a, a default uh, gold number. We will place as many kids as, the, as we have work for. All right. Uh, I, I guess I just would ask you to be really imaginative on how we uh, figure out how to put kids to work and open those resources and the resources that are there to employ kids. And we really imagine the on how we do it. Let's make sure those resources and those funds get into those communities because they definitely need it. So thank you, uh, Mr. Superintendent Cox, all the work that you, you do. Right now. Thank you. Commissioner French, if I could just add one more thing. I, I believe this is probably one of the areas where we are, uh, you know, flexing our creative muscles as as much as possible. We are also recognizing that there are some kids and families for whom working out in public spaces is not desirable right now for, for a variety of reasons. And we're also running up against the challenge that many of our kids are recruited at the rec center. Given that our rec centers are closed, we are we're really kind of working double time to make the opportunity, um, make kids aware of the opportunity. And then lastly, kids who for whom public transportation is the way they get to work, they're challenged there as well. So we are doing our very best to make this opportunity available, um, given the amount of hurdles that are kind of in front of us. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Cox. I uh, appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, and and do we have a time frame when all the rec centers will be open? Or we, do we have a goal day for all the rec centers to be open? Uh, Commissioner French, I, we don't have a whole date for when all the rec centers will be open. Again, we are kind of at the mercy of the governor. And yeah. so we are trying, as the governor makes things available to us, we are kind of easing our way into things. But I cannot tell you that we have a goal of, of pick any date to say that we're going to do, do we, have, we don't feel like we're fully in control with that. Do we have a contingency plan, like just in place for, uh, for like okay if the governor has a uh a press press conference tomorrow and, and loosens i don't i don't think this is going to happen but uh loosens the, the the order do we have a plan in place so we don't have to take a whole another week or so to, to to get stuff going like how how, how soon it's when the when the new order comes into place uh commissioner french I cannot tell you that it would work that way. It still would require a ramp up period because in order for people to go do this, they would have to stop doing that. People are reassigned. And so um, I, I can't tell you that I could, if he says on Friday, I can't make it happen on Monday because I have to figure out what to do with people that are in different areas right now. But we are moving as judiciously as we can. I, I just would love it like this. If you were going to be called back to work or if people are going to be in good positions, like just, you know, have, have, kind of have some, kind of, you know, we can put in place for folks to know this is what we would to expect out of you if the order, if the order changes. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Cochran, just being a little uh, but I appreciate all the work you're doing. You're, you're doing the bum beyond right now. So I really appreciate that. You and the rest of the staff. Thank you. Thank you, President Cochran. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, following Commissioner Bourne's suggestion, I'd uh, like to move to direct staff uh, to begin the process of opening the drinking fountain 
and would like the advice from our parliamentarian and the president if that requires um, a suspension of the rules or if they can just use that motion on its own. Uh, Parliamentarian Rice, does it require a, a suspension of the rules for Commissioner um, Meyer of this motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Commissioner Meyer, I think really if you're going to bring a direction on for staff, it should be on the agenda. Um, or it, yeah. either you could always add it at the beginning of the meeting by a majority vote or now with a two thirds vote um, if the body wanted to entertain it. I, I mean, I think that. To the extent there's been these staff directives in the past, I think as the board has discussed some of these uh, report items, if there's kind of a consensus by the board to do something, there's like an informal direction. But I think if you're bringing forth a formal motion, basically, which would what this would be, would I think that would have to be a calendared item on the board's agenda. Uh, com Commissioner Meyer, I would I would okay. concur with that and encourage us to bring forward a motion for. The next meeting, um, I'd also encourage commissioners now to express any support for for that, which would I would hope provide guidance to staff. I guess my thought is that the next two weeks are going to be some of the, the hottest of the summer when we found the most valuable. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's support out there, but I'm uh, I would like to move to suspend the rules for the purpose of considering a staff directive. Uh, to begin the process of opening drinking fountains. Second. Uh, there's been a motion to suspend the rules uh, to consider a, a motion, uh, a resolution regarding staff direction to begin the process of opening the drinking fountains. There's been a second. Is there any discussion on the suspension of the rules? Any discussion? There's See. No discussion. Commissioner Musich. I don't think we discussed suspending the rules. I think you just have to take a vote on it. Okay. Uh, I will call uh, on the secretary to take the role on suspending the rules. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musage. No. Commissioner Severson. No. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. No. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. No. President Kogan. No. Commissioner French. No. You have two ayes, seven days. Uh, the motion to suspend the rules does not carry. Uh, moving on with the discussion, Commissioner Musage for the first time. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, in, in response to the inquiry from um, Commissioner Meyer, I, I would not be supportive of any resolution that runs counter to advice we are receiving from the Health Department, the CDC, the State of Minnesota around um, providing things to people that may cause them to acquire coronavirus within the system. So until we hear from the health department or the CDC, the drinking fountains are not a potential source of coronavirus. Um, I, I can't be supportive of that. And until I hear staff telling us that they have the capacity to be cleaning things frequently enough to provide a safe amenity to folks, that's also going to be a huge concern for me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Seeing no other comments, thank you to staff for the presentation. Um, let's move on to the second discussion item uh, that we have here this evening uh, regarding uh, the update on refuge space to people currently experiencing homelessness in the Minneapolis parks. Uh, we have a variety of staff here to discuss this, uh, provide a presentation. Um, again, I'll ask for the presentation to be no more than 10 minutes long um, and uh, for commissioners to keep their comments uh, to three minutes and one minute. Uh, clearly, there is much discussion to be had uh, regarding next steps uh, beyond the discussion items tonight, but uh, I appreciate succinctness in um, the statements of 
of everybody. Um, so with that, I will uh, ask the superintendent, turn it over to the superintendent to begin a presentation. Uh, thank you, President Togill and commissioners. Um, uh, I would be honest to say I'm not sure if we can do it in 10 minutes, but we'll give it our best shot. So uh, we'll try to keep that timing in, in consideration here as we do this. Um, so commissioners, again, thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, an update on the encampment in our parks. I'm going to make a few remarks, of course, and turn over to the others on my team uh, to provide an overview of the current encampments, uh, a crime and safety report, and a capacity analysis for encampments in the parks. Uh, I want to start by saying again that I believe everyone experiencing unsheltered homelessness is vulnerable and deserving of being uh, treated with dignity and respect. Um, since June 12th, um, I've been having daily conversations uh, with the people at all levels of government and leaders in our city and county and our state, health and human services agencies. I've been talking with uh, park commissioners, like all of you, and I have listened to community concerns. Uh, everyone recognizes the need to find immediate and long-term solutions to address the needs of the people experiencing homelessness. And many people that came today spoke eloquently and powerfully to that absolute dire concern for, um, for shelter and for a place to live affordably. In the last 20 years, uh, we've seen the number of encampments in our parks grow and the number of people in the encampments increase, particularly a Potter and Park encampment. I'm really incredibly proud uh, of the work of our frontline staff and what they have been doing at Potterhorn Park to provide dozens of portable toilets, hand washing stations, and increased garbage pickup. But most important uh, is the on the ground connections and communications uh, with the people at Potterhorn Park from those without homes to community volunteers and agencies who are serving people at the park at risk. I also want to point out um, Jenna Tuma, who has been there daily, shifted from her responsibility on the south side and has been a conduit and a credible, valuable person that has been meeting daily uh, with the team and the volunteers and speaking with them. So very proud of Jenna Tuma and the work that Park and Recreation is doing. Uh, right now, we estimate that there are approximately, we are spending um, approximately $15,700 weekly on rental and additional staff services at Potterhorn Park. Again, Jeremy mentioned earlier, Superintendent Barrett mentioned earlier, we will get you a more specific number, but we're estimating and guessing 15, almost $16,000 weekly. Beginning with uh, the July 15th board meeting, um, Julie Weissman, fine, uh, finance director, uh, will provide uh, the board with a monthly update regarding the financial status and the cost considerations associated with providing support for the encampment. As you know, the level of physical care that is required uh, of encampments and associated facilities is beyond the capacity of the park staff and we are woefully, woefully unqualified to provide the health and human services people in the parks uh, need. Unfortunately, over the past two weeks, we have seen an increase in crime and safety incidents at the park encampments, and we will walk through that uh, when we get the crime and safety report. We've also experienced a shift in the comments uh, that we, um, I'm sorry, next slide. We've also re experienced a shift in the comments that we received from uh, open time and through our customer services department. Um, for the June 17th uh, open time, we received 876 comments with 772 of those as a form letter supporting the encampment at Potter Park and 79 additional comments in support of the encampment. There were only eight comments opposed to the encampment. As the encampment has grown um, and crime has increased, we've seen a shift. Since June 17th, we received 224 comments about the homeless encampment um, with about half of the open time and the other half received by customer service staff. Of those 50 are in support of the encampment, and but the tone has changed from the last week and many submissions in favor of the encampments for a short-term period and calling attention to the need for long-term housing solutions. 160 comments received were opposed to the encampments. 
I believe real strongly that we need uh, to continue to work with our partners at the city, county, and state, it's been very clear, and to find solutions for those experiencing homelessness. We're very clear about that. With that, I'm going to turn over uh, the next presentation piece to Jerry, Jeremy Barrett, Assistant Superintendent of uh, Environmental Stewardship, uh, to provide an overview of the current encampment in the park. So, uh, Assistant Superintendent Barrett, you can uh, go ahead. Thank you, Superintendent Benoit. Uh, commissioners, um, I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of the current encampments, and these are numbers and observations as of yesterday. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, June 17th, we passed the resolution authorizing uh, refuge space and parks, and currently we have about 35 known encampments on MPRB property. The largest encampment, of course, is Powderhorn with the estimated of 400 tents. The rainy, rain, remaining encampments range from single tents to 15 tents per location. 26 sites have three tents or less, so about 74% are three tents or less. And uh, the greatest concerns are at Powderhorn, Elliott, and the Commons because of the reports of drug use, violence, number of police calls, park neighbors who are feeling unsafe due to the crime and other illegal activities that are occurring. Go to the next slide, please. This is a graphic illustration here of the, the encampments across the city. Uh, the larger circle and the denser coloring reflect the number of tents. And then on the right side, you have a tally sheet of the specific parks listed and then the, the tent estimate. So you can see that around, you know, the MLK, there's five tents. Um, these are fluid. Um, each day it changes. Uh, just the other day, Commons only had one tent, and I believe it's back up to three or four or five um, today. Uh, so go to the next slide, please. Um, so when it comes to Powderhorn and staff time, uh, Superintendent Van Gora mentioned Jenna Tuma and all the hard work she's putting in with uh, Tina Austin, the crew leader, um, and the staff there in her service area. They're spending about 15, what I'm going to call labor hours daily, meaning three people, five hours, five people, three hours, uh, picking up trash, moving the cart, and helping with the other maintenance around the encampment. I know the volunteers are doing a tremendous job too but it still takes our additional effort. Uh, the crew leader is spending about three hours a day there, Monday through Friday. Uh, the park keepers are spending approximately, well, we're using, there, there's two park keepers for two hours each night to lock up the bathroom at 8 p.m. Um, and then the park keepers are cleaning, uh, well, this, this is an error bullet here, sorry about this, but the park keepers are cleaning the bathroom of Powderhorn once a day with, and then supplying the volunteers with cleaning. Um, uh, cleaning supplies, and then but we do clean the other uh, hygiene stations two to three times a day, so that's some mixed up. Um, but we are encountering some unsafe situations in the evening, just last night, um, when they arrived, there was someone guarding the door with a bar while others were inside using the bathroom as a couple that was inside, a male and a female, and the crew had to wait before they could uh, lock up the bathroom. Um, and some of the portable restroom hygiene, uh, the BIFs, our provider of the hygiene stations and the portable restrooms has requested either a police escort or at least a staff escort when they service the BIFs as they've had some trouble in the past with their uh, service vehicles uh, being um, broken into while they were working in the park. And then we have learned that the first aid tent staff have left the site um, have left Powderhorn, and so uh, they left out, we understand, out of the fear for their safety. So our staff are becoming a little bit more concerned for their safety at Powderhorn. Uh, one of the things they've asked is, um, and we are gonna look into the feasibility of moving up the closing time from eight o'clock to six o'clock or earlier, um, just for their, for their safety. Go to the next slide, please. Um, in, in, in encampments in general, so of the other uh, 35 sites, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of the restrooms being jarred or jammed or locked, uh, locked up, preventing us from, us from being able to lock them up. 
um, where we have the standalone facility. The staff have noted the electrical outlets are being rewired and used um, for personal charging stations. At PV Park, we've seen a, an influx of cars driving into the park and camping. And then, of course, we're noting a lot of property damage. Uh, the trees in that picture there from the commons where they've girdled, they've girdled the bark of the paper birch. Um, and then we have lost a couple of benches as well to vandalism. Um, we've seen an increase in biohazards with human feces that staff are having to clean up consistently. And then again, safety concerns. Uh, this morning, I understand that when the crew was cleaning up the commons, there was a gentleman sharpening his knife and directing them where to go and how to clean it up. And staff reported they felt very unsafe and very uneasy. So some of the conditions they're encountering each day that we wanted to share. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, I'll turn it over to Chief Ohado to talk specifically about the crime and safety. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to give a brief overview of um, what we are seeing as a spiking violent crime uh, in parks with encampment. Um, I'm going to begin my presentation by mentioning that just this evening, uh, during the course of this board meeting, we've had a very serious shooting. Uh, the victim was in the midst of the encampment in PV Park. Um, he is, is in a very critical condition at a nearby hospital, and it appears uh, initially that there were many rounds fired by potentially two shooters. This is the second shooting at PV Park within the last week. Are you saying the cat, the, was it from, from some of the people who were living in the encampment? The victim was in the midst of the encampment, that's correct. So was he I, I think it's uh, fair to say that parks are not designed or operated in a manner that supports human habitation. Um, we are dealing with an extraordinary situation with the number of people currently living within the park system. Uh, our traditional crime control measures like park ordinances uh, restricting uh, park hours, and, and how the parks are used um, have been suspended either as a result of uh, the executive orders related to COVID-19 or because of the resolution that was passed at the last 2020-253. Since the refuge resolution at the last meeting, um, we have seen a significant spike in crime uh, and safety challenges at several encampments, uh, but especially at Powderhorn. I just want to note the 911 calls at Powderhorn for the first half of June uh, totaled about 15. So that was 15 calls over the course of 17 days. Uh, since the um, refuge re resolution, uh, there have been 45 911 calls to Powderhorn Park in the course of 12 days. And remember, this is in a place where many neighbors uh, and advocates and volunteers have pledged not to call. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to go through and, and highlight some of the major crimes that have taken place. Uh, but I want to make special mention that uh, in the last two weeks, we've had four rapes reported um, in encampment. Uh, two of those sexual assaults took place at Powderhorn. Uh, one was at the Commons, and one was at Washburn Barrows. Uh, this level of victimization is extraordinary in our park system um, and is causing me grave concern. We cannot have this level of violence in our park system uh, and in any way provide the level of access to people experiencing homelessness or not um, that we are committed to. Um, so. The, the major crimes that I'm going to cover have occurred essentially at four uh, encampment locations. Those are Powderhorn, uh, the encampment located on the mall, uh, Washburn Barrows Park, and the Commons. So on June 18th, um, one of the sexual assaults took place that I mentioned. We also had an incident at the mall where two males were involved in a physical fight. Um, 
over a bicycle and uh, one of those males produced an attack the produced a hatchet and attacked the other male on june 20th uh, we had a significant domestic assault at the powderhorn encampment which a woman was transported to the hospital uh, by ambulance on june 21st at powderhorn park we had a serious overdose uh, as a result of uh, opioid use where the patient had stopped breathing next slide please on June 24th, we had a significant incident at Powderhorn again, involving a person with a gun, and there were other weapons involved uh, described as bats. Um, there was at least one person who ended up receiving medical treatment in the camp's medical. On June 25th, um, someone had driven a stolen car into the park, uh, and it was being used in a way that officers described as a drug den. Um, there were three people in the car when officers arrived. Uh, on that same day, there was an additional assault uh, that occurred at Powderhorn Park. Uh, a male was significantly injured, had head trauma, and wandered into the neighborhood uh, nearby. Next slide, please. On June 26, uh, we had another significant assault and fight at the mall encampment. Uh, in this case, uh, one person assaulted another with a crowbar. Uh, that suspect was identified and arrested. On June 27th, uh, there was a serious domestic assault at the Powderhorn encampment um, in which the male aggressor uh, threatened um, his female companion with a knife. Uh, officers were able to arrest him and it was discovered that he had an outstanding warrant for criminal sexual conduct. Next slide, please. On June 28th, uh, we had an, another sexual assault at Powderhorn Park also that day, officers were called um, to a person in the midst of a mental health crisis threatening suicide. Um, officers did a phenomenal job de-escalating that situation and convincing that patient to voluntarily go into the ambulance. However, once uh, he was in the ambulance, he uh, attacked the paramedic. On June 29th, um, we had a sexual assault that occurred uh, at Washburn Fair Oaks uh, in which the victim was significantly injured and has been hospitalized for several days as a result of that assault. Next slide, please. Um, commissioners, the, the last two weeks um, have been extraordinary and unlike any time that I have served as a police officer for this park system. And, and I urge you uh, to start uh, considering and taking action uh, that will help um, restore order across the park system. Thank you. President Kogo uh, and commissioners, I will quickly run through this. I just have two slides after this, and we can go to the to the next slide, please. Um, planning has been tasked with uh, assessing the capacity for accommodating encampments, and uh, we note that in the resolution that was passed, that there is a recital that uh, refers to the mission of the park board in providing spaces for uh, people to gather and recreate. Um, as we look. Um, through that, so we began to understand that we had a way that we could assess parks based on park features and environmental, uh, um, environmentally sensitive areas. Um, and we could establish kind of buffers around uh, those features that would allow us to identify where we needed to have zones that people could occupy for park and recreation purposes, where we needed to pr protect um, environmentally sensitive portions of the park. And then looking carefully at where the gaps are that result of where those buffers and those zones uh, weren't overlaying the park. And we applied this to Powderhorn Park, and I'll show you a diagram in, in a minute. But what we're doing is using GIS to understand that if we're going to accommodate encampments reasonably in parks, that we still have that obligation to provide recreation resources uh, to people in neighborhoods. So the, the, the methodology that we use in Powderhorn Park can be applied to any park in the system. Um, as we go through this, we're, we, we note that there may be a need for some nuance and a, and a review, so it's not all based on um, a very ob objective uh, distance um, from a park asset uh, that we might use because we have the ability, perhaps in some parks, to close portions of trails if they're duplicative or if we don't need to have uh, two picnic shelters if no one is available in the park, and that affords us the opportunity to better accommodate an encampment. If we can go to the next slide, please. It shows the diagram of the um, park. Um, and 
uh, oh, this is Powderhorn Park. Um, the gaps you can see, there's one in the northwest corner, one on the east side, and a smaller one on the south side. The other circles with the lines through are those buffer areas that we set up around the park assets and around environmentally uh, sensitive features. But what it does reveal is that there is an opportunity in this park to accommodate um, three and um, there, they may not be exactly aligned with how the buffers are here. We have um, um, the, the, the one on the north is kind of that large open and flat area and the people are, are uh, the campers are tending to move slightly south from that into a more uh, tree area for shade, which we understand. Um, so we're in the process of, and, and we can continue to expand this uh, across parks beyond Powderhorn so that if encampments get set up, we're actually accommodating them in a proper way. Uh, we can begin to look at how we access those uh, sites for uh, the maintenance and emergency services um, and, and really trying to make certain that we're following through with other aspects of, of the park board's mission um, as we uh, try to accommodate encampments throughout these parks. And we'll turn it back to the superintendent. I think, thank you, uh, Assistant Superintendent uh, Schroeder. I believe that was the uh, last slide of the um, presentation, or actually, I'm sorry, I believe it is. Thank um, you. And with that, I'm sorry? Thank, no, I was just saying thank you, Superintendent. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, President Cole, yeah, I believe we're set, we're good. Fantastic. Uh, we have a couple of commissioners uh, with comments. I'll start with Commissioner French, first time, followed by Commissioner Bourne. Yeah, uh, uh, first, I, I want to address the, uh, the, the, the crime, the, um, the uh, commission, I mean, Superintendent, Superintendent Barrett, you say you, you have a worker who, who comes out there, I have yet to ever see a park worker who lives in a park keeper or a trades person out in the park, uh, and I'm there every day, I've yet to, I've yet to see that, uh, so I also, I, I don't hear anything about uh, somebody's cars being broken into. I also would like to know, um, I have a question for Chief O'Hago as well, but what, who's that staff person that comes out to Pottawill Park and be nice if I could connect with her one day when I'm out there? Uh, President Colville, Commissioner French. Um, Tina Austin is the crew leader who's there daily. Uh, the bathroom incident that I'm referring to was two park keepers in the evening, um, and I can get you those names offline, but they, um, the, the, there were two park keepers who shared that experience um, in their evening lockup. I'd, I'd really like to try to figure out how to solve some of those issues that we were having instead of coming into a forum where we're using this as a way to blame folks, blame the whole encampment for issues one or two people may have done, and a lot of folks weren't even living there. It, it's a, okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Assistant Superintendent Barry. Uh, I guess I have a question for, uh, for uh, Chief Ohado uh, about these, so these 911 calls, how many of these 911 calls are duplicate calls? So how many of these 911 calls you're saying are about for the same incident? So it's easy to, you know, say we have 14 calls but eight of them were for one incident. No, so that they were 45 separate incidents. When we get duplicate calls, they're merged into the single incident that they're all related to. Okay, you investigate each, each you sent uh, staff, I mean, officers out to each 45 calls? Yes. Okay, another question. Uh, in your years of policing, uh, in your years of policing, you've been a, a police officer how? From pretty long, right? 22 years, sir. How, how often, are folks who are suffering from being unsheltered, uh, how often do they suffer sexual assault? How, is that, is it, is, can you say, would you say it's higher than most? Um, President Cogill, Commissioner French, certainly. I think um, there higher are- Higher than most. So also, you, it's higher than most. And a lot of times, when it happens in a lot of homeless communities, it doesn't get reported. That, what happened when those incidents happened, it got reported, it got, it got, the police came, medical attention was given. A lot of things happened that don't normally happen in homeless communities. 
So it seems like our staff is saying, hey, we don't want this here. We're going to give out 15,000 reasons why this shouldn't be here. Even though this board was elected by the people in Minneapolis said, it's okay. And, and, and I, 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 I'm there every day, and it seems like the, the picture you're painting for me as somebody who was there every if I wasn't there every day, would be horrible, a horrible place. And that's just not it. I don't see it. Is, it. is this some bad stuff going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think you guys are painting a terrible picture about this place. I think that, uh, I think, I think some of these, I, I think some of these accusations are un, unfounded. I, I, come hang out there. Come here. Come here, Chief. Come hang out. Put your hair clothes on. Come there. Come hang out. We can introduce yourself. Commissioner French, I am not interested in the sexual assaults that have taken place in these encampments. I, I think that's an inappropriate uh, response to what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French, uh, Chief Ohato. Um, Commissioner Bourne for the first time. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Uh, thank you for the report, Superintendent and staff. Um, there are some serious safety allegations um, at some of our encampments and there are some serious incidents and I, and I want to take those seriously. But I also want to make sure that we're not sensationalizing and we're not vilifying uh, folks. So, so I think one of the facts I want to check, and I don't know the answer to this, is you know, we, we often boast that something like 98 or 99 percent of crime happens outside of Minneapolis parks. Has that percentage changed since we since the board passed this resolution? Is there now a higher percentage of crime happening in Minneapolis parks than there is across the city? Because as as I've been just sitting in my home and in my neighborhood, it feels like there's an uptick of very unfortunate crime right now happening across the city. But but what I must be hearing from this report is that there's a disproportionate amount of crime happening in Minneapolis parks right now. Is that true or have we done that research? I think that a question goes to the chief. President Cogill and Commissioner Bourne, I have not done that research to the disproportionate or not. Uh, what I can okay. say is that the is unusual for the park system. The, the, the amount of crime that we're having across the entire city is unusual for the city right now. I, I guess what I would be, I, I would be, these are all serious things, we need to take them seriously. Um, there, there are some safety issues across the entire city right now. I, I would have much more concern um, if you were to come back and say all of a sudden instead of two percent of crime happening in Minneapolis parks, it was nine percent of crime that it was happening in Minneapolis parks. But I I'd have to guess I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that that percentage has not changed in a in a measurable amount. And and then one of the things I get really concerned about is the and I agree with Commissioner French, is that that's true and that hasn't changed that we're really vilifying a population of people. That's like saying, hey, my, my neighbor committed a crime or this person's neighbor committed a crime. So everybody on that block is worthless and everybody on that block is bad. So let's, let's pull those that entire block. And there are parts of the city that often get that reputation. And I just wanna make sure that we're talking about statistics and we're talking about data-driven decisions. So if we can do that research, and if you come back and say that, you know what, 11% of crime is now happening in Minneapolis parks, that's something we need to do something about. But we do that research and it's still 2%, then the entire city is having issues right now. And I think it's wrong to sensationalize and vilify some of our most uh, vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable folks. Now there are, I agree, we are not built for, for this is not our mission and we are not built for it. And we need to look at that too, but I don't want to vilify, I don't want to vilify an entire population of victims. So if we can get that data by the next time we have this conversation, that would be great. Is that possible, Chief and Superintendent? 
President Fogel, Commissioner Bourne, I don't know that it's possible. So the UCR data that the city records uh, typically would not be ready um, at that point in time, although I will work to get it and see how it compares to our numbers. Can we extrapolate city to park 911 calls? Are you asking me for an analysis on part one violent crime or are you asking me for an analysis on 911 calls because they're very different? I, if, if what I'm hearing is that the statistic that we often rightly pat ourselves on the back for, the less than 2% of crime happening in Minneapolis parks, if that is not available immediately, I, I think a similar enough indicator would be not would be 911 calls i understand it might not be the exact same data but if what i'm hearing is that that piece of data is a long way away then i would like to see a ratio of, of 911 calls and see what kind of percentage correlation there is so whichever is available faster i would, I would take uh, president cogill and commissioner Bourne, i will i will do my best to work on that thank you commissioner Bourne. thank you chief uh our next speaker is Commissioner Meyer for the first time. Thank you. So I opposed resolution 2022-63 because, as I've said several times, um, you know I, I won't support uh, evicting and removing people unless I can tell them where they should go, and the resolution did say that. Um, if we can designate spaces uh, where people can go, then then I would. Um, support you know, um, limiting the powder horn because I do believe that the powder horn encampment has grown too large. Um, but we need to first say where, where people are going to go before uh, we announce that we're, we're going to remove people. So um, I, I feel like the ideal uh, locations to designate uh, would be unused vacant property probably owned by uh, different governments um, I, I think the Kmart uh, in Uptown is an excellent uh, possibility, and I uh, was working with council member vendors uh, staff yesterday about that. Um, I understand that they had some conversations with uh, President Kogel that maybe uh, he can update, update us about later. Um, I think the state fairgrounds would probably be the best location if we could make that work. Uh, because they have all the amenities that would need. I guess they even have dorms there, which I didn't realize previously. Uh, that's controlled by the Minnesota Agricultural Society. I don't really uh, know how to influence them, but if, I mean, maybe there could be a, a, a popular effort to, to make that happen. Um, I know that Councilmember Gordon was looking at the, the Twin Stadium. I, I, again, I don't think that's likely, but those would be the first best options. Um, but then if we, if we can't, uh, find something like that, then you know I think as a backup, um, we should uh, designate certain areas uh, owned by the park that are large, uh, preferably distance from certain amenities, like uh, playgrounds, schools, trails, and the type of uh, thing that the superintendent voter uh, was was talking about with those with those buffer zones. And I think there are places that could work, um, for example, at Fort Snelling or other places. Uh, along the river. Uh, we would also want them to be um, close to amenities that people there need. And we, we of course, want to be uh, working with the residents of the encampment to figure out what places would work for them. And when I was at the encampment yesterday, I uh, talked with several of the people from Avivo uh, who are doing kind of a census of, of the people there. And I asked them to uh, start including that as a, as a question. And they didn't yesterday, but I was told that they would today start asking people uh, which places uh, would they be willing to go to. Um, and then ideally, if we, if we designate certain areas, I mean, learning from the experience of the navigation centers and the things that uh, we would want to do, uh, if I can have this three minutes, I, don't know, but, um, I, I would want to ideally um, have limited name-based permits and, and you know, a need-based assessment, you know, make sure that we're getting people um, who actually need it, and instead of who are uh, you know, people who are actually uh, homeless, so they understand that some of the people at the encampment are. Um, ideally, we would want it uh, to be closed access 
Um, that helped a lot. And um, I, I feel like the ideal size is probably around 40 to 50 people because that's the number of people that can kind of form a community. And it's also about the number of people that you can have one person you know, managing the security fairly well. And a, a small thing, I, I think we should go with people instead of tents uh, because uh, the Aviva people found that a lot of the tents of Powder Horn are actually being used as storage. They're actually vacant. People are, like one person will have two tents, but some tents are you know, double or triple occupied. So you don't get the right sense of how many people are necessarily based on the tents. So I think it's better to go with the number of people. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner Musich followed by Vice President Vita. Thank you very much, President Kogel. Um, lots of process in this presentation. I'm hoping that PES copy can get emailed to commissioners so that we can process it further in the next two weeks. Um, so one of my big concerns right now is <laughs> the morale of our staff that, um, that we have really changed the nature of their work in an already uncertain and unsettling time in, in a really significant way. So I, I would like to hear from the assistant superintendents of recreation and operations about what morale is like, what supportive services we're providing to these staff to help them um, deal with the anxiety and trauma that doing their job might be causing them right now. Um, and I mean, I've been told that our staff are wearing um, hazmat suits to clean our restrooms. Are we providing them with additional PPE to ensure that they're able to maintain their safety while doing the work that this board has asked them to do? President Kogel, Commissioner Musich, yes. Uh, Jolene Crum, our um, risk and safety administrator, has work with uh, OSHA to identify proper PPE for cleaning in these conditions, making sure we have those supplies. She's done training with staff um, on how to properly remove and dispose of and when to remove and dispose of um, that equipment. But we do continue to hear and we are sensitive to um, folks. Uh, so Jenna Tuma has reported that you know, several of her staff live in the area, uh, live in the neighborhood of Powerhorn. Um, we offer the employee assistance program number to folks at this point. We have talked about and explored the potential of bringing in some traumatic um, consultants if that's necessary. Um, but, you know, I, I, I feel that as staff, it's our job to bring this, this side of the tale to you as well, right? And, um, that I would be lying if I told you staff was, you know, everything was fine. This, this is an extraordinary time um, with a lot of things layered on it. You know, there's COVID, and then there's budget crisis, and then there's this changed work. And, you know, we're no longer striping ball fields and, 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 and doing all the waiting pools and providing recreation for kids. We're doing a little of that, but then we're doing a lot of this. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I, that was the intent of my portion of the presentation was to share this, the, you know, the, the, what, what we're experiencing as staff and what we're hearing. And we're doing everything we can to support staff. There's probably more that we need to do. And again, we're looking into that. Um, but it is, these are challenging times. Thank you for that update. If we could include um, updates on any additional um, changes we're making to help support our staff in future presentations. I appreciate that. And then I don't know, Assistant Superintendent Cox, if there's impacts to the recreation staff that are located in the parks that are hosting encampments at the moment. So, Commissioner Musage, I would echo much of what Assistant Superintendent Barrick said. I think in recreation, we have staff that have a tremendous amount of grit. Um, these, they're amazing people but the layering on. Um, I think they could handle any one of these things individually, but when you have COVID and cancer, 
the unrest that happened a few weeks ago and the violence that's happened around the city as they are kind of in, in and around the park, it is, it is starting to wear on people. They, they continue to get up each day and they continue to kind of battle through it, but, but they are starting to, to express some, uh, uh, a little bit of wearing thin. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I would hope that we as a board would consider adding additional leave time um, for staff that are, are dealing with these added pressures. Um, as, as keeping people on staff right now, um, I think should be one of our chief concerns so that we are not trying to train in new people in a time when training is incredibly challenging. Um, <clears throat> I have some questions for Chief Ohado. Uh, do we know um, how many rapes took place in Minneapolis parks in 2019 and how many have occurred thus far in 2020? President Cogill and Commissioner Musich, we do track that UCR data. Being that June just closed yesterday, we have not got the updated mid-year report, and I will have that by the next board meeting, and I can share that with you. Okay. And can we also see that in the same information um, for shootings, um, assaults with deadly weapons, et cetera, anything that would be um, considered a type one crime? President Cogill and, and Commissioner Musich, I will tie that in with the request that Commissioner Ford made. They're, they're related. So um, the part one serious violent crimes are homicide, aggravated assault, robbery, and rape. Those are the four indicators that we typically measure. That's what we talk about when we say that less than 2% of serious violent crime takes place in Minneapolis Park in any given average year. Um, and that is what I will report on. I'll, I'll report on those individually and then as a composite. Okay, thank you. Um, and I guess I would ask a similar question of you um, that I asked Assistant Superintendent Cox and Assistant Superintendent Barrick. Um, how is the morale of our park police staff um, at this time? President Cogill and Commissioner Musich, I would characterize the morale as poor. Okay, thank you. So all the questions I have right now. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Um, Vice President Vita. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, uh, just a few things. First, I want to thank staff for the presentations tonight and uh, providing the information. Uh, one of the things I noticed was that the chief's numbers show one 911 call a day before the encampment, and now they're up to four 911 calls a day. Uh, is that correct, Chief? President Cogill and Commissioner Vita, that we could go back to the slide. Um, I, I haven't done the, the daily average, but um, it seems about right. So in the course of the first 17 days in June, there were 15 calls, and the, the, the next preceding 12 days, there were 45 calls. Right, so about average. So these numbers to me don't vilify the homeless. They point out that there are criminals who are preying on the homeless people in our parks more than anything. Um, and if we want to stop the people who sexually assault the homeless, we need the resources to stop them by bringing charges. So that means people need to be reporting. I got many calls from residents who said they were afraid to report what was going on in Powder Horn Park. And I also want to add that we keep having conversations only about Powder Horn Park, but there's about 35 to 40 more encampments going on. So while Powderhorn may be under a little bit more control, there's still very large encampments going on in the city. I visited um, uh, the superintendent's house. There's, a, there's an encampment that's huge over there now. And I had someone tell me over there that they were recruited from the homeless shelter to be brought into the park. 
uh, the young man who cuts my grass told me the same thing. So this, this may not be happening at Powderhorn, but there are a lot, a lot of other encampments that we don't have people there providing 24 hour security. We don't have people there providing food, resources, um, you know, to these people. So I think when we're talking about making decisions around encampments, it cannot be only based on what's happening at Powderhorn Park. Uh, I personally, you know, I know people have a lot of things going on, but I worked seven years for tobacco free parks policy and every encampment I've went to, I've seen people just passing out cigarettes and people in the park just smoking. And that's not legal in parks. That's a violation of park rules. There's signs up everywhere, everywhere saying no tobacco use. I use money out of my grant funding to pay for those signs. Two commissioners on this board, actually three commissioners on this board helped me with those policies over seven years. So, I mean, there are things going on, yes, that are way worse than tobacco smoking, but just as, as a baseline, that's a violation. Alcohol use. I, I had someone tell me at Powderhorn, I, this is not close to my liquor store. They're rationing out liquor and cigarettes to me. I don't want to be here. I, I welcome the idea of Commissioner French for us to talk to the residents that are living there. When I've been there, the many times that I've been to Powderhorn and other encampments, because as the chief reports them to me, I try to go out and visit. So just a few more seconds. So as, as I'm visiting, I'm getting one story from residents and another from the people who I consider white saviors out at these parks, telling us what to do for the people that are living in these parks. So I welcome the opportunity to bring the actual residents to the table and have conversations about what their needs are and what resources we can help provide for them to find safe refuge because a park is not a residency, nor is it a safe refuge. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Commissioner Forney for the first time. Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I don't have anything, but it really concerns me what I'm hearing as far as from a budgetary situation. I mean, seventeen to eighteen thousand dollars a week is mind blowing. Um, yes, we're hopeful that maybe we might get reimbursed, but that's just terrifying to me. Um, the staffing situation, as Commissioner Newsich um, pointed out, and the uh, superintendent there. Um, it's a great concern. Um, and just overall, the public safety and health is, is, I don't believe that we're vilifying, we're just, there is a reality that um, is difficult for all of us that, to comprehend. Um, how this fits into our mission, I appreciate Assistant Superintendent um, Schroeder for articulating that this is not what our mission is, and of course, all the people who spoke earlier today. And that's what we really need to be focusing on: is how can we keep that as our priority? Um, I have to thank staff for, first of all, codifying all of this data-driven. Um, you know, looking at, um, oh, and also being so nimble as far as how to adapt to all this. Um, and then also, I want to thank staff for um, the collaboration that they've done with other jurisdictions. To my understanding, we haven't maybe been super successful there, but at least the conversation is there and hopefully it will happen. I guess to me, the greatest thing is the fact that initially, um, the superintendent was going in the direction of looking out for what the mission of our parks was and only to find out that he was being advised by the governor's office that um, they indicated that he did not have those powers where in fact we did have those powers to evict. So um, we are in an unattainable situation and I felt that the resolution that was being forward was to address it and I would hope that we could come up with a resolution that all of us could buy into to resolve this because this is completely un unmanageable and it is like you say it's not in our mission so thank you for the presentation 
Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, now I have a few commissioners for the second time here. Uh, I'll start with Commissioner Meyer for the second time for a minute. Thank you. I just wanted to add one uh, thing to my previous comment, which is the one part of Resolution 2022-63 uh, that I didn't oppose uh, was to set a limit of 10 locations. Um, I think, think it's appropriate for us to say, you know, you can't camp in a, you know, a small neighborhood park that doesn't have the space. But first, we need to be able to say um, where you can go if you don't have anywhere else. Um, but I, I would be supportive of, of that part of the resolution um, you know, to, to direct staff to uh, designate up to 10 sites. Um, I, I, again, with preference to you know, unused vacant sites owned by other governments, but um, if they aren't able to provide any, then I, I think we should um, submit some of our own as, as designated spaces. Um, but I. I, I would like to, to change the status quo from where people uh, can just camp anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Commissioner Bourne for the second time for a minute. Uh, thank you, President Colgill. Um, to at large Commissioner Vita's point, I would also welcome when we bring something to the uh, forward on the 15th, that that includes some sort of decision-making agency from the folks that we are making decisions about. Uh, that I, I echo what all the speakers said this evening and on all the emails that we've gotten as well as to invite those folks to the table. Um, we've, to Commissioner Forney's point about the cost, I think we've spent more money so far closing parkways uh, in the last couple of months than we have on BIFs for uh, homeless shelters. I, I think the cost is actually pretty comparable. Um, and, and we do have, uh, to the point of locations, um, as somebody that grew up arm's length from the Lake Street Kmart, if you want to make this issue invisible, have folks live at the Lake Street Kmart. They already are living there. Um, I, I'd encourage us, uh, this is a conversation about wealth and power, and we're getting a lot of feedback now because this is a, not an invisible issue. Uh, to the first bullet in that uh, presentation, we have, well, while we say we're not geared, and parks aren't designed for this, they, like, we have hundreds of people living in parks right now. We have the folks on Nicollet Island, we have the superintendent on this phone call, we have all the homes along Cedar Lake and Lake of the Isles who build their homes, their gardens, and their docks, and their retaining walls on the people's land. And we, the world, the sky isn't falling over over all of those folks who live in parks because they have wealth and power. Um, I, I'd like to, if we're if we're looking at designating locations instead of places that will make this invisible, I, I, the, the most unused land we have right now to the public is the easements that we have along Cedar Lake. Uh, and I can't think of a better, a, a better, more inviting place to live if we, and temporarily, if we are designating specific areas. Uh, it's, it's, it's safer, it's easier for our staff to get to and monitor, uh, and there are a lot of eyes on it. Uh, so I would encourage us, if we are limiting to 10 spaces, that the shores around Cedar Lake are one of those. Uh, there are maybe only 50 people in the city that will be impacted in a negative way by that. Um, we're not really taking anything out of the public realm. So Th thank you, Commissioner. Um, I would just let. Yep. Th thank you, President Cogill. So I'd just like to, us to encourage, like to encourage us to not have this be a conversation about wealth and power. Thank you. Uh, uh, I will turn it now over to Commissioner uh, Musich for the second time for a minute. Thank you, President Cogill. I neglected to read all my notes last time. I, I, I know we're tracking costs related to encampment response regarding this rentals, hand washing stations, overtime. Um, but are we also including in our tracking 
property damage to the parks that have been in hosting encampments as part of that data collection? Is it called the Kutcher usage? Yes, that was the we the, the, the tree damage, the bench. Yep, we are keeping track of that. Okay, so that if at a later date it turns out the state or some other agency that is derelict in their duties of caring for the homeless population in our state decides to step up and help us, <laughs> um, we potentially could ask them to help reimburse the costs of making those repairs as well. Lovely, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner French for the second time. Yeah, uh, this is Lieutenant Baird. Is there any way to figure out when when a piece of property in the park board is damaged, whether it's called, caused by the encampment or is it just caused by we just, because stuff gets damaged in our parks? Is there a way to determine that? When, we, when, we're, when we're saying this, this was damaged at this point in time, or how, how do we how do we determine who damaged it, and was it damaged by people in the encampment? Uh, President Bogle, Commissioner French, um, in this case, uh, you know, we can't determine everything, right? So it comes down to observations. I know there were early observations of people breaking off tree branches for firewood. Um, we know that the maintenance staff. At the commons with the tree. The so tree there, 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 the there, fires, there are fires out there. I haven't seen any fires out there except fire two years. My understanding is staff observe people breaking off tree branches and using that, I'm assuming, then in the barbecue. Um, and in the case of the commons, you know, we're there daily. Then, you know, the tree is in one condition one morning and a different the next morning. Um, tracking that to who, right? That's, that's unless you have a witness. Um, but whenever property is damaged, we've had um, trash trucks drive up onto Parkway consistently. We've had people report it with photos. We've reached out to the company. They've paid us for the lawn rehab. Um, we've had car accidents into trees. We include the, the restitution of that tree damage in the insurance claim. Um, so we're not always able to capture everything, obviously, with 6,800 acres, and, but there are instances where we have the individual, we have witnesses, so. Okay, so I'm just trying to figure out how we really concerned that we're just, you know, anything that happens now is, is chalked up to the encampment or, or people who are camping in our parks. I'm really concerned that we are, we are cleaning our, our, our proverbial books by all the problems of the park board right now, can be chalked up to we have folks that are living there. Uh, I, I think it's just this this concerning, and I, I think we're better than that. Uh, and it's all land, all this land is stolen. So, President Colville, Commissioner French, um, I hear you. I would say that it is not that we are. Uh, targeting, it's not uncommon in recreation that parks are overused and there's um, there's always a need for rehabbing popular areas and so this is very similar. We have very intense use 24 hours a day. Uh, the resource is going to sustain overuse and so we will have some turf damage, we will see some of this tree stuff um, and the point of it is is that there's just an overuse that's going to result in a higher need for maintenance after the fact. Thank you, Commissioner French. Um, Vice President Vita for the second time. Thank you, President Cogill. Um, I just want to go on record saying that uh, no crime is okay, especially when we're talking about rape here. I don't know how many rapes happened in the park last year versus how many happened this year, but none of them are okay. And we have now divested from MPD, so I don't know like what, what our next steps are gonna be for helping with investigations of the surges in crime that we're seeing. Um, I mean, the park board police just can't do this themselves, and I don't know what the numbers were last year, we, we weren't faced with the same challenges. Uh, we'll get a report on that, but the, the calls and the 
emails I'm getting about the crimes happening now seem to be very different than what uh, what I saw last year. I, I hope that we'll come together and identify some places uh, in collaboration with the city and the county. I think we should all offer up some property to, to house folks. Um, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice President. Uh, seeing no other hands uh, being raised. Um, with that, I would like. Yes, Superintendent. Yeah, I had my hand up there. I'm not okay. sure if you see it there, but I did have my. Oh, gotcha. Hand. Is that okay if I? Well, sure, if you'd like to weigh in, appreciate and it. I'll speak. Yeah, just briefly. Sorry. Um, I just want to just really briefly say. Um, really disappointed in the accusation that staff or the report vilified the people in the encampment or anywhere that these people are there on shelter and homeless. I didn't see anywhere in that conversation that they were vilifying the folks that are staying at the park or any of the encampments. The report was specific to crimes that were occurring data and fact that was being given. We can do more research, of course, as, as Commissioner Warren said, we'll do more research and get information back. We reported to what we know and what we see that's occurring. That's it. The other part about it too that um, Assistant Superintendent Barrett just stated was just the natural use of land and the increase of activity in the land as significant capital improvement that happened just by use. It's not blaming people for it. We will have absolute care for the property. Whenever this kind of clears, we will have to repair and clear that property. That's just natural. It's not blaming folks for it. They're there. I'm really disappointed in the fact that, is that, that the, the word was used against this staff. And we vilified the folks that we're taking care of every day and working hard every day to support this staff. I'm very disappointed. Thank, thank you, uh, Superintendent. Um, okay, with that, I, I want to say a couple of. What's the information for President Cogill? What's that? What could you say that um, again, Vice I President? Would like, yeah. I would like to ask Chief Ohado if he could investigate these crimes and get these people charged. These, these rape crimes and get these people charged. I take this very seriously. Okay, thank, thank you, Vice President. That's noted and we will follow up on that. Um, I, I appreciate everybody's discussion this evening. Uh, this is a very serious issue. I've heard um, from uh, commissioners. I have uh, been at meetings with uh, neighbors. I've been uh, meeting with organizers. Um, I've spoken with folks that are uh, living at the encampment, I uh, happen to know many folks who live right along uh, the 10th uh, Avenue side um, of this encampment. And um, what I've heard tonight really underline from all commissioners really underlines some, some of the, the same refrains that I've heard uh, across the board. And those things are, one, we can't as the park board do this alone. Um, two that uh, the people who are living in the park space right now need to be treated with dignity. Um, no matter how we are uh, moving forward, we need a plan that is, is working with uh, community members and is treating everybody with dignity. Um, I've heard that the Powderhorn space um, with 400 tents is not sustainable. I've heard that across the board is not sustainable. I've heard some beautiful things are happening there, but also some very, very concerning things, and the size of that encampment is not sustainable. The park board has a role to play in that discussion, and I look forward to having some sort of action be taken that we can all get behind at the next meeting. Um, the final thing uh, that I've heard across the board is there's a lot of concern uh, that that we have I ha can identify places for people to go, and that if we are saying that we need to limit the size of that encampment. Uh, and the larger encampments, we need to identify other locations for folks to go. Um, I agree with that. I also 
wholeheartedly believe, and I've heard from others, that that cannot be the sole role of the park board. Now, over the last couple of weeks, uh, I, and, and also especially Commissioner French, um, have had many conversations uh, with other elected leaders at various levels of government in this state. And uh, I believe in everybody's goodwill and desire to get um, folks housed and to treat folks with dignity. Um, I also have not seen um, particularly tangible um, commitments from uh, other levels uh, of government. And I understand that everybody is stretched very thin. I know that the county has done substantial amount of work for um, unsheltered folks. I know that the city has done a good amount of work as well um, in uh, the realm of affordable housing um, and in uh, addressing the, the last larger encampment that we had at Hiawatha. Um, while we uh, very much need to house people, we can't do this alone and, and also we can't be staring down a 400 person encampment moving into the winter months at Powderhorn. So. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to conversations uh, with every commissioner over the next couple weeks. I hope everybody is able to pick up their phone and have a discussion about this. And uh, I'm hopeful that we can come together with a, a resolution that gives staff good direction um, so that uh, we can move to uh, some, some clear guidelines at the same time um, gathering commitments and support from other levels of government to uh, help get people housed or at least provide them with alternative locations for uh, sanctuary. The fact is, right now, the Powderhorn space is not a refuge because it is not safe for everybody who's there. Um, with that, I appreciate the conversation. We'll move on with the agenda. Um, we have removed resolution 2020-263, so we're now moving into new business. Um, I would like to have a motion on resolution 2020-257, which is a resolution. I, maybe I'll ask Commissioner Forney if she would like to read this resolution. Thank you, uh, President. Um, I'll read the resolution. And we can put up the resolution so I can read it. I'd appreciate it. Should be up, Commissioner Forney. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was going to read the whole thing. Anyway, so um, I'd like to move resolution 2020 uh, 257, a resolution commemorating the life and accomplishments of Vivian Mason and honoring Commission, Commissioner Mason's service to the Minneapolis Parks and Recreation Board. The resolution has been. Mike, would you like me to? Would you like me to read the rest of it? Because I have the full resolution up. I think we need to move to um, have it second. Let's let's have a second here, and then we can do that. Uh, could I have a second on the resolution? Yeah, and then I will read it, Stephanie. Thank you. You got it. Okay, good. Fantastic. The resolution has been moved and seconded, and I will turn it over to Commissioner Forney to read the the entirety of the resolution regarding Vivian Mason. And I apologize, but it's not up for me. <laughs> Can somebody post that for me? Is it available? I apologize. Doesn't sound like it. So, um, yes, Stephanie, I guess you'll have to. I do not have access to it, but this, I think because I'm on my computer. Okay. I will read it. Whereas on March 5th, 1997, Vivian Mason was appointed to the Minneapolis Partner Recreation Board, MPRB, of commissioners to succeed Patricia Baker. Whereas Commissioner Mason was subsequently elected to two four-year terms after the initial appointment and served as an MPRB commissioner until January 1st of 2006. Whereas Commissioner Mason was a champion in promoting biking throughout the city and worked to ensure that the parkways were not auto commuter routes and that the MPRB promoted biking and walking when possible. Whereas Commissioner Mason strongly supported transparent decision making that was based on neighborhood input. Whereas Commissioner Mason believed in and held commissioners to the highest standard of integrity where everyone was expected to 
be truthful with each other and the public, and that no backroom deals were ever done, and where the NPRB displayed full transparency in its decision making. Whereas Commissioner Mason encouraged anyone who wanted to run for the Minneapolis Park Recreation Board to do so, and she actively worked to support many commissioners. Whereas Commissioner Mason advocated for and supported reduced chemical use in parks, and protecting our wild native places, and fought against large condo buildings near our parks. Whereas Commissioner Mason worked to bring women into decision-making positions throughout the city through her work with the League of Women Voters and on the park board itself. Whereas Commissioner Mason was a strong advocate and leader of restoring Lake of the Isles with her assistance, the NPRB received $2.5 million in funding from the state of Minnesota to restore the shoreline and parkway around the lake. Whereas Commissioner Mason founded the Village Park Program, which continues to be offered to Minneapolis youth today in partnership with Concordia Language Villages in 1998 to engage youth, youth of color and economically disadvantaged youth in learning about world languages and culture through a park program that culminated in a two-week scholarship to Concordia's summer language and culture immersion camps. Whereas Commissioner Mason died on June 18, 2020, and whereas Commissioner Mason led a life that is worthy of emulation and recognition as she made substantial contributions to the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, to promote our goals and objectives. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Commissioners officially honor the contributions to the residents of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board made by Commissioner Vivian Mason and resolve that the President of the Board and the Secretary to the Board are authorized to take all necessary administrative actions to implement this resolution. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, the resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion or comment from commissioners? Yes, I think it's important to, to note um, Vivian's um, contribution. Um, I, I did not know her very well. I did, obviously did not serve with her. Um, I know, though, that she did so much more beyond even the park board and continues her um, community service in so many different ways. Um, it's always a loss. Um, anybody? But I appreciate that we're able to acknowledge um, her service and um, give it to life, the respect that it, it's needed. So, Thank you, Commissioner Forney, and I'll just also note that you know, the, the way I know uh, of Vivian Mason, uh, I d didn't know her uh, either, but I, what I do know is through the uh, Language Villages program that did start in 98, and I've heard very much from a variety of uh, park um, educators who have talked about how fantastic that, that program has been for so many youth um, in the city. Uh, and so just knowing how impactful that service is even in beyond uh, her time on the board is, is wonderful. Um, I'd also just want to note uh, a letter that I've included in petitions and communications encouraging commissioners to contribute to the uh, flower fund um, for uh, commissioners uh, who have passed. Um, I certainly know that I would hope that future commissioners would contribute to a flower fund uh, personally, and I, I would urge other commissioners to continue that uh, um, consistent um, uh, tradition um, uh, going into the future. So please do check that out. Um, with that, I'll ask the secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020-257. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Mayer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Pogia. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. You have seven. Oh. Oh. Commissioner Hassan. Mm. 
Commissioner Aye. Hassan, we can't hear. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. You have nine eyes. Thank you, Secretary Ringgold. Uh, resolution 2020-257 uh, carries. At this time, I will uh, recess uh, the meeting of the full board and go into uh, the Administration and Finance Committee. Turn it over to Chair Forney. Thank you. I'd like to. I'm still on. Okay. Um, I'd like to convene the Administration and Finance Committee here at. Where are we? We're at uh, 916. Um, would the Secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Vita. Present. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner Wrench. Here. Vice Chair Hassan. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. I'm here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'll take a motion to approve the um, agenda, I think is the first thing we have. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Um, aye. So uh, excuse me. You need to do the Will the secretary please call the roll? I apologize. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Thank you. Um, I'll take a motion then to approve the minutes. And I apologize, I don't have it in front of me what the exact dates are. The minutes of Wednesday, June 17th, 2020. Thank you. So moved. Thank you. Uh, the Secretary, please call the roll. Commi uh, Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have five ayes. Great. I'll take a motion to approve the first resolution, which is 2020 247. I'd like to move resolution 2020 a resolution granted permanent easement to the of Minneapolis for operation, maintenance, inspection, and, and repair of storm sewer pipe and stormwater basin associated with the North Columbia North Columbia Golf Course Stormwater BMP project on the northern section of Columbia Golf Course within one northeast watershed located within the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Um, would anybody like to have a presentation on this or discussion? I'm seeing that Commissioner Steverson uh, has his hand raised. Uh, thank you for recognizing me, Chair Forney. I'm not on this committee. Uh, I'm going to say that I I got some major concerns about this, that we're giving up such a swath of land for the city to uh, place and hold their water without enough in return. So I'm hoping that uh, we can send our, our uh, management back to figure out a better plan for, for our parks, specifically this golf cart course, and specifically seek funds from the city of Minneapolis to help go specifically maybe to the Columbia uh, golf course. Um, if this comes to the full board, I won't be able to support it in its current stand. Any comments from staff on that? Chair, Chair Forty. Um, Thank you. Superintendent uh, Schroeder. Um, let me just speak to it briefly, and I understand there is concern over this, and certainly we can continue to work with the City staff. I need to point out that um, this project is aligned with the master plan that was approved by the previous board, 
and it's also aligned with two previous actions taken by this board um, that actually brought us to this point. It included um, looking at this conceptually and advancing it to this point. Um, as we look at what the advantages are, there are um, there, there are advantages. We've reviewed this with golf. We've had a golf uh, course designer that's been involved in several of our golf courses look at this, and this, this project improves the play of the game. Um, it it uh, allows for certain uh, resources of the city um, to be addressed on parkour property for certain, but when we look at what we would consider a benefit um, and compare those to the uh, the, the costs of the, of the project and, and what we're giving up. Um, what, what we've outlined in the background is a, a considerable offset in terms of betterments uh, compared to the value of the property. Um, if, if the committee would like us to go back and pursue this further, it's setting back the project significantly, but um, in the interest of, of making certain commissioners can be supportive, I'm willing to do this. There has been discussion um, that the um, one of the, the significant offsets that could be achieved here as we look at this at, at this project is to repair uh, uh, essentially a pumping station that use, that's used for irrigation on the golf course. That is a part of the South Columbia Improvement Project, not part of the North um, Improvement Project, and we would staff intends on pursuing that and even working with the watershed district so that we might be able to introduce new pumps and filters uh, and be using stormwater instead of groundwater for irrigation of port portions of the course. Chair Forney, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, what is what would be the total cost of replacing them pumps that the city would be paying for? Uh, um, Chair Forney, Commissioner Severson, I don't know that we know the full cost because um, the, the project is more expensive as we look at drawing uh, stormwater um, through an irrigation system. There would be filters involved, but I imagine that cost could uh, easily be. If we're looking at the pumps alone, it would probably be 100 to 150, maybe 200 thousand. If we're to look at the total project, um, it could be twice that amount. So if we were, so they're they're going to take, they're going to take a little under two acres, that's correct, right? Uh, Mr. Stevenson, I believe that's correct. So if, if the city were to sell something like that on the open market, two acres of land in, in Minneapolis, is that only worth about $150,000, $200,000? Chair Fournier, may, may I suggest, Andy's got a presentation, Andy's got a presentation here that will answer Commissioner Severson's questions here pretty, pretty clearly. Please. Uh, if, if it would be okay. Andy, are you ready to? Uh, Thank you, Chair Forney. I am, Cliff, thanks. Um, Jennifer, if you could pull up the presentation in the T-Drive. Thank you. Um, Chair Forney, thanks. Uh, commissioners, um, I have a presentation here for a few slides. That's more than a few, but um, that we can go through and kind of talk about how we got to this point and uh, the project uh, for the Northern Columbia Golf Course and Park BMPs, uh, stormwater BMPs. Um, here we're looking at a permanent easement um, with the city of Minneapolis granting them an easement over um, the main storm sewer pipe that will run through the project as well as two of the three stormwater BMPs that are being either created or expanded um, as part of this project. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are three partners in this project as was mentioned uh, um, with us as well as uh, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization and then third is the city of Minneapolis and here are a few of the folks that we've um, that were on the planning uh, portion of this project. Uh, this project does date back um, to 2017. We have a resolution, uh, park board resolution, to look into preliminary plan or planning and preliminary design uh, for the 1NE watershed up here that has 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 a flooding and water quality issues related to it. Um, 
that's what we engage with these original partners in 2017 and we've been working with them throughout. Uh, we have um, several other MOUs with them, including the latest one um, was a construction uh, partnership agreement for the construction of this north section of the, the stormwater uh, BMPs project. Uh, next slide. Um, so the, the goals of this project, initial goals is, is one, um, maintain recognition as a primary use on our property, uh, improve play at uh, Columbia Golf Course and meet those goals of golf courts and operations. Um, and then, you know, increase or maintain the profit for golf operations on the course, increase flood resilience. Um, flooding is a big issue on this course that shuts the course down throughout the year. Uh, it's really susceptible to a uh, larger rain event. And, and then also to uh, cooperate with our partners to help mitigate that the flooding that occurs not just on the golf course, but also with another adjacent parts of the um, one any watershed that uh, Columbia is located in. And then we're, we're also looking to another um, benefit of this is really getting the ecological function uh, improvements out of the golf course, um, restoring areas into more diverse um, ground covers and tree cover um, and uh, woodland and prairie systems in order to um, fulfill some of our goals that we have in our comprehensive plan. Uh, we also, this this project was included as uh, was mentioned in, in our comprehensive, our master plan process for Columbia Park. Next slide. So how do we meet those goals that are outlined? So this project really uh, commits to the construction of uh, three stormwater best management practices or BMPs. One is the infiltration basin, where the water will come in and infiltrate naturally into the soil. One is a dry paint basin, where the water will be, during a rain event, will come into this BMP and slow down, uh, filter out some of the sediment that's in it, and then slowly drain out through a pipe. And then an exa uh, expansion of existing pond, or for golfers, golfers out there, a water hazard that exists on the site that is gonna be expanded um, into you know two acres in total area. Um, the approximately, it also includes approximately 4,300 4, feet of new storm sewer pipe and structure. And a key part of that is part of it goes underneath as jack, as a pipe jacking through an existing railroad, railroad corridor that bisects the Columbia Golf Course. Um, just that portion alone going through the railroad corridor um, is over a million dollars worth of, of uh, construction that's capital. And we'd be replacing approximately 2,000 feet of existing storm sewer that's in poor condition in the 1960s era, era storm sewer. Um, the highlighted, I'll get back to the highlighted parts, but that those parts are included in this piece, of the, that, those pieces of infrastructure that are included in this uh, We also have 17 acres of ecological restoration that will be happening on, on the, uh, within the park and within the golf course out of the play areas, um, and then an improvement um, to golf course play areas and, multi, and a multi-purpose field area um, where rugby has played in the past um, and uh, improvements to existing Parker Trail on the corridor or on the, along 5th Street um, on the west side of Columbia Golf Course. Um, this project will uh, put in new and replace um, much of that uh, trail system there. Um, Again, the, 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 this project aligns with the East of the River Parks Master Plan, and um, which was approved by board by the Board of Commissioners in 2019. And the big thing on this project with the capital improvements that we're looking at, um, we're not responsible for any of the capital costs associated with this project. The uh, city and the MWO are providing that capital cost. Next slide. Here's an overview of the improvements to the site. Um, on the east side of this graphic is uh, Central Avenue. On the west side is Fifth Street. Um, on the north is Columbia Parkway. Um, and uh, and uh, on the south would be uh, that future study area, that phase two that um, Superintendent Shorter, Assistant Superintendent Shorter was uh, mentioning um, for the south end of the golf course. Um, the green areas on the east side, you can see the green area surrounding a blue pond, that's the pond expansion of an existing pond or water hazard. Um, that area has really poor drainage right now, so, um, and that existing pond doesn't have an, a pipe outlet, just floods when it rains. 
Um, so part of this project improvement is to create new outlets out to that pond and uh, create um, some new pipe connections to it that drain parts of the golf course on the east and west sides. Of it. Um, so a significant, a significant improvement to the golf uh, playability there. Um, that area, that pond in a big rain event will, will sit for several days um, flooding the course and with these improvements it'll sit for about 12 hours. So um, we're really reducing flooding along it. As you move westward underneath the railroad track that bisects the site, there's another stormwater BP there in the multi-use athletic field area, kind of a boomerang shape. Uh, that is your dry basin that the city would be taking over for under this easement. Um, and then we, we continue to move west all the way to the west side. You'll see the final stormwater BFP, which is an infiltration area that spoils on site. On the site. Uh, so therefore, that's where the infiltration will be happening. Um, that is the, the, the final BMP that the city would be taking over under this uh, permanent easement um, maintenance, long-term maintenance, um, clean out, dredging, all those things associated with it. Um, in terms of golf, you can see that we're moving some, um, we're either raising tee box areas, adding tee boxes. Uh, over by the, on the west side is where we're making the most change in terms of golf as we're uh, moving the, the existing green is underneath that pond area that we're moving south um, to a new, a newly created green and that whole, that is whole 14 for those of you at Gulf of Columbia and that would be a, it's basically taking a part four to a part three in that area. Uh, if you move back east of the tracks to the expanded pond, that is uh, that is hole seven. That's going from a par four to a par five. Um, so we are we're adding a new back tee on that, and it kind of expands the length of that hole. Um, so we're keeping the same number of holes at 18. We're keeping the same number of strokes at 71. Uh, golf staff has has told us that we're on the west side on hole 14. We're taking it from a mundane, really easy par four shot. Straight, uh, straight hole to one that's a little more difficult. Our 360 yard uh, back tee um, um, hole with now a, a kind of interesting uh, stormwater uh, feature just in the, the um, out of play area. Uh, the other tones, the brown tones on this uh, on this page shows uh, restoration areas. Again, prairie restoration, banner restoration, woodland restoration. This also will start to open up corridors within existing holes um, where it's, been, it's currently choked out in uh, buckthorn and honeysuckle where if you, you hit into the woods at all you cannot find your ball. Um, this, when we do this restoration we're going to put in woods and ground cover to get rid of the buckthorn, introduce some sort of oaks through this project area uh, to do some of the management and uh, increase that uh, visibility on the site. So um, we'll We'll, uh, and, and, and also we hired a, a MKRB hired a golf course architect um, to help us design this. So the ponds um, in the golf courses were not designed by the engineers, they were designed by the golf course architects and then verified to get uh, the right, the proper storage for maximum benefit uh, for the small footprint. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide shows kind of the infrastructure that is related, to, um, related to the project, um, the stormwater BMPs as well as the main pipe. So the kind of the highlighted areas, um, the only the, the the city under this permanent easement will be taking over long-term maintenance uh, associated with a pipe that goes from east to west that you can kind of see highlighted in red. Um, as well as the multi-use basin within Columbia Park and the basin on the west side. The basin, the new pond expansion on the east side of the railroad tracks will remain MKRB's responsibility after four years of establishment um, for long-term maintenance. Uh, mainly because it serves, it, the drainage area is really just golf course. It's kind of surrounded by golf holes and whereas the other areas are easily accessible and uh, either out of play or in the park where the um, city can maintain those effectively. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a little more diagrammatic version of that last slide showing uh, the easement areas. Orange is the pipe that the city will be taking over and the two green 
uh, go out to uh, the easements over those um, stormwater BMPs. Next slide. Uh, so we do have temporary impacts on construction. We're, we're uh, tentatively planning for construction between the partners this fall. Um, there will be a parking lot closure at Columbia Park that's going to be used as a staging area. There's a lot of pipe going in here, so that needs to be stored um, after the project is done. Uh, that um, parking lot will be repaved. Um, so that would be an impact for fall in, 20, in this year and 2021 spring. Uh, there will be temporary impact to the Gulf. The Gulf, the course, will stay open, but it will be reduced to 11 holes temporarily during construction. Um, you know, we we did have uh, Gulf Course Architects provide the design, and we'll also provide uh, construction administration during um, during the Gulf Course improvements. The picnic shelter at, at Columbia will also be closed for reservations this fall and spring, but uh, you know, drop-in use will still be okay. Uh, there will be a closure for the multi-use field. Um, also in the park, um, but we'll have mid to late season next year uh, that will do um, permitted use for other sports. Um, there will be a replacement of the playground, top playground. Uh, that's all in construction, but that is part of, it's at its end of its effective life, so it's something we have to replace anyway. Um, and then we'll have some coordination with events happening at Manor. Um, obviously, COVID-19 also has shaped this all up, but um, um, there will be some impacts. We are limiting Friday's uh, construction on the project so that um, you know, weddings could take place and things like that. Um, next slide. So when we're looking at easement value, we're, we're, we're calculating the easements that we have here. Um, the easements, um, we do a land value calculation. The land value here is uh, estimated through uh, Henry County property taxes, uh, adjacencies to golf course, and uh, that's where we get the value of 1.2 million. Um, there are other temporary impacts that you can see at the bottom here. I did take um, golf's uh, revenue, actual revenue from uh, 2019, and uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Um, Golf took in between the course and the dream range a little over $1 million. Uh, talking to golf staff, we we're thinking with this temporary construction going from 18 holes to 11, we may have an estimated loss of revenue during that construction and restoration of those areas, that period of 40 to 50%. Um, if you take our, um, part of that would be this fall, part of it would be next spring for restoration. Uh, so there'd be a temporary impact of golf on at Columbia uh, to the tune of just over 500,000. Uh, there will also be temporary impacts to the picnic shelter for rentals. Uh, that'd be about 8,000. Uh, that, that's assuming that they could rent it out. Um, just so they assume COVID-19 impact. Uh, and then finally, the Columbia Park multi-use field. Uh, some of the impacts there could be about $25,000 worth of recreation time and programming. Um, again, that assumes that we could use it and we would have a COVID-19 impact. But the total temporary impact to the recreation side or usage uh, is just over 550,000. So uh, next slide. When we look at betterments on the project, the betterments calculation, uh, the estimate is at seven, just over 7 million, 7.1. 7 uh, it takes into account increased playability. I was talking about uh, how uh, this this project will make the golf course more resilient, especially in, fact, in terms of flooding and rain events. Uh, so over a 20 year period, we estimate about $850,000 worth of um, betterments just in uh, being able to get back on the golf course two days earlier after a storm than what they currently uh, are able to do. Um, the actual construction capital cost, the construction of pipes, the stormwater BMPs I mentioned, the big ticket item, pipe jacking under the rail, the railroad, um, and then the golf and trail improvements, uh, that's at around $6.25 million uh, for that. And again, our partners, the city and uh, the watershed district are the ones who are cost sharing that project, that item. We are not paying for the capital improvements. Uh, there's another big item that I don't have a number on as of yet, but uh, the city 
as part of this easement taking over the operations and maintenance of the big storm sewer pipe that will run from east to west across the site and the mobile basins, um, the stormwater basins, uh, where that's to be determined, but you know, that, that's something that will be tens of thousands of, tens of, thousands of dollars per year, uh, especially during the establishment yeah. period. And, uh, and uh, we will have, um, you know, we, we just don't have capacity to maintain those areas. So having the city take those on um, is real dollars and, and makes sense. Uh, if, if, and again, if there's no partnership uh, here, MPRD will still need will still, still need to improve the storm sewer system up there because it is in such poor condition, and just the construction of that would be over one, uh, two point two million dollars. That's just to improve the pipe that we have there, not necessarily extend to pipe through all these other isolated basins or isolated flooding areas within the golf course. Uh, that's just really to provide the same limited service that we currently have there in terms of drainage. Next slide. Timeline on this project, um, you know, again, this extends back to 2017 when we uh, had an MOU with our partners adopted by the board to study the 1ME watershed um, and carrying through different uh, agreements, uh, funding agreements into this year for construction um, and funding and ownership and maintenance approval in March. Um, and then now here we are with um, the permit easement agreements um, under discussion. And uh, we're looking to anticipate to construct this after Labor Day this year, kind of when, when uh, golf course tends to, uh, as directed by the golf course staff, that this would be the best time to start would be after Labor Day, when it tends to quiet down more, and then it'll extend in the next spring uh, to do restoration uh, and seeding of those areas disturbed. Um, you know, we we uh, definitely were part of this uh, design of the project, and uh, and we had some review, legal review of, of the project, different elements of the construction as we move through the agreements. Next slide. Uh, so in summary, the better estimation is we're at 7.1 uh, easement value plus temporary impacts. We're at 1.7. 1.77 about. So the betterment to easement on the easement to um, the temporary impacts valuation, it's over a four to one ratio. And if we start to get better numbers on the long term maintenance required by the city um, or the BMPs and the pipe, we're going to be probably closer to a five to one ratio. But um, we're getting a more resilient golf course out of this with increased playability. Um, we're retaining the same number of holes and number of strokes on the project on the site. Um, on the golf course, we're improving drainage to the multi-purpose field area, um, and we're getting uh, pipe that's in existing, you know, poor condition and requires to go under a railroad. Um, we're getting that replaced at no cost to us. Um, for the entire project, we don't have capital costs associated with the construction here. Um, and then the management of the stormwater BMPs and restoration areas will be taken on by the MWMO for the first four years, and then the city will manage uh, two of the BMPs uh, as under this easement um, and the stone sewer structure um, for the land. Um, I think that might be it. Excellent line. There we go. Thanks for, thanks for holding on to that one. Long presentation. Any questions? Uh, I have one chair for you if no one else has got one. Chair Forney? Can anyone hear me? No, I apologize. Okay. I, had, I was unmuted. Okay, no, I was saying you are in the queue. You're number one. Go ahead. Ask your All question. Right. Thank you, Chair Forney. So I, I just have concerns about this. It sounds really great but I'm still missing the part of us giving up two acres of land to have the city's water uh, in a place. I guess I, I guess my question, maybe to some, for some historical context and legal context, either Superintendent Bangora or Council Rice, is, is there a precedence for this? Do you see this being good for the park board? 
Um, Chair Forney, if I may, Chair Forney, if I may uh, interject here. Please do. Um, so Chair Forney, to Commissioner Severson. So when I came back to the park board in 2011, one of the first calls that I received was from golf course staff concerning flooding in Columbia. So since 2011, staff has worked with MWMO in the city to try to come to a resolution and yet maintain golf play at Columbia. So we've done, we think what we're offering the board here aligns with uh, many of the things that the board has approved uh, and aligns with the direction that, that the board has given staff. Um, I think the biggest risk for us right now is that if we do nothing, the golf course at Columbia will continue to flood. What Andy and other staff, uh, golf course staff have come up with here is something that we build resiliency into this course and, um, and we can think about improvements for the next 20 to 50 years which is unheard of and we when we looked at those problems at columbia back in 2011 i scratched my head and i and i said what are we going to do and so we just started that discussion with the mwmo and the city and, and today we have something before you that we think staff believes is uh and, and including golf course staff and this is really good for the park court and really good for uh, golf play at Columbia. Wow. Okay, again, I, I want, I'd like to ask Superintendent Bangor our council rights. Um, Commissioner Forney, Chair Forney. Council rights, please. Yeah, I mean, just so that I'm glad the board's having this discussion. Um, I have a disagreement with the planning staff on this. Um, I think this is a historic decision the board's about to make. Commissioner, uh, Severson asked, is there precedent for this? And I think there's a couple precedents I can think of. One in the 1990s, the park board accommodated a significant amount of inflow of water onto the Hiawatha golf course um, by creating a series of ponds on the course. And it was sold uh, much like the board is being presented tonight, at least on the policy level. The infrastructure was different. And uh, the board essentially accommodated a request then of the Public Works Department to handle a significant amount of uh, stormwater that migrated through the uh, northern part of the course onto the golf course. And I think you're all quite aware of how we've had to deal with Hiawatha for a while. One of the issues I've heard you talk about, Chair Forney, is that the park board has to pay the city the stormwater fee on land we have that a basically absorbs water. Um, our chain of lakes are largely stormwater, massive stormwater ponds that move water through the city that comes off city property owners and we get very little compensation for that. Um, I think the staff has done a good job in coming up with a good project, um, but I would say given the value of the land the park board has in the city, given the density of development that's going on in the city and the one part of the city that isn't getting more dense is parkland. What that means is um, our parkland becomes a great target for the watershed district, for the city public works department, for a whole bunch of other people. Um, if they needed two acres of land in this roughly a 2,000 acre sub watershed district that they're using to uh, send this water through, they would have to pay a lot of money to find a pond that's two acres in size. And uh, I've not been involved in these negotiations with the uh, Public Works Department, but I've heard this board uh, raise that question for years about the fairness of the city charging us, you, the park commissioners, and you paying the city stormwater fees for water that falls on land that basically absorbs water that then has to get moved through the uh, system. And it's quite frankly, to, in my mind, all the developers in this area that are adding density, um, and it won't be just this area, in other parts of the system, that then the water has to flow through uh, parkland into the Mississippi River, and we're volunteering to give this uh, land up. And I think, um, if you look at the original land policy that was done in the 60s about how the park board should make uh, people who need land for purposes like this to look elsewhere and not give that land up at really any price, um, 
I, I think the commissioners really need to consider that and whether this deal is uh, uh, good enough. Um, in my personal opinion, it's not at this point. Um, I can think of two other precedents that we had where we did work, and that was the uh, uh, Chain of Lakes partnership where we created uh, uh, water ponds to the west of uh, Lake of the Isles and also in the southwest corner of uh, uh, Bidet Makaska. Um, and those projects have had uh, some efficacy, but 20 years later we're finding that our water quality of our lakes also continued to se severely erode. Those projects were done during uh, Mayor Sales Belton's term to help improve water qualities that are two key chain of lakes. And uh, I think we're, you Can know, you have a I, uh, Madam Chair, I will wrap it up, but I, um, I think that any time the board, they, they call this an easement and they value the easement $5. Once you create a pond on this property and this two acres, that land is no longer available for any park recreation purposes. It's basically become um, a water feature that will be there forever. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Um, uh, Commissioner Severson, did you have more questions of um uh, no, I guess I, I owe you an apology because I, I, when you brought this to our attention, uh, th this uh, this policy about them charging us for the runoff and, and the water, I wanted to get, uh, you know, with you to work on that a little bit and other commissioners. But because of many of these reasons in my research, I'm not going to support this if it comes to the full board. I would ask that we send this back and and get more out of this deal than we're currently getting if this is the way I, our management thinks we should move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Commissioner Meyer has a stand up. Thank you. I, I'm not on this committee either, um, but I am on the MWMO and I was involved in the East River uh, Master Plan on this. And it, it seemed to be something that had uh, broad support from you know, golfers and environmentalists. Um, and it's it something that our board has um, affirmed several times in ways. Um, so th this is the first time that anything um, you know, controversial about it has come up. That said, I, I guess you know I, I do want to review precedent. And um, uh, the other thing is that that Council Rice uh, has, has brought up. So um, I, I guess you know up, up to now I've I've seen this as um, a, a big benefit to the park board to be taking away uh, the, the flooding issues that we are dealing with um, and to improve, improve the playability of the place and to get more water features. Um, you know, that, that's something that a lot of the neighbors want it is more water features and that is, you know, part of the park. So I want that to be part of the discussion too. I mean, and like, um, one of the most popular things in the East of the Remaster Plan is the south of this project, which would be the restoration of Lake Sandy, like a lot more water features. Um, and, and just one other quibble. Uh, one other quibble I, I just would make, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of any development projects in the 1NE watershed, maybe staff can correct me on that, but um, I think there, there aren't very many large ones that I can think of. Um, that's all for me for now. Thank you. And then I next see uh, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, Chair Forney. Um, I agree with some of Commissioner Severson's sentiments, and I think at a minimum what we need to go back and look at is um, we were in a very different time in 2017, 2018, 2019. As we heard earlier this evening, um, Golf may be the bandage that is stopping us from hemorrhaging money. Uh, and that seems to be the only thing that is uh, income-wise on the increase. And if we're using 2019 uh, projections for uh, Columbia to uh, determine our temporary damages, I don't know if that's right anymore. Um, and I think we might also want to talk to our partners about delaying the construction project until after COVID has passed. The, as more and more people are going into golf, uh, we may be at an opportunity 
where we're introducing the sport to new people and will continue to play after COVID passes. So I, I would hope that our partners would be at least willing to move this project down the road a little bit. And I think we should be looking at some revised numbers showing uh, the support for the, the new Fox support for golf. Thank you. Um, staff, do you have anything you want to respond or? Chair uh, Forney and Commissioners, I, this is uh, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder. Um, I appreciate the, the input. Um, this has been a very difficult and long process to move through. And we have been bringing things forward to the board. I understand that it's the board's purview to change direction um, as they get more information. But this is a project we've been heading to uh, as uh, Director um, uh, as Swenson uh, said for nearly 10 years now working with our partners. We can go back and we can uh, try to uh, exact more from the city and the watershed. Frankly, I think our better opportunities for doing that are in the second phase of the project where we actually have significant infrastructure on this uh, golf course that we can be uh, we can be looking at. There's just better opportunities later on relative to um, uh, the, the, what, what I don't know and what I can't speak to is, as Mr. Bourne was suggesting, a delay in the construction. And um, I'm, I suspect that the partners would prefer not to do that, um, that you know, the construction costs will likely increase as they go forward. And I know that based on what uh, Andy Schilling provided, that's not really a concern uh, for, for this um, body because at this point, the, those partners were paying for everything on the golf course. Um, I think the, 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 the hardest thing for, for us, uh, frankly, is the um, change in direction of policy after a number of years. And, and for, for staff who have been working on this diligently with the understanding that the board has been supportive of working with the city and the watershed um, on this project and achieving uh, the goals that were outlined at the beginning, which have been the goals throughout the project it puts us in a very difficult position to move into the next project. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing uh, Commissioner Musich with her hand up. Thank you, Chair Forney. Um, hopefully you guys can see me for whatever reason. My screen's not displaying me any longer. Um, so this is a project I've been watching very closely. Uh, in my district, we have lots of flooding problems and resiliency issues with many different types of infrastructure. To see the various agencies come together and find a solution that achieves every single one of the goals we laid out <laughs> at the beginning of the project is phenomenal to see. Uh, the amount of investment that the city and watershed district are putting into a golf course that we will own and operate um, that is going to in not only increase playability, but allow people to weather our changing climate. I, I, I know you're probably sick of hearing this from me, but our climate is changing. We are seeing that already. Last year was the wettest year on record. We have gotten seven years of rain in the past six years. This year is also trending very wet. Uh, the problems that we have at this location are not going away, and in fact are likely going to become worse. And the longer we push off establishing these BMPs, the harder it is for us to establish them. Uh, so I would really urge my colleagues to respect the partnership and work we've done up to this point. The fact that people are still willing to move forward with such a huge investment in, a, in land that they will not own nor operate. Um, and our current fiscal climate is fantastic. I do not want to discourage them from continuing to invest in park spaces in ways that not only help us to continue to collect revenue, but also vastly improve the ecological function of that space in our city's ecosystem. Oof, I, it's, it's incredibly important that we support efforts like this and that we ensure that they continue to move forward in as rapid a pace as possible. Um, because we have many spaces that, that need this sort of investment and we do not have the money to do it. Um, the, we saw the, the numbers for this site. We don't have $7 million sitting in our uh, improvement account for the enterprise fund. We don't have that. 
and we aren't going to have it anytime soon. Uh, and to, to say that we should try to get a better deal or that we need to delay this, like, I can't agree with that sentiment. And I feel it's very important that we continue to move forward with this project as well to expediency. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner um, Music. Um, I see uh, Commissioner Meyer, you have your hand still up? No, sorry. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody uh, weighing in on this, um, as Commissioner Stevenson indicated. Um, I've had a, a difficulty understanding the, um, the balancing act that we've been doing as far as um, with the city and um, how we play that and are we getting, you know, our quote unquote money worth and everything. Um, and, and there was a presentation last year that did, you know, address a lot of that. I'm hearing a conflict, of course, between, you know, how council rights is viewing things in the planning department. And um, uh, I, I hear it, I think it's, it's a very important thing, but I have to say that um, I'm the betterment in my opinion, are outweighing um, so uh, the uh, the easement that seems to be in question. Um, so, and I, I guess you know the idea of delaying this, you know, number one, um, it would probably take us into summertime, which would be uh, more impactful on the play of golf and therefore you know our loss of revenue. So um, I would encourage people to. Um, support this, um, but I would like to have um, uh, legal and planning. <laughs> I would like literally a flow chart uh, of, of how the how the money is flowing. Um, I understand that you know the, the stormwater fee we are getting well, goes towards um, the aquatic, aquatic invasive uh, species. So we are getting um, some um, already um, payback, I guess is the best way of saying it. And so I, I would love it somehow we can graphically demonstrate this and the things that council rights have been bringing up somehow to put that into the equation so that we can be sure to move forward because we have a, a huge, huge project with Hiawatha that we have to make sure that this is going to um, mitigate the issues that uh, presently um, are there and therefore also um, Columbia. So um, with that, um, I would like the secretary to call the roll. I don't think I see any other hands up. Uh, let me just share that I'm not from that too many more hands. So secretary, if you call the roll. Vice President Vita. Vice President Vita. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner French. No. Vice Chair Hassan. Vice Chair Hassan. Chair Forney. Aye. Commissioner Vita. Uh, I was muted there, uh, Jennifer. Vice Chair Hassan. Oh. No. Commissioner Vita. Uh. Commissioner Vita. Uh. There's this, there's feedback, but I'm not getting a vote. Can you raise your hand? Um, thumbs up or thumbs down? Commissioner Vita, I'm not sure that that's legal or not, but um, I, we're having some audio. I'm not seeing Commissioner Vita on the line. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. All right. So you have two eyes, two nays, one absent. So 
so fast. Fails. Time fails. Chair, Chair Forty, you, Commissioner v Vita, yeah. yeah, she's not on, so we'll have to move forward. Okay, all right. So it sounds like that is, yeah. uh, so we can move on to the next resolution if we can have that put up, stayed on the phone for quite a while to be able to support this resolution. <laughs> so I want to thank 
him. We also have Ann Walther, who has been on the phone for this, and then uh, Director Brooks and Teresa Chaika. So thank you all for your work on this and for um, being on the phone call tonight. Yes, yeah, thank you all. We really appreciate your work and <laughs> presence. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, I was happy to be part of it. Um, really happy to see this um, policy improve for the reason that uh, Commissioner French just noted. Great. Well, for you. Uh, my funny, can, can we share funny? My funny, I, I just, I didn't know Mark was on the, I didn't know he was on, on Zoom. Uh, I, I would, uh, I, 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 if I know he was there, I would probably ask a few questions because I, uh, Mark, Mark uh, has been kind of leading this fight and the charge to change from our policy uh, probably for the last one year or so. How long, Mark? I mean, uh, how long have you been doing this for the park board? About, well, I've been working on um, background check policies in different ways for about 12 years. Sure. Yeah, but, but yeah, but, but so I'm excited to hear when you came and started to work in the park board. I'm glad that you, uh, you did it, and thank you for all the work that you've done, and thank you for the work that you've done with our staff to, to improve our, uh, higher, our higher policies and our procedures. So thank you. Much love to you, brother. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. No, you can <laughs> enjoy your evening. <laughs> All right, thanks. Just left of it. You guys, you guys uh, run a late party here. Have a good night. <laughs> we just began. <laughs> okay, I'll have a. Uh, um, somebody wants to read the next resolution, which is up now. Resolution 2020 I'll read resolution 2020 resolution repealing specific ordinance of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board uh, code of ordinance that are sus suspended by Minnesota state law. Great, any discussion on this item of that has been superseded by? Uh, is that a question? Commissioner <laughs> French has his hand up. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, that was for the last, that was for the last uh, round of questions. I'm, I'm okay. So any questions? Uh, staff might be up on the wings if anybody has any questions otherwise. Um, your hand is still up, excuse me, Commissioner French. So. I'm lower. There you go. Okay. All right. Good, good. All right. So seeing none, um, will the secretary please call the roll? Vice President Vita. Uh -huh. Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Musich. Ah. I'm sorry, I must have been on mute. Commis Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Vice Chair Hassan. Aye. Chair Forney. Aye. You have four ayes, one absent. And I apologize, but I don't believe that we have any more. Um, uh, but just a reminder that the voices of uh, Roses is going to be moving forward to the full board. Um, with that, I adjourn the meeting. I adjourn the committee. Uh, time being 1014, I call the order of the planning committee. Secretary will please call the order. Vice President Vita. Commissioner French. Here. President Cogill. Ah. Here. Vice Chair Forney. Ah. Here. Chair Meyer. Here. You've got a quorum. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Commissioner French. Yes. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have uh, four ayes, one absent.
there a motion to approve the agenda, the minutes of Wednesday, June 17th, 2020? So moved. So moved. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Commissioner French. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have four ayes, one absent. Is there a motion to approve uh, resolution 2020-218? So moved. Uh, can you read the resolution? Uh, I'll move resolution 2020 uh, amendment to resolution 2020-131, allowing alternative means for review and comment on the draft Southwest Service Area Master Plan for 30 additional days after board approval of this resolution because recreation buildings remain closed due to COVID-19. Thank you. Is there any discussion on 2020-218? Seeing no hands raised, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. Four ayes, one absent. I'll move resolution 2020-261, a resolution approving amendment number one to access agreement. Uh, to to, Metropo to the Metropolitan Council for placement of bezometers on Dean Parkway and Lake of the Isles Park located in Minneapolis, uh, the Minneapolis Chain of Lakes Regional Park in support of investigations related to the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project extending the term by three years. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Commissioner French. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. You have four eyes, one absent. Third motion for resolution 2020-262. I like to move resolution. Oh, I like to move resolution twenty twenty two sixty two resolution approving uh, <coughs> the letter of support uh, for transportation action plan. Thank you. I see Commissioner Forney has her Thank you, um, Chair Meyer. Um, I just wondered how this dovetails into the city's reduction in. Um, or no, not how this, uh, not the letter, but how we, uh, the park system, um, are going to be responding to the city's reduction in um, uh, the speed limits um, on their, um, whether or not we might be, has that discussion been raised in the, if we would be reducing mm -hmm. further? Um. Do we still have Carrie Christensen on the line, or if not, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder? Speak to the speed limit. Hello, I, I am here. Good evening, Hi, Chair, Commissioners. Um, I, I believe that maybe Director Swenson or, or Assistant Superintendent Schroeder may know more information on the speed limit conversation. Um, other staff have been involved in those conversations, but I'm not as up to date on that specific piece of operations. Uh, Meyer, I, I, I believe that this, um, that the change in speed limits requires an act by the legislature, and I don't think it's something that we can take on on our own from understanding uh, your question properly. I think um, we looked at what the um, uh, change in the law was. I think Council Rice looked at what the change in the law was and determined that it didn't extend to us, and so we would need to be not lobbying for it through the Transportation Action Plan, if that's the direction the board wants to go. But in fact, looking to change the um, the enabling legislation to allow cities to uh, modify the speed. And I defer more to it than that. Assistant Superintendent Order, couldn't the Transportation Action Plan make reference to a request to the state to reduce our speed limit along 
uh, long work with, with the city did. I mean, the, the Transportation Action Plan makes reference to lots of the governments, so I don't know if I could. Uh, Meyer, there's no reason we can't put it in there uh, as a comment, um, but this, we won't be expecting the city to take action on it. Thank you. And, and I'm not sure that, you know, that is what we want to do or we don't want to do. I just, you know, wondered, you know, if there had been any conversations, you know, with um, different entities about, I mean, we already are at 25 miles per hour, so. Um, um, and I guess, you know, on top of this, and I appreciate, you know, all the work that's been done, you know, here um, by um, staff and everything. And I guess I would like to know, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is the proper time to ask it and everything, but whether or not um, where planning staff is um, presently, is there a backlog, you know, of, of um, uh, work, um, you know, and, you know, is the committee up to date, I guess is really um, what my prime concern is. Um, does that have anything more to add to that? Um, thank you. Um, I, I just want to clarify there's guidance on the speed limit if, if you'd like that. I can certainly add some language to the comment letter um, regarding speed limit. If there's any specific guidance that you have around what you'd like to see um, this, on that front, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, but I don't have anything specific. I was just curious, you know, of how we might be impacted, which it sounds like we are not directly impacted. So, but I would like, you know, staff, if you could weigh in as to, you know, where we are as far as, um, you know, with this specific committee, are we, do we have a backlog? Are we up to date on things? I'm very curious of. Um, Commissioner Forney. Just to clarify, the committee, uh, the technical advisory committee with the transportation action plan, is that what you're referring to? No, no, the planning committee. The, oh, the goal of present money in. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Michael. Um, yeah, I think I would like to, to add something um, to it to call for mm -hmm. um, a 20 mile per hour speed limit. So, um, let's see. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where in the letter it would belong um uh carrie do you have a recommendation on where it would go or would it, would it just go under general um thank you yeah chair i think that um having some general comments around the exploration of, of 20 miles per hour speed limits and just to clarify in regards to parkways or for overall what, what kind of guidance in terms of, you know, which route? I think we, um, yeah, I think that, that makes a difference. Um, you know, since we're the park board, I think we probably only uh, speak to park rates, but I think we can note broadly that there is a very significant um, increase in safety when you uh, get down to 20. Um, I, I recall the, the rate of fatalities for crashes that happen at 20 miles an hour is something that was like 5 or 10%, whereas at 30 miles an hour, it was like 40%. Um, so there is a, a really big difference there. Um, so uh, I, I guess uh, my proposed amendment, and I guess I'll this part of the motion, um, would be to add under general comments um, that um, the park board notes that there is a significant safety improvement um, when speeds are reduced to 20 miles per hour and uh, calls for more exploration uh, to reduce parkways to that level. Does that sound okay? Um, great. I'll, I'll follow up with you if I have any clarifications on the language, but thank you for the addition. Mr. Sure. Mark, if, 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 I, if I may, I yes, think please. it would be, uh, if, if this is the direction that uh, this, this committee wants to pursue relative to the comment letter, um, it may actually be beneficial for us to um, seek the support of the city 
and reducing speeds on the parkways of their commensurate residential streets. Um, and I think asking for uh, their assistance or concurrence might be as useful as, as, as some of the other uh, statistical information you were citing. Because I think you are correct. Um, the injuries on lower speed roadways are much less severe when you hit 30 miles an hour. Um, so I think asking for a concurrence uh, would be uh, a benefit to us as we pursue this um, through legislative means. Okay, so would you propose an alternative language then? Uh, I just simply, um, Commissioner Meyer, um, asking for their uh, concurrence and assistance with um, or their um, continued advocacy for this would extend to parkways, I think, would be sufficient. Okay. So we need to have a vote on that, right? To add to it. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Research. Thank you, Chair Meyer. Uh, I'm interested in understanding. I appreciate being given the opportunity to speak since I'm not on this committee. Um, I'd be interested in understanding what sort of public engagement has been done with park users around changing our parkway speed limits. Can anyone answer that question? Um, there has been in my district, in along with Mayor Avenue, but I'll um, refer to um, Assistant Superintendent Schroeder on any conversations that may have happened up to this point. How did we set the original? I guess the reason I'm asking this is when I've told people the city is changing the speed limits, they laugh at me and say, that's ridiculous. And who decided that? And why didn't they ask the public? So the reason I'm asking is that I feel like the city's action already lacks sufficient public engagement. <laughs> and I find it hard to believe that we would have done more engagement around something like this than they would have. So if anyone could help me understand what engagement the parks specifically have done around changing the speed limits, I'd appreciate it. Chair, Chair Meyer and Commissioner of Usage, um, to, to this point, we have done none. The, the, the direction that we've been talking about relative to parkways is to engage in a major uh, plan following completion of the comprehensive plan as the next major kind of master plan in which the parkways might be somewhat or even wholly reimagined over the next 20 or 40 years. So we haven't started that process yet, and we have not been advocating anything relative to uh, speed limit changes. I know there have been- This letter would be doing that. Am I correct? If, if this, if the, if the uh, amendment that Commissioner Meyer uh, was suggesting uh, be added, we would be advocating for that. Yeah. All right, uh, noting, the opposition to it, you know, I'll withdraw the amendment for now and refer to that conversation to a different date, but perhaps to our IGR committee. Um, so I'll withdraw the, the motion. Uh, Commissioner Gretsch. Commissioner Gretsch, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned with, uh, uh, with the reduction of, of the speed limit as well. I think it gives our, I think it gives law enforcement officers more reason to pull black and brown folks over. Uh, so I would like, before that's done, before we start thinking about that, there should be some type of uh, equity ratio impact on, on see how that would affect black and brown bodies and indigenous bodies if we lower the speed limit to 20 miles an hour. Uh, so that, that I, would, I would be supporting that. Thank you, Commissioner French, Commissioner Board. Commissioner Board is on the line. Thank you, uh, Chair Meyer. I'll, uh, I'll remind commissioners that I made a request to not have this advance to the full board this evening, uh, and that was uh, that request was narrowly defeated on a four to five vote when we still had nine commissioners on the call. Um, and the reason why I asked that it not go forward was exactly this reason. Uh, the board just moments ago. Uh, passed a resolution in honor of one of our former colleagues that didn't allow 10.30 at night backroom deals to happen. So I, I'm just a little concerned. Um, and then later on in that same sentence said that she had a career and a life that we should emulate. So I, I do, I, I don't have any real, I'm not sure how I feel about hearing this for the first time at 10.30 at night. Um, 
I'd like the board to have a robust conversation around the transportation action plan in the public's eye. Um, and I, I just don't know if I can support this when it comes to the full board this evening, uh, as we are giving some staff direction here this evening, and this is exactly what I feared five and a half hours ago or four and a half hours ago when I asked that this be not advance the full board this evening. There's no reason why it can't wait. Then the chair could actually bring, could notify the public that he intends to bring forward a, an amendment to it. Uh, and we could follow the public process that we all cherish. So I, I don't see a scenario where I'll be supporting this this evening. Thank you, Commissioner Warden. I appreciate your concerns and considered them when you brought it up uh, at the beginning of the board agenda. Uh, but I feel like there is a reason to not continue to delay on this because we have delayed on it uh, several times and the city is waiting on us. Uh, so I, I would prefer uh, to have our letter to them so that they can proceed. Um, that said, uh, Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, um, yes, we are at 1030 plus at night and everything. Um, but this was published, um, this letter, so uh, it is something that the public is aware of. My understanding is the city does have a deadline, and we have had to put this off because of COVID um, um, issues and everything. So um, I would encourage people to support it. Um, it's been very transparent um, as far as um, the conversation and um, what was the results of the conversation was published in our board packet. So I don't think there's anything that's um, uh, in the backroom deal. Thank you. President Gogo. I would like to make a single amendment uh, to the letter. I'd like to uh, move to strike bicycling action uh, 2.5 from the letter. Um, and I can speak to that. Thank you, there is a motion, and then President Cole goes, please speak to it. Okay, um, I would uh, just say this. Um, I appreciate that um, we have guidance uh, from past policy uh, work regarding uh, the directions of uh, bike uh, paths and the one ways and pinch points. Um, I'm also aware that the city has done pretty robust uh, analysis of um, how to enhance the bicycle network so that it is usable and functional uh, for folks getting all over the place around the city and having two-way biking is um, a uh, important uh, aspect of that and uh, I'm, I'm supportive of the work that the TAP has done on that um, so I, I think that uh, we should just remove that action item. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that as well. Uh, and just to clarify what we're talking about, so it, the item is um, action item 2.5 under the bicycle section of the transportation action plan, which reads um, that they would coordinate with Minneapolis Bike or Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to evaluate converting uh, one-way trail operations to two-way, uh, particularly around the Damascus, the Lake Isles, and uh, Lake Harriet. Um, so I just use the, the word um, evaluate, but in the uh, draft letter, um, it calls for removing uh, that action item. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the action item is, is worth keeping in the transportation action plan. When I've uh, been around those lakes, they have felt very crowded and uh, would be great to have uh, more space around them. Um, before we move to the vote on the amendment, is there any further discussion on it? Uh, uh, Commissioner Moore. Uh, thank you, Chair Meyer, being 1035 at night, I guess I would just ask uh, Commissioner Musich's question on this amendment and what, uh, what public outreach have we done before we take this 1035 PM vote? I so my response to that would be um, we're the, 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 you know, the outreach involved in the transportation action plan that presumably led to that in, to 
be included in that and we would be going counter to the public involvement that led to that if we pass this as is. I do see a hand raised from Director Arbison, but perhaps you could speak to that later. Thank you, Chair Meyer. I just want to speak to the question of community engagement. I think the reason why this recommendation to strike the action is based on existing policy in our master planning efforts that studied at length one-way or two-way trails in the Bidet Mikoska Harriet Master Plan with extensive community engagement, two years of community engagement, where that CAC recommended and the board adopted that those trails do stay one way for reasons of concern over increase in impervious surface and tree impact and stormwater management. There was a robust discussion during those master planning projects, and I think that the letter that staff has prepared is really responding to that kind of existing policy direction in that particular master plan, which is founded in that community engagement. Mr. Borden, do you have more to add? Mr. Borden? No. Okay. Sorry, I'm having questions. I got a question, Chris. Thank you. Can you tell me how many north siders were on that CAC? Carrie, are you familiar with or sorry, you're talking about the park board ones that would go to Adam then, I take it? Or are you talking about the transportation action plan? No, the one that was about the bicycle pathway on the southwest that you just mentioned. Director Arvidsson, do you have a response to Commissioner Stevenson's question? Chair Meyer, Commissioner Stevenson, I actually don't recall offhand the areas of residence of folks for the Bidet Mikoska area CAC. I will say that that was prior to the new community engagement policy requirement where regional park CACs need to be constituted of half of folks that are not in the immediately surrounding area. So I expect that those master plan, that master plan CAC was likely more focused on residents of that area, but I can't confirm for sure. All right. Thank you. All right. Seeing no other hands raised, Secretary, please call the roll on the amendment to strike the comment regarding bicycling action 2.5. Would you please repeat what the action 2.5 was again? I just would appreciate it. Yes. In the transportation action plan, item 2.5 currently is coordinate with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to evaluate converting one-way trail operations to two-way, particularly around Bidet Mikoska, Lake of the Isles, and Lake Sirius. The draft letter calls for removing that provision. President Cogill's amendment would leave no comment on it. It would just remove that comment from the draft letter. Secretary, please call the roll. Vice President Vita. Commissioner French. Commissioner French. Pass. Okay. President Cogill. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. No. Chair Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. No. There are two ayes, two nays, one absent. That amendment failed. Are there any other amendments or discussion about the remaining of the letter? Seeing none, Secretary, please call the roll on the letter. Vice President Vita. Commissioner French. Pass. 
President Kogil. Aye. Vice Chair Forney. Aye. Chair Meyer. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. You have four ayes, one absent. Thank you. Uh, noting that all three of these items will now move to the full board, I uh, oh. now consider the planning committee. Commissioner Meyer, uh, Commissioner Forney was raising her hand. Oh, sorry. I didn't, I don't see raised hand. Commissioner Forney? Oh, but thank you. I thought I had raised it. Anyway, I, thank you very much. Um, I, I did raise the question that I would like to know what the, what the backlog is if we are caught up in the committee, um, in the planning committee, um, whatever. I'm concerned that we are not, you know, caught up and, and if we could get a report on that, I would appreciate it. All right, um, we will keep that in mind, but I think given the time of the night, uh, we'll save that for the next day. Thank you, but I would like it to an accounting. Thank you. Uh, I think committee is adjourned. Um, thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Chair Meyer, I will re uh, uh, call, call the order again the regular meeting of the Park and Recreation Board. Um, and uh, we'll uh, move into bringing up the items that have been um, coming up from committee. I'll start with the admin and finance committee. Uh, Chair Forney. Sorry. <laughs> On behalf of the Admin and Finance Committee, I'd like to move Resolution 2022. Oh. Is this on? Okay. Yes. Uh, resolution 2022-18 Amendment oh, to Resolution 2020-131, allowing alternative means of review and comment on draft Southwest Service Area Master Plan for 30 additional days after board approval of this resolution because recreation buildings remain closed due to COVID, I think is what Yes, due to COVID-19. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the secretary to please call the roll on resolution 2020-218. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That carries um, out. Um, <clears throat> continue with the uh, planning committee uh, we will come back to uh, apologies uh, chair Forney but we we went to planning committee items um, I will turn it over to chair Meyer to uh, read resolution 202261 uh -oh. I closed it already oh there it is uh, 261 So I'll move resolution 2020 261 a resolution approving amendment one um, to access agreement to Metropolitan Council for placement of uh, high zometers on Dean Parkway and Lake Lee Isles Park located in Minneapolis Channel Lakes Regional Park in support of investigations related to the Southwest Light Rail Thread Rail uh, Transit Project, extending the term by three years. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Do I see any discussion? I do not. I will ask the secretary to take the roll on resolution 2020-261.
Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. We'll move resolution that carries. 2262. Um, a resolution approving comment letter for uh, of support for transportation action plan. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Bourne. Thank you. I would move to table resolution 2022-62. Second. Uh, the resolution has been is been moved to table the resolution. Um, I will ask the secretary to please take the role on tabling resolution 2022-62. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. Vice President Vita. Aye. President Kogil. No. You have four ayes, four nays, one absent. Aye. Uh, that does not carry. Um, to the main motion, resolution 2022-62, Commissioner Bourne, for the second time. Uh, thank you, President Kogil. I, I believe this is for the first time, um, the last time I raised to a uh, resolution. Uh, but for the first time, uh, I, I'd like to support this site, but unfortunately I can't. There was a lot of very good uh, conversations around some potential amendments that I would literally like to see happen in the light of day. Um, so I, I'm gonna be abstaining on this vote. I would encourage my colleagues to um, also not support this. I think that there's some good work in here that I think the entire board can get behind, but I think we should go through the appropriate process. Seeing no other comments uh, or hands raised, I'll ask the secretary to take the roll on 2022-62. Commissioner Bourne. All abstain. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Abstain. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. President Kogil. Aye. You have five ayes, three abstain, one absent. That carries. I will uh, turn it over to Chair Forney uh, to uh, read us uh, Resolution 2020-258. There it is, thank you. Uh, yes, resolution approving an amended fundraising agreement with the Voices of the Roses, a nonprofit corporation without 501c3 designation with a fiscal sponsor agent in People's Park, an incorporated nonprofit with 501c3 organization for fundraising related to Lindale Park Road Gardens. The resolution has been moved. Uh, is there a second? Is there a second to the resolution? Second. The resolution has second. been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. I forgot to ask earlier. Does this need to be updated to the Parks Foundation since People for Parks no longer exists and has been rolled into that organization? 
That's a great question, and I have the, the same question. I'm concerned that maybe we can't move forward with this. Yes, Commissioner Forney. Thank you. Um, yes, I have been in contact with um, Executive Director um, Tom Evers, and um, it is fine for it to go forward the way it is because there will be um, numerous um, contracts, actually, um, with uh, people for parks um, that will need to be converted. Um, today is the day um, that does get um, moved into the foundation, and so they will be bringing those forward at all the same time. But I did run it by him, and so he actually brought it up to me. Um, but yes, we are fine with that. Okay, so we're approving something for an organization that isn't in an organization anymore, rather than updating this to identify the new organization in the resolution. In essence, the people for BARC is within the auspices of the Parks Foundation. Yeah, I get that they are, but do they even exist anymore? Like, have they dissolved as an organization? That is a, a fair... Yeah, like, hey, could we get a legal counsel to weigh in, please? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'm just looking at the resolution. I know there was some... Um, arrangement where either people for parks was merging with um, the parks foundation or I, I but I'm not sure I can't yeah. answer the question that is accurate. if people for parks became a um, subsumed within uh, the parks foundation then um, they could be acting I'm not sure if they're if people for parks dissolved or not Based upon the information I had today, it has uh, dissolved, but... Uh, I'll just read you from Tom Evers. The fiscal sponsorship will be conferred, conferred from... Okay. The base, excuse me, sorry. Anyway, from a uh, people park to the Minneapolis Park so they have... President Cogill, I, I'd like to amend the resolution 258 to insert after the words people for parks to include the words or the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. Uh, an amendment has been made by Commissioner Bourne. Is there a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Would the motion maker, the chair of the committee, accept that as a friendly amendment? Commissioner Morning. Yeah. Uh, been accepted as a, as a friendly amendment to the resolution. Uh, is there any discussion on the resolution uh, that has now added um, uh, for the Parks Foundation after People for Parks? Seeing no other discussion, I'll ask the Secretary to please take the roll on resolution 2020 258. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. Vice President Vita. Aye. Pre President Kogan. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Uh, that carries. Uh, moving into petitions and communications, Commissioner Hassan. Pass. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Uh, Commissioner uh, Meyer. Pass. Commissioner Severson. Pass. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Forney. Um, he so just acknowledge the fact that People for Parks has been absorbed into the Minneapolis Park Foundation. They're bringing their assets to the foundation. Um, very excited about that move. Um, also, I'll just make a comment that the trailhead, um, the Mill City Kitchen, is open. Um, and what's wonderful about it is the fact that their, old, their window, that was either takeout window, has worked marvelously for um, the COVID situ situation in keeping keeping people um, social distance. Once again, I want to applaud the staff and their responsiveness to um, all the various issues that are happening within our city and our country. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Pat. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, I would like to implore my colleagues to take into consideration when they're making decisions in committee and at the full board, the full breadth of the impact of those decisions that you're making and the potential negative impacts it may have on the park board's ability to get partner agencies and organizations to come to the table to work with us. Um, I'm incredibly disappointed that, that we, we may have torpedoed what could be the most substantial response to climate change that this board would have taken. Um, I have no idea what the watershed district is going to think or whether or not they're going to continue to write the park board into their capital investment plan. Um, but I certainly would question whether or not I should continue to invest in the park board if I were them. And, and I would imagine that most of our other partners are thinking the same. Um, when they made that commitment with us in 2017, after years of conversation, they believed the park board would move forward with that work because we continued to say that we would. And now that it's time to implement, we're backing out of that. And, and it's, the impacts are vast. So I would just ask that you, that you take the time when you're making decisions to, to think about the full breadth of the impact that your decision may make. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich, uh, Commissioner French. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this has been a kind of a stressful couple uh, couple weeks. Uh, the park board has taken on some responsibilities that traditionally the park board hasn't been responsible for. Uh, I used to tell folks, uh, what does a park board commissioner do when they ask us? I say, we're like the city council for parks, except we don't have people living in our parks. Well, now we have people living in our parks. Now it's our responsibility to make sure that they have the basic necessities. I, I, I it's, it's so easy, it's so, so easy to uh, classify our folks for a living in, in, in these encampments as people uh, of low, low moral character or people who aren't doing uh, what you are supposed to be doing traditionally to become an American, like, you know, living in a $200,000 house or, you know, uh, having a nice car and all that stuff that, that makes you an American, quote unquote American. What I see is uh, my, my 20 years working in uh, our, our special ed schools and special ed programs, what I see is at Highway Park, Park, and that's the one I'm mostly acquainted with, are young men and young women who were in special ed services who didn't get those services once they graduated school. The amount of mental health that exists in this place is staggering. It's staggering. And so what I would, I would do, it would behoove other commissioners to reach out if you have relationships with county commissioners, if you have relationships with city council folks or state reps, reach out and say, hey, isn't that what the park board does? We need help. We need help from other institutions. Uh, we, need, we need help from uh, the county. We need help from the state. Uh, the park board didn't create this problem. Minneapolis Police Department went to the Sheraton Hotel, cleared the Sheraton Hotel out, loaded up city buses, and brought them to Powder Horn Park. It's not the responsibility of the park board. It is a collective responsibility of all agencies to make sure that I'm most vulnerable to folks. Have a place to stay. So we have to reimagine uh, what 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 housing means in this in, not just in this in this city, but maybe in this country. Uh, a lot of folks don't need a $200,000 house with four bedrooms. Some people just need a place where they can, you know, wash their butt, eat up a meal, and have some place to rest. And, and that may not cost $200,000. So we need to reimagine uh, 
uh, where, where are these folks who aren't wealthy and don't have the privilege of, of anybody that sits on this diet of having a warm place to stay at night? Before we try to demonize these folks, try to figure out where they came from. Because they're, 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 that, they're that weird family member that, you know, they're just a weirdo that no longer is welcome at, at, at the family dinners or family gatherings. They're that humble and drinks a little bit. And sometimes you don't know where he's at. You know where they're at? They're at Pottawan Park. And they've been taken care of by the community and, and, and by other folks. So let's stop trying to figure out how we can detach ourselves from this situation. Let's figure out how we can involve other entities to come in and play a, a major role, a bigger role than they've played in the past. Because it seems like the park board decide to do the humane thing by not kicking people out of our parks and every other agency to say, you know what, if they're not kicking people out of our parks, we're going to just dump everybody in the parks. Shame on the county, shame on the state, and shame on the city. We have 200 people living in our parks in one of the richest states in the country, one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, we can do better. We can do better than demonize the folks who have nowhere else to go and nobody else to advocate for. None of you, I don't know, have you ever felt that way before? You have nowhere else to go. So I, I just, I want to encourage other commissioners and, and, and other constituents to reach out to other elected and say, let's get some work done. And let's figure out and get these folks out of the tents. Because winter's coming and uh, the situation will be different than so thank you, uh, President uh, Cogo, for allowing me to speak. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. I'm looking to see if Vice President Vita is on. It does not look like she is. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, for staying through this meeting. Um, a couple of things I want to mention before I adjourn the meeting. Uh, one is that I will be um, uh, bringing forward uh, an amendment to our board rules. Um, given the fact that we are continuing to be uh, in a remote meeting setting and have been now for many months and I have continuously asked commissioners to uh, put on their visual equipment um, and have not gotten compliance on that from some. Uh, I'm going to be introducing an uh, amendment to our board rules to uh, require that. Uh, I think it behooves us for the, all the calls of transparency we've heard tonight. Um, for folks to be able to see the elected representatives um, that are uh, here to do the people's work. Um, and given the fact that COVID is raging worse than ever, I don't see us coming back to a full board uh, in-person situation anytime soon. Um, I also want to address uh, briefly the uh, encampment issue um, that is uh, uh, going on throughout this city um, is a shared burden of um, uh, all of our governmental agencies and that we all need to work on to, to get our unsheltered neighbors and vulnerable neighbors housed. Um, uh, I mentioned the, the key underlying principles that I've heard from just about every commissioner and communities. Uh, community around what our role should and can be and what others' roles should and can be. And I appreciate what Commissioner French said uh, just now. I also appreciate the tangible reality of how long uh, we have a untenable camp situation in a park uh, that is dangerous for everybody in that space and is certainly not meeting the requirement of a sanctuary space. Um, and uh, I am hopeful that other commissioners will work on a pragmatic solution that can be voted on at the next meeting. Um, and uh, I am hopeful also that um, in doing so, we have transparent communication uh, in determining that. Um, I uh, encourage commissioners to respond to uh, other commissioners' phone calls. And I encourage commissioners to uh, commit to certain principles so that we can take some kind of action uh, at the next meeting. Um, the reason that I think this is critical is that 
uh, it is very possible that we do not get other commitments from other levels of government because we have so far not gotten those commitments and we've sat in many conversations and many meetings um, with folks who can make those decisions. Um, and I am not interested in having a uh, really uh, unsafe situation for our, our unhoused community members um, come the fall months. So I'm, I'm um, with renewed energy looking forward to those conversations um, in the coming days uh, and uh, the leadership of those who have been embedded in this work uh, to come forward with uh, a, uh, an action that states our, our values and principles and our goals. Um, with that, uh, I appreciate everybody's time again on a very late evening and uh, I will um, adjourn the regular meeting. And I believe I can do that by acclamation. So I will say good, good evening. Thank, thank you all.